Good afternoon from the Silver Dome in Pontiac, Michigan. Fortunately, we have a roof on the place because it's pouring rain in the Detroit area as the Tampa Bay Buccaneers are set to go against the Detroit Lions. Hello, everyone. I'm Don Crickey with the former New York Jet All-Pro Emerson Boozer. The Detroit Lions are under a lot of pressure here. They're four and five through nine games, and yet, Emerson, they have a shot at the playoffs when you look at the standings. As they say around the league, Don, they can get through the back door. Matter of fact, back in, provided uh, the Vikings lose to Chicago, Chicago and Detroit, identical records, four and five. They'll stay on the heels of the Minnesota Vikings. And, of course, the Vikings with problems now that Fran Tarkinen is out. The Tampa Bay Buccaneers, as everyone knows, have not won a game yet in the NFL, but it's an established fact that no one wants to play this team. And one of the big reasons is number 63, Leroy Selman, who's all pro quality. Leroy is almost a man eater, we might say. He destroys just about everybody that he plays against, possibly the best defensive lineman or overall player at Tampa Bay. And, of course, uh, Leroy's brother Dewey is no slouch either. He backs the line in the middle. And number 61's a guy that'll hit you hard. Dewey is the kind of linebacker that I didn't like to play against. He's a big fella at 6'1", 6'2", 250 pounds. It's big enough. Hi, everybody, and welcome to Riverfront Stadium in Cincinnati, where this afternoon the Bengals take on the Miami Dolphins. It's an overcast, drizzly afternoon here in Cincinnati. Been raining or drizzling off and on throughout the morning. The tarp was on the field until about 11 o'clock, and after they've taken it off, of course, has become wet, and this field is going to be slippery in spots. The Bengals and Dolphins come in in the same position. Although the records are diametrically opposed, the Bengals are four and five, Miami is seven and two, but both teams are one game behind their division leaders. Both have had the problem of moving the ball and scoring many points in these last three games. The Bengals have been unable to get it into the end zone, and the Dolphins have not been able to get it into the end zone much better. Last week, their defense was rock hard as they knocked off New England 17 to five, and this is a young Dolphin defense, but it's getting better and better as each game goes along. The Dolphins won the toss they've elected to receive. The Bengals will kick off left to right as we look at Riverfront Stadium, north to south. The Bengals in their black uniforms. And the Miami Dolphins in their wider aqua. Their numbers are a little bit more easily to ascertain than they were a few years ago. This is the first time since 1974 that these two teams have met. The Bengals have only beaten the Dolphins twice in regular season games, and they came in 68 and 69. Since that time, they have had no luck whatsoever. Bears won the toss, Brad Palmer, and will receive. That means they'll be going into a 24-mile-an-hour wind as they move from left to right, from north to south. The Vikings taking the wind at their back, and the wind is going to be a factor. It's the flag goes straight out. In fact, it bends the goalpost several feet as the gusts uh, come up 24 miles an hour. Well, it's a rather uh, breezy day, as you've mentioned, but it's mild. The temperature 52 degrees. It'll get into the mid-50s this afternoon. Brett Cox moves forward now. Bashnagel waiting deep, and there's the kick. And Freddie hammers it down the middle, and Bashnagel will take it at the five-yard line. Behind the wedge, moving to the left side of the 20, and slips and falls as he crosses the 25 to the 26-yard line. Down quickly to make the tackle, Nate Allen along with Mark Keller, a reserve running back out of northern Illinois. A 21-yard return for Bashnagel, who leads the NFC in uh, kickoff returns with a 24.4 average. So the Bears will take over, first and ten on their own 26-yard line as we start play here this afternoon. Avellini has completed 96 passes for 1,267 yards. He has a percentage of just over 49%. He has thrown for eight touchdowns. He's had 11 picked off. Wing to the right is Schubert. Wide to the left is Scott. Hand off to Walter Payton. Sliding to the right side. It pops out of the 30 to 35 to 40 to 45 to 50. And out of bounds. The Viking territory knocked out by Paul Krause at about the 46-yard line. And there's a 28-yard run by Mr. Explosion himself on the very first play of the ball game. Nice way to start the game. Steve Schubert's in there, the wide receiver, and played the goal rather. Rather not in uniform today. He's out with the flu. He came down with the flu on Thursday. Instead of getting better, he got worse. Peyton and Noah Jackson had the flu, but they're okay. Also on the inactive list is the tight end Chuck Bradley out with the flu. 29-yard pickup for Walter Peyton. First down for the Bears on the Vikings. 46-yard line. Called on Rufus Mays. The Dolphins have declined it, and Chris Barr will go in for a field goal attempt. Coming into the game, Barr is 9 out of 15. The line of scrimmage is the 27. It'll be about a... 44-yard attempt, and Barr on the year, outside of 40 yards, is one out of four. 
It'll be placed down by Marvin Cobb at the 34. The lines are down. The ball is snapped. The kick is up in the air. It is plenty long, and it is plenty good. So Marvin Cobb drills it from 44 yards out. There's time out on the field. With a score now, Bengals three, Dolphins nothing. A big game at Cincinnati. Chris Barrows just hit a 44-yard field goal to give the Bengals a 3-0 lead over Miami in the first quarter. Joe Reed at quarterback for the Lions. For the throw and first down. Reed has time. Here comes Selman. Gets the ball away. It is caught by J.D. Hill, who is knocked down out of the 47-yard line. A pickup of about seven yards on the play. Very nearly holding on Leroy Selman. Somebody had him on the ground. Don, this is a little bit different here for the Detroit Lions. They've taken a lot of flax over the last few weeks by being a club that ran the football a lot. But here on opening play, Reed cocks that arm and makes the first completion here. So it's a new twist for the Detroit Lions because they are not a passing club. Tough customer, the middle guard for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, Dave Bear. Dave Bear. Now the Cleveland Browns have jumped out in front of the Giants 7 0 on a run by Pruitt. Cleveland is starting without Sipes this week. They're coming back with a with a backup quarterback, and Dave May has not played that much at all this year. Browns running in a tie with Pittsburgh right now. Big game coming up on CBS, the doubleheader game. Dallas and Pittsburgh this afternoon. Eddie looks like he's out there for the pass punt <laughs> kick. They list him at 5'8. I think he's on his tiptoes to get there. Third down and seven coming up for Detroit. Lions have the ball at the 16-yard line of Tampa Bay with no score in the first quarter. Joe Reed takes a deep drop, looks into the end zone, puts it up, it's intercepted. Dewey Selman has the ball. And Selman comes crashing out to the 30. And the Buccaneers are jumping up and down on the sidelines. Big Abe Gibran, their defensive coach, fires a fist in the air as Tampa Bay stops the threat and gets the football back. And Dewey Selman's down right now, but he appears to be all right. He was shaken up on the tackle. Here is Cal Lepore, the referee to give us the official call. It was against Detroit. The play goes, the 34-yard return. So when we come back for the second quarter, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers will have the ball across their 45 as still nothing is on the board. Greasy goes back to throw, looks, fires up, touchdown on a quick cross to Nat Moore. Nat Moore on a quick slant in front of Mel Morgan and the Dolphins as a result of that fumble by Steve Holden at the seven yard line and the punt have capitalized on it a five yard touchdown pass from Greasy to Nat Moore and the Dolphins go out in front by a score of six to three. That was a quick slant. Greasy hit Nat Moore and now Yepremian will attempt the extra point. The lines are down. Waiting for the snap. It's high. The ball is placed. Premium's kick is up in the air, and it is good. So there's time out on the field. Score now. Dolphins 7, Bengals 3. Bob Greasy has just thrown six yards to Nat Moore, and the Dolphins have moved in front of Cincinnati 7-3 to three late in the first quarter. We're at Pontiac, Michigan. The Tampa Bay Buccaneers and the Detroit Lions are scoreless through the first quarter of play, but after that good punt return by Danny Reese... The Buccaneers have the ball first and 10 just across their 45-yard line. Probably the best uh, field position either team has had in this ballgame right now. Uh, I know I'd say uh, just the best field position. Having only about 45 yards to move, Tampa Bay could possibly come up with a score here, Don. Well, let's see. The touchdowns have not come easily to this team. Their biggest point production in the brief history of the team, of course, was the 23 points they scored against Seattle. But that was short as the Seahawks got 30 that day. First and 10 now. Jeb Blunt, the quarterback. He's dropping to throw. He's looking deep. He's putting up a home run ball. And Isaac Haggins is out there. Oh, the ball was tipped by the free safety, Dick Geron. It caromed off the helmet of Isaac Haggins. It was a touch away from being six points for the Buccaneers. Watch it again. Very, very astute play here by Dick Geron. He got over there just in time to prevent a big six-pointer 
Free safety having to reach in the trail position. Gets the fingertips on it, causing the ball to bounce up a little bit, hitting Higgins on the forehead. Well, a sellout crowd of 57,000 plus, and this game was virtually sold out. Lock, stock, and barrel in July, Brad. The uh, Windy City fans here, of course, hoping the Bears would be in playoff contention, and uh, they still are, barely. And, of course, everyone figured the Vikes to be right where they are, in first place in the Central Division. The Bears have gotten off to a good start, even though the game is scoreless. They have 105 yards to only 12 for the Vikings. The Bears 17 plays, Vikings 3. Just power football. They're going to try to blast it out. They're still about a yard and three quarters away. It's second down goal. Light off the tight end on the right side. Parsons on the left. Wing to the left. Deuce backfield on second and goal inside the Viking two-yard line. Abilene with a call. They give to Peyton. Following his blockers. Trying to turn the corner to the right side. Gets in for the touchdown. He just barely got outside of Mark Mulaney. And Reedy Sorey threw the block at the last moment. And Walter turned the corner on the right side and skipped into the end zone for his 11th touchdown of the year. And the Bears finally put six points on the board. With 6.43 to go and a half at 6 something Chicago. Remy Soy took out two minutes for the Vikings that time to allow Peyton to turn the corner, putting blocks on both Mulaney and Nate Wright. We give a lot of credit to Remy Soy on that scamper as Walter Peyton goes in from a yard and a half out for his 11th touchdown of the year. Here's the extra point. Bob Thomas, 18 of 20 in the PAT department, but now we've got Vince Evans holding. Reserve quarterback, Bashnagel normally holds. There's a snap, the ball is down, the kick is up, and it is good. And the Bears lead the Minnesota Vikings 7 to nothing with 6 minutes and 43 seconds left to go in the first half. Joe, that extra point came about five weeks too late. <laughs> there is Tommy Hutzbeth, the head coach of the Lions. There is the big game at Soldier Field in Chicago. The Bears are leading the Vikings 7-0. Walter Payton has just run a yard for a touchdown in the first quarter for that score. No Jeb Blunt drops to throw. Swings it out to Ricky Bell. He's trouble, 220 pounds. Bell is knocked out of bounds at about the 46-yard line of the Detroit Lions by James Hunter, one of the cornerbacks. Let's watch it again. A slow developing screen. Watch off to the right of your screen is the lineman release, number 62 and 51, as they get out trying to form the wall and Jeff Winans. And they get some pretty good protection, but no place to go for Ricky Bell. I'll tell you one thing, Tampa Bay's about two offensive linemen away from being a real football team. They've got one of the better defenses I've seen. They need a tight end, uh, Don, and I would say another quarterback. And they're ready to go. Dave Green is in to punt, and there's Eddie Payton back to receive. Detroit will start out deep in its own area. Picks the ball well. He scoops it down again. We have a penalty marker down. Peyton picks it up inside his 10. And Danny Reese comes over the top and gets him. Also on the play for Tampa Bay was Mucker. And so Detroit will start out inside its 15-yard line unless oh, we have an illegal man downfield for Tampa Bay. Over. As fast as Mr. Mucker got downfield, it just might be him because I don't see how he got down there so quickly when the ball was a low punt. Larry Mucker, a very quick wide receiver out of Arizona State. Might have been down early. We'll get the call from the referee, Kale Lepore. A five-yard markup. It comes with 7.55 to play in the first half. There still is no score up. Ineligible downfield, 53 offense, fourth down. Illegally downfield for the Buccaneers was Rick Bonas. He was another high draft choice of the Oakland Raiders, a linebacker out of Nebraska. Neither team has a first down in the second quarter. Each team has three first downs for the game. And each team has a goose egg up on the scoreboard. It is nothing, nothing with 7.55 to play. Green hits it again, high end over end. At the 15, here's Eddie Payton. Oh, he ran into a heavy hit. Eddie Payton was waffled down on the play. Coming up to make the pop was Ragsdale. And so it is first and 10 for Detroit after a 37-yard punt by Dave Green. 7.43 to play. Neither team with offense that can sustain. This is 
a $163 million Superdome. As today, the New Orleans Saints, with a 2-7 and seven record, play host of the surprising Atlanta Falcons, who come into today's game with a 5-4 and four record. Hi, everybody. I'm Gary Vendor, and alongside me, Mr. Quarterback John Unitas. John, before the day is over, the Atlanta Falcons could be tied for first place in the Western Division. Possibly, but first they have to get by the Saints, Gary. Let's take a look at the standings. Los Angeles six and three, Atlanta five and four, San Francisco four and five. If Atlanta beats the Saints and San Francisco beats Los Angeles, they will be a tie in this division. Well, the Atlanta Falcons have been winning with their defense. They've allowed only 62 points, and it's going to be tough for New Orleans. It'll be tough. Bobby Douglas has that job this afternoon. Not noted as a, a real good passer. He is an outstanding runner. In 1972, 968 yards to set a record for rushing for a quarterback, Harry. Well, on the other hand, should he not get the job done, Archie Manning, we understand, is available. Hank Stram said last night that if we get into a passing contest, we will have to put the Archie Manning in. All right, the game is underway. The kick now to the New Orleans Saints. They bring it up to the 25-yard line. The Saints with a two and seven record. Last year winning here against the Atlanta Falcons, 30 to nothing, losing in Atlanta, so they have split. Return out to the 25 yard line. That is an interesting statistic. Tampa Bay's defense allowed only 197 yards to the Giants last week. In fact, Tampa Bay outgained the New York Giants last week by 90 yards. Buccaneers had 287 yards total offense. Lions with the ball, first and 10. Bang, three football. Dave Pitter has it. He's inside the 15 and down to the 9. First and goal, Tampa Bay. Boy, I'll tell you, the Buccaneers' defense plays some kind of football. They just detonate on the ball carrier. Watch this hit. Leroy Selman. He knocked the football free. Dave Pear picks it up. And runs the ball down inside the 15-yard line. The quarterback, Reed, finally ran him down. The ball's right at the 10. Once again, Rick Kane, Don, is having his trouble. He's been a good little runner for the Detroit Lions, but he had a costly fumble last week in Atlanta that caused a touchdown. Fortunately, this time, they were able to, to drag Pierre down before he got to the end zone. Or it might have been six points again, all from uh, Ricky Kane. So it is first and goal for Tampa Bay at the 10 yard line of Detroit. No score in the second quarter. Pitch back Anthony Davis end around. Here comes Morris Owens and the Lions knock him down for a loss of seven yards. And they take the ball away. Penalty markers down. We'll see if this comes back. Len Barney going down the field. The ball was stolen. There are penalty markers down all over the field. That one has to come back, Don, because the ball was headed for it right. to Lynn Barney. Paul Numoff takes his helmet off in disgust. He's angered about something, one of the Lion defensive players. Lions apparently have the football. Their offensive unit is coming out. They stole the ball. But as you pointed out, Emerson, the forward handoff negated that long run for what might have been a touchdown by Len Barney. we will have to look at that again. Here's Cal Laporte. And an illegal forward pass on the return. Penalty is declined. We have aiding the runner on the offense, making it a first down. Yeah, let's watch it now. Here is the play. Take a look again. They do it an end around. Anthony Davis hands off. Morris Owens has the ball. Gets in a bit of trouble here. I really don't see the ball leave his hand here, but number one, he's got the ball inside where all the opposition is coming from. That you never want to do, be it, be it in the pros or in the collegiate ranks or high school or little leagues. Now Mr. the ball Ron comes out. Picks it up on one hop. Anderson on a keeper right down to the 15, to the 10, to the 5, touchdown. Kenny Anderson on a keeper. They really split the middle of the line, and Anderson ran 17 yards for a touchdown. Big blocking by Bob Johnson and Dave Lapham in the middle. And the rush really came from the outside, and the Bengals really caught him napping with that call. Anderson, 17 yards on a keeper, and the Bengals go out in front by a score of 
nine to seven. Kenny Anderson just tiptoeing his way all the way through there, picking his steps very carefully. That hole opened up, and you could have taken half of this stadium right straight through it. So Byer will attempt the extra point. Marvin Cobb will hold. Ball is placed down. The kick is away, and it is good. So there's time out on the field with a score now. Bengals 10, Dolphins 7. Cincinnati has just scored in the 17-yard run by Kenny Anderson to take the lead over the Miami Dolphins. 10 to 7, a very big game being played at Riverfront Stadium in Cincinnati. Cleveland, 5 and 4, John. They can ill afford to lose that one. Now we see it. Cleveland 7, New York Giants 7 in the second period. Jerry Goldstein has thrown a touchdown pass for the New York Giants in that game. Third down and eight from the 28-yard line. Douglas again to throw. Child's intended receiver is picked off instead. Ray Brown's got it. Brown to the 25 and Ray Brown to the 23-yard line. Ray Brown to this third interception of the year. And Bobby Douglas being booed here. That is Douglas's third interception he's thrown this year. John, he just overthrew Henry Childs. That ball was thrown right in the middle, and uh, Brown standing right there just couldn't help but catch it. There, let's take a look at him right there. As you see, as the ball was overthrown, Ray Brown standing back there makes the interception. Douglas just did not get the ball down into where he wanted to. So we... Third down conversions. The Lions only one of five. They have a third and ten coming up. Joe Reed has Leroy Selman hit him just as he gets the ball away and is intercepted. Mike Washington has the ball for Tampa Bay. Inside the 20. Still on his feet. Blockers in front. Inside the 15 and Mike Washington. And all in American and Alabama runs the ball back inside the 15-yard line. And again, Joe Reed makes the tackle. If you're going to throw it, you're going to have to try to stop it. Joe Reed he doesn't get that much pressure, even though Selman comes in off the right of his oh. screen. Makes a hit as the ball is released, but he just simply overthrew as an intended receiver. And Washington picks it off and starts back downfield. Gets a little bit careless here with the football. You should cherish this thing once you get your hand on it, especially as a defensive ball player. But great field position for the Tampa Buccaneers. Let's see if they can move it in. I'll tell you, this Tampa Bay defense plays darn good offense. <laughs> oh, yeah. They've got a lot of yardage. Three turnovers. Anthony Davis up the middle. And I think right now Tampa Bay is going to play it very close to the vest and probably run the ball right up the gut to give themselves a shot at a field goal, if not a touchdown. I think right now Coach McKay has changed his strategy a bit. He was wide open on the last possession of the football and calling that end around, losing the football. Now he wants to try to move it down, and hopefully if he doesn't get it into the end zone or his six points, he's going to try the field goal. Buck Jersey, our statistician, just handed me some amazing statistics. Walter Payton of Chicago has run for 151 yards with two minutes still to go in the second quarter against the Vikings. Right up the middle of Ricky Bell, and he crashes inside and down to the five-yard line. It'll be third and less than in about two for Tampa Bay. Charles West, the Lions' strong safety, made the hit. There is something stuttering about the Tampa Bay offensive unit. Watch number 42, Ricky Bell. He had to ward off a would-be tackler. Couldn't get a full head of steam. There's a breakdown here and there with that Tampa Bay offense causing their runners to have to pick and choose their way. There is Gary Danielson, the third quarterback. He is a second-year man out of Purdue. Apparently, Joe Reed is going to get the hook. Third and about three for Tampa Bay. Ricky Bell crashes ahead very close to a first down. Not quite there, it doesn't appear. Bring up fourth and inches. There was something there, Don. I don't know whether our viewers saw it or not. Number 42, Ricky Bell, ran right inside. He didn't run that thing with authority. He was kind of feeling his way with one arm out trying to shield himself. That's not the Ricky Bell I know. Well, Jeb Blunt looked over. John McKay said, stay in their offense. No place kickers coming in. We're going for the first down. So right now, they're going to call a timeout. And let's watch as Marvin Muse, our director, shows us it again. This is not Ricky Bell. Watch him once he gets in the trouble. He gets his arm out front trying to ward off tacklers. When you're in that close, you've got to rip with everything you got with hopes of getting into that goal line. That's not the Ricky Bell I know. Early in the week, there, there was a report that Ricky felt that he is not running well. And uh, apparently on that run right then, shows that he is not running as well as he has was run. There's a really outstanding show for the whole family coming up next Wednesday at 8 Eastern time here on CBS. 
Once Upon a Brother's Grimm, a magical trip through the wicked delights of the fairy tale world of the Brothers Grimm with Dean Jones and Paul Sand. It's at 8 o'clock Eastern, 7 Central, next Wednesday night on CBS. And also, you'll be seeing the George Burns One Man Show. That's coming up Wednesday at 10 o'clock Eastern, 9 Central. 80 year old George Burns has a great show for you. He's got some great people with him Ann Margaret, Gladys Knight, the Pips, the Captain Tennille, and a special friend, Bob Hope. That's next Wednesday night at 10 Eastern Time, George Burns' One Man Show here on CBS. I'm sure you'll enjoy it. Love that title, One Man Show with a great lineup of guests. Fourth and inches for Tampa Bay. The ball at the Detroit four-yard line. No score. 4.39 to play in the first half. Jeb Blunt, the quarterback, Morris Owens, goes in motion. Hand off, Ricky Bell, touchdown, Tampa Bay! Tampa Bay scores a touchdown and takes the lead 6-0. As they go 13 yards in four plays, they gamble on fourth down, and Ricky Bell, the great All-American from Southern California, gets his number called and responds with a touchdown run. Watch again here. It was not the kind of play where Ricky Bell was coming out with authority until he found his way to the outside, saw the dark color blue, knowing that that's the end of the line, meaning six points, and they got it. They're on the board. So with 4.34 left to play in the first half, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers have gone on the board. They've forced three turnovers. They're great defense. There's a player down for Tampa Bay. It looks like Jeff Winans was shaken up on the touchdown run. Then Ricky Bell on fourth and inches from three yards out powers his way into the end zone, and it's a 6-0 game. And now Levitt is on the field to try the point after for Tampa Bay. Jeff Winans is up, and he's okay. So we've had a dramatic turn of events here today as Tampa Bay has taken the lead. Their defense has just played superior football. As we have four and a half minutes to go, Dave Green will hold in the first half. Alan Levitt will try the point after. <laughs> Levitt hits the extra point, but there's a penalty marker down. The Lions are protesting something in. I'm sure right now. Coach Hutchpeth and all of his Detroit ball players are saying, we hope it's not us that have to lose to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. It was against the Lions. The extra point is good. Tampa Bay leading the game 7 to nothing as there's some jubilation on the sideline. And Tampa Bay has a total offense. Believe this or not, it's true. They have a total offense of only nine yards. Yet their great defense has been the difference. The Lions only have 36 yards. That's how it stands, 7 nothing, And of course, Next Saturday, the CBS Sports Spectacular with three interesting and outstanding segments. And then on Sunday, it's more NFL action, a doubleheader day. And of course, on Thursday, you'll be seeing the Chicago Bears go against the Lions here at Detroit at 12 noon Eastern time, the annual Thanksgiving Day NFL game here at Detroit on CBS. The Assistant coaches for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, Tom Bass, Willie Brown, Wayne Fonts, Jerry Fry, Abe Gibran, who's done a great job with that defense, the former head coach of the Chicago Bears, Skip Husbands, Phil Kruger, and Bill Nelson. I always remember the line that Charlie Hanna, the fine defensive tackle from Alabama, who unfortunately is out with knee surgery, said after he had dinner at a big seafood restaurant over in Tarpon Springs with Abe Gibran, he said Gibran was eating squid and eel and Anna said, Coach Gibb was eating things we wouldn't go swimming with in Alabama. <laughs> Let's look at some other scores from around the National Football League. The Jets are leading the Colts 3-0 in the first quarter at Baltimore, your old club M. That's too early to say anything. Pat Leahy, a man that has had difficulty all year, has put the Jets ahead. They'll go for the field goal now. Evans in the hold. Thomas, 9 out of 15 in the three-point department. Give me a 37-yard field goal. Thomas is 7 for 10 inside the 40, but has missed his last two from inside the 40. Evans will hold the Vikings 27-yard line. There's the snap. The ball is down. The kick is up, and it is good. 37-yarder by Bob Thomas, and the Bears have taken a 10 nothing lead here with 43 seconds left to play in the first half. 
for today's play, Brad. Well, the Bears are dominating this football game, and actually the score is misleading. The Bears have uh, missed a couple of good opportunities. They got down to the one-yard line, didn't come up with a single point. Here they had a third down and a foot to go at the 12-yard line. Bubble the ball, had to settle for a field goal. They lead the game 10-0, 43 seconds to go in the half. And again, the Bears dominating this football game. Ball is facing already 150 yards, although that bubble is going to cut down his yardage a little bit. They've been going to Peyton all day. They have been keeping the ball on the ground. Bob Ambelini has passed the ball only one time, and that was for Walter Peyton on the flat. Brian Bashnagel tried one pass and a big field goal. The opening minutes of play as the Bears went to the fake from 39 yards out instead of trying to take their chances against the 24-mile-an-hour win. The Bears are in a good field position. They have simply dominated this football game. It is the best first half we have seen the Bears play, and it could have been better but for a few mistakes. Bears beating the Vikings. Bob Thomas just hit a 37-yard field goal for Chicago. At front three of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, Council Rudolph, Dave Kerr, and Leroy Selman are great tough customers. There's Gary Danielson. 6'2", 200 pounds, has had almost no playing time. The starting quarterback, Joe Reed, one of the leading tacklers for Detroit. <laughs> Markowski still playing to the knee brace, but moving pretty well on that play. Second down now, nine yards to go. This is stand back, and here comes Fettersfield. Joe Fettersfield, twice now, has gotten through, and I'll tell you, he must have known the play on that one. Well, we had a blitz on it, Gary. Let's watch it. Safe the man, Chris coming and Fettersfield coming. The guard was, the center was, guard was supposed to come over to get to Fettersfield, but there's no way he was going to do it. The center had to take either one, either, either safety or Fettersfield, and he chose Fettersfield. We have a flag on Christmas. the play, and also one of our officials was shaken up on the play. Fine play by the Saints on the blitz to get the, uh, to get the runner. And we see we have a penalty down, the official deciding what it's going to be. There it comes now. Gene Barth from St. Louis, the official for today's game. And he explains it to Hank Stram in his second year as the hit man of the New Orleans Saints. That's Gene Barth, number 14. Vern Marshall, number 94, or 34, I guess it was, Chris Graff, was a man shaken up. You can see him there. He got caught somewhere behind that line of scrimmage, and he was just buried back there. Well, if there's the officials, that if they want to get in the game, they better start wearing pads, Gary. It's tough out there. By the way, down below, Archie Manning is warming up for the Saints. We may see him before this game is very old. We have three and a half minutes left. Let's listen now to Gene Bart. We have a dead ball foul. Both players disqualified. 73 defense, 86 offense, third down, down counts, third down. Well, 86 would be Jim Mitchell, and 73 would be Joe Campbell. 73, a defensive end for the Saints, the number one draft pick for Maryland. So they're wasting no time of getting people out of this game. Both of them have been ejected from the game. Third down now, 13. is on a fumble well I tell you Chuck Chris came up from his strong safety spot and he was there almost the moment the ball was snapped very excellent timing by Chris on that blitz Murkowski is going to have to change his tactics as far as his count is concerned to try to keep New Orleans off balance back there they seem to be timing their, their uh, blitz on Burkowski's cadence well, a penalty, a flag on the play. Step off inside the 15-yard line. Let's listen. Uh, two or three minutes. Four, defense, offside, third down. Well, Chris was offside on that blitz. How about that? Well, that's one way to stop it. <laughs> so Chuck Chris, who made the sack and caused all the misery in the backfield, was offside. So now it's third down and eight yards to go. Boy, the crowd really booing here in the Superdome. Markowski to throw. Wallace Fletcher, defending on the play. Very well was Ernie Jackson, and Jackson getting up very slowly. 
He's had injury problems, and he's limping. So Barkowski on third down and eight doesn't get it. And we're going to have a field goal attempt coming up. And coming in is going to be Steinfurt, Fred Steinfurt, activated two weeks ago, replacing Nick Mickemeyer. He's hit two of three thus far. His longest of the year has been 34 yards. So this will be a 31-yarder. He's a left-footed soccer-style kicker. Started his career with Oakland. 31-yard attempt by Steinfurt. And it is good. Steinfurt hits it. And do you realize this is the first time Atlanta scored in the first quarter this season? Believe it or not, Atlanta with their first point of the first quarter in 77. Three to nothing, Atlanta. They're holding now. Thomas hits another driving boomer that's going to go into the end zone. That was seven yards deep and beyond the, the end line. So the Vikes will put it in play at the 20-yard line as Thomas hammers two deep into the Viking end zone with that prevailing wind. And with 43 seconds to go on the half, Bobby Lee will see what he can do about this 10-0 deficit the Vikings face. As Pat Benkowski, our star our spotter, just uh, pointed out it could very easily be 17 or 21 nothing Bears. We just want to win. And, of course, hopefully by more than six points. Slot left, Deuce backfield. And Lee will hand off to McClanahan. Turns the right corner, cuts back inside, still on his feet, and struggles to about the 22-yard line. Kirkenstern was over there with help from uh, Jim Osborne. They put him down. A gain of two. It'll be second down eight. Here's where the Bears want to win by more than six points. The Bears wind up in a division tie with the Vikings. The tie-breaking system is first head-to-head -head competition. Right. The Bears and Vikings be one and one. Next games within the division. Both would be four and two. Next games within the NFC. They figure to be the same there if they wind up in a tie. The next criteria is point differential and head-to-head -head competition. Minnesota beat the Bears by six. Bears should try to win by at least seven today. This will probably be the final play of the first half. A gain of three, and uh, Lee is going to let the clock run out. You know, already Bobby Douglas has thrown more passes in this game, John, than he did all of last week when he threw only seven. I think he's thrown his last pass. I see Hank Stram down there with his arm around Archie Manning, and I believe Archie may be coming in. There's that last drive, which was set up brilliantly on the interception by Ray Brown. Steinfurt with a 31-yard field goal, three of four for the year. And Atlanta, the way they've been playing defense, they don't have to score a lot of points. They've been something. There's Archie Manning. He's talking with uh, Coach Dick Wood right there, quarterback coach. I just see some serious consultation going on on us. Archie is coming in now, hadn't played for three or four weeks. I understand his foot is all right, and he's going to be coming in. As we mentioned earlier in a ball game, that uh, Hank Stram said if we needed Archie, he would be in, and it didn't take him long to insert him. I tell you, Archie Manning played so well earlier this year, and then he hurt that ankle. And, John, sometimes you just can't come back from ankle sprains. They can really bother you. And from the 31-yard line, the Saints trailing three to nothing. Already, we've had a block punt and two interceptions. And we have three minutes and seven seconds to go in the first quarter, and here comes Archie Manning. Archie Manning, who's hitting just about 53% of his passes. He has three touchdowns, three interceptions, 66 of 125. Against Chicago this year, he ran for three touchdowns and passed for one. Manning giving off to Galbraith, and Tony Galbraith gets close to five yards as he advances out to the 35-yard line. Mike Lewis made the stop. Archie Manning has only beaten the Falcons twice in eight starts. It'll be interesting to see how he attacks that defensive football team of the Atlanta Falcons. Well, you can see at the top of your screen a yellow flag. Another penalty. We had a lot of them here in the early going of this football game. Two players have been ejected, Joe Campbell and Jim Mitchell. Public service by the National Football League. Now, uh, here's the first half statistics, Emerson Boozer. You can assess those uh, really pretty much even, except rushing. Lines of a little more overall stats. Only 38 yards for the Buccaneers, but they'll take that bottom line. They lead 7 nothing. Yes, they will. Right now, uh, I'm sure the Detroit Lions are saying stats are for losers because they're uh, pretty much even, but the point spread is the big difference. Here is the kickoff now by Green, and it's there by Eddie Payton. Across the 20, out to the 30, into the 32. They go with a straight-ahead return. Nettie Payton out of Jackson State, brother of Walter Payton, who's tearing up the Minnesota Vikings today at Chicago. Gets the ball out to the 32-yard line. 
Paul Harris, an Alabama linebacker, was down to make the tackle. First and ten for the Lions on the 31 yard line. So it is now first and ten for the Lions. Their starting quarterback, Detroit, if you join us, like Greg Landry, is not in uniform today, injured a knee last week and is out. Joe Reed came in. He was intercepted regularly by the Tampa Bay Buccaneers in the first half. He got him twice. Danielson came in there. That's who's quarterbacking now. Gary Danielson in his second year from Purdue. Hand off to Rick Kane. And he got ahead for very little yardage, got across the 32. And you know, Emerson, the Detroit <laughs> Lions came out of that locker room fired up. They don't want to be embarrassed. I could imagine Coach Tommy Hutchbeth getting into the locker room, not really being uh, very, very vocal, but almost pleading, please don't let these guys beat us, especially in Detroit. Brent Musburger was talking about that 63-yard field goal, the Dempsey kick. That was also against the Detroit Lions. Remember, after the game, the Lions were so astounded by that play. Joe Schmidt, then their coach, said uh, Dempsey didn't kick that. God kicked that one. Nobody could kick yarder, a 63 yarder. He had to get some help from somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> well, coaches are always looking for agility, right, John? I'll tell you that, Gary. She has more moves than months you ever thought about having. Let's get with it, huh? <laughs> All right. Okay, we're going to start the second quarter of play here in the Superdome. Atlanta's leading three to nothing, but the Saints are on the move. They have a second down, virtually 10 yards to go now at the 27-yard line of Atlanta. Archie Manning has taken over, and he's moved the football team. Top of the screen is John Gilliam. Galbraith punts to the running backs. And there's a gap to Tony Galbraith, and Galbraith just short of the 25-yard line. It was Pennywell again. Pennywell is from Shreveport, Louisiana. Went to Grambling. This young man walked out of the 49er camp. He was drafted in the sixth round and got a chance to play when Fulton Kuykendall was hurt. And there's the master, Hank Stram. Second year, the helm of the Saints. He's had a team that's just been somewhat of a mystery to him. But it has got to be a tremendous lift to the offensive football team to have the Archie Manning coming back to play quarterback. And look at that score. The Jets three, the Baltimore six, and the first period. Hey, Burt Jones threw a 53-yard touchdown pass to Raymond Chester in that game. 53 yards. All right, third down and eight. Manning. Got him out open. Touchdown. Henry Childs. Make that James Faxton. But wait a minute, there's a flag back at the 32-yard line. Faxton. His second touchdown catch, but I believe it's going to come back. Boy, he was all wide open. But Manning made that play because he scrambled out and got additional time. Arch Archie moved up into the pocket, moved to his left, and when something like that happens, it's generally a a holding penalty or something against uh, the Saints. Let's listen to the umpire, the official call it. Number 77, offensive holding, third down. Well, that's Marv Montgomery, the left side tackle, who Hank Stram says is their best offensive lineman right now. Boy, that hurts. And the ball, the 44-yard line of Tampa Bay. We're in the third quarter, 11.53 to play in it. And the Buccaneers in a three-yard touchdown run on fourth down. Have the only points of the game. Ricky Bell took it into the second quarter to give Tampa Bay the lead. Danielson gets away. Fires the ball and completes it for a first down. Charlie Sanders got the ball. Danielson with a great recovery. He was hit hard, got away, and sidearm the ball to Charlie Sanders for a first down. He got all kinds of pressure that time from the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. They were on high seas and coming. As you see, 63, Leroy Selman goes over the top as Danielson ducks, pulls away from one man here, and sidearms down to Charlie Sanders for a big gain of 14 yards and a first down, Don. Baxton was really doing a good job of getting open, too, when he saw Manning in trouble. Baxter was running for the open spot. Archie just happened to spot him and laid the ball out there perfectly. So now instead of a touchdown, it's third and 18. The ball outside the 35. Bomwina jumps offside. Wilson Bomwina, the Samoan from San Jose State, jumped across. He was their second first round draft pick this year, along with Warren Bryant. He is quick, but too quick on that play. Encroachment, 74 defense, third down. So now it moves to third and 13. 
Bob Wayne are just a little bit anxious on that play. Wanted to get in there to get up to get a hold of Archie. It's now third down and 12 for that's the a, Saints. That's the fourth penalty in this drive, by the way. A lot of flags. 14 10 to go before halftime. Third and 13. Manning intended for Galbraith. And Manning was dumped, and we've got another flag at the 20 yard line. A penalty against Atlanta. I believe we have pass interference coming up. There's Archie Manning getting up. There's Pennywell. He's upset. Rosina also. So that'll be the fifth penalty of this drive. A lot of discussion going on here at the floor of the Superdome. Well, they want to control the control the ball game, but that's exactly what they're trying to do. Nine defensive pass interference. First down. That's Pennywell. Automatic first down, so it's at the 19-yard line now. There he is, 59. Robert Pennywell, 6'1", 222-pounder. He picked off a pass last week and went 20 yards for a touchdown against the Detroit Lions. So now we come to a first down at the 19-yard line. The Saints, some ball control on this drive. That's a big break for the Saints coming up with that first down situation now. Instead of fourth, it's first and 10 for the Saints on the 20. Archie Manny. Sends in motion, Don Herman. Play action in the round of Thaxton. He's got a block. And Thaxton is to about the 16 and a flag is thrown. There's two flags on the far sideline. Well, a little new wrinkle that time by Hank Stram. Steve on a very fine block back there. I, couldn't, I don't know why that could have been construed. Block, uh, clipping or not, uh, Gary, it looked like he was just turning around just as Steve came over to hit him. But I don't know if that's the area in which it happened. It looked like it was downfield a little further. Anyway, it's going to be against New Orleans because they're getting ready to step it off now from the 19-yard line. Gene Barth, 15-yarder. Going to move that ball up to the 34. So we're going back and forth with the penalties. Personal foul. Clipping number 41 offense on the run. Well, that's First down. that track back by John Gilliam that did that, which is illegal. That was downfield down there. And of course, the block by Steve was a perfectly executed block and one that actually made the play go. Now the Lions send out their staunch place kicker, Steve Mickemeyer. I think Mickemeyer has to be a little bit shaky. He's had a difficult time this year hitting just about from anywhere. Uh, he's going to try from 47 yards. Danielson will hold. He's got the distance. 47 yard field goal by Steve Mickemeyer, and so the Lions are on the board. 9.42 to go in the third quarter, and it's a 7 to 3 game. Tampa Bay holding the lead. Oh. So the 15-yard penalty now makes it first and 25. They've got to move to the nine-yard line for a first down. Instead, they have it at the 34. Archie Manning now trying to collect his thoughts and keep this drive going. Manning back to throw on first and 25. The trouble is safe. And we've got a play. Jeff Merrill hitting from behind. Are we going to have an intentional grounding? He tried to get the ball up the field to Chuck Muncy. Manning arguing his cause. As Jeff Merrill coming from the right side defensive end spot hit Manning from behind. And now let's wait on this penalty. It's thrown about where Manning went down. So if that is intentional grounding, it's a loss of down and 15 yards. That's the most costly penalty in football. Illegal forward pass, intentional grounding, loss of down, number two. Well, that's now seven penalties on this drive. Well, I'm sure that Arch is complaining that he was throwing the ball to Chuck Muncy, and he, he has a legitimate gripe for that part. He just didn't get the ball far enough downfield, I'm sure, for the official to see it. That's a tough call to make, John. I've seen that all year long, and it's hard. It's very hard to make a judgment call like that. Those things happen. Those guys are out there trying to do the best job they know how. They certainly do not want to get this, let this ball game get out of control. Now it's second down and an acre to go. What do you do on second and 40? Give to Galbraith, and he's going to get some of it. 40, 40. 
25, 30, 25, and Cal Withers inside the 25-yard line. Ray Easterly dropped him. They still got to go about 14 yards for a first down, but they're back into field goal range. And Archer was out there looking for another flash. <laughs> 26-yard run by Galbraith. Let's take a look at it. A quick open as uh, Galbraith just pitched the hole. Fine blocking on the offside of the play. Allows Galbraith to, to start to his right side. Go cut back left side. And there we see Ron McCartney, number 56, coming up. Ray Easterling, 32, making the tackle. Well, he gets a lot of it back. It was 40 yards. Now it's third and 14. In motion, Don Herman. Manny. He's going to Muncie. Now we've got another play. Billy McLean, number 52. It'll be first and goal with the one. Muncie almost made a great catch on that. Your hat deserves another look at it. Let's watch Archie's goes back and sets up. Gets some pressure from the inside. Defensive passer. Well, Jeff Bowe coming in for pressure on it. One yard line. Let's watch the play. I believe they construed that as uh, face guarding Gary with the hands up in, in his face. I'm not sure. You're allowed to put the hands up, but you're not allowed to wave them. And I don't know if that's what they called or not. Well, anyway, it's first and goal at the one yard line. And now the Saints trailing three to nothing have a chance to go on top. Well, this has been a, a real gutsy drive by him. A lot of penalties. Eight of them to be exact. Time to get over, and not doing so is Galbraith, and we have yet another play. Offside, Atlanta. This may be a record for penalties on one series. That's the ninth penalty of this drive. So they'll have half the distance to the goal. They'll have a first and goal at the half-yard line. Defense offside, first and goal on a half-yard line. <laughs> I'll tell you, this is the kind of series that must drive coaches crazy. Huh? Well, who ever thought they would have got out of the hole in uh, second and 40? With well, a fine run by Galbraith to bring him down, and of course, then the defensive interference call by the Atlanta Falcons on the half yard line. All right, first and goal, half yard line. That's a give to Muncie, touchdown. Chuck Muncy with a block from tight end Henry Childs. And that is only the third touchdown this year that has been scored against Lad on the ground. And Muncy took it in. Let's watch the blocking of number 85. Henry Childs right there on, the, on your screen. And you see Muncy and Galbraith both going through the hole. Galbraith leading Muncy as Muncy dives over for the touchdown. Emmanuel Zander is on a good fine block. So after nine penalties, the drive is culminated on a half yard smash by Chuck Muncy. Zaro to attempt the point after. And Rick Zaro's got it. And the New Orleans Saints have taken a seven to three lead with 12 minutes and 49 seconds to go in this first half of play. A 68 yard drive and eight plays with this guy, Chuck Muncy, taking it in. Cincinnati now has an exit lead to 13 to 7 over Miami on a field goal by Chris Barr from 43 yards out his second of the game. New Orleans has moved out in front of the Atlanta Falcons that game in the second quarter at New Orleans. Denver looking to go for its ninth win in 10 games this season out in front of Kansas City 7 nothing that game in the first quarter. Baltimore has now moved in front of the Jets 9 to 3. Linhart hit a field goal and Burt Jones threw a 53-yard pass to Raymond Chester. The extra point was missed. Second and eight. First pass through is Ricky Bell. Oh, man, he almost took it the distance. Ricky Bell rips it out across the 30 to the 32-yard line. That's the biggest gainer of the day for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And as we watch it again, you can tell Ricky Bell is a little bit tight here. The uh, reason I say he's tight because he keeps uh, the football in tight. He clutches it, keeps on driving. Normally when a running back gets out in the open like that, he starts to move a bit. But he was satisfied to pick up the 20 yards. Herb Orvis and James Hunter ran him down, but it was a 20-yard gain. It gets Tampa Bay out of the hole. They have a first down at their 31. They lead the game 7-3, third quarter. Here's Isaac Higgins, wide open, 
It's a foot race now. Baggins inside the 30. He fumbles the ball. It's going all the way down inside the 10. It's a free football. Again, it might be a safety. We'll see what the impetus is rules. Rule a touchback. The Lions have the ball on a touchback. Here's what we meant earlier. Tampa Bay put Hackens in because he has 4-3 speed, but uh, those six second hands, he gets hit as he tries to stretch out and out distance the defenders. That you've got to be careful with. Ball gets hit, squirts out. The big gain is negated, and Detroit scrambles to gain possession. Lem Barney stripped the ball. The pass play was good for 45 yards before Haggins lost the ball. Then it caroms into the end zone as the Lions knocked it in there. Rule to safety, the impetus of the ball coming off that fumble, and James Hunter was the man who came up with the ball for Detroit, and they have it first and 10 of their 20 when we come back. That's as good, really, as a long punt, though, for Tampa Bay. Oh, yeah. Stay around here long enough, you'll see everything. He was very relaxed, trying to uh, get, his, get his arm mo mo motion going. But when there's people around you, you just can't do it. But this comes with, with experience. He'll learn something from that uh, that stripping of the ball there by Barney. Yeah, they get the biggest coaches around. Look at that guy. <laughs> He'll go 200 today, he can't one 200 yard there. So Atlanta, who just gave up their third touchdown rushing of the 1977 season. After the 68-yard drive, nine plays and nine penalties, we should add, <laughs> took five minutes and 18 seconds. All kinds of wheels turning now on both sidelines. It's third and goal at the Bears' three-yard line. Steve Craig is tied in out of Northwestern. Wide to the near side, it's a double-wing formation. Double-wing left. And Lee, quick jump pass in the middle, intercepted! Intercepted by Hicks, and he gets back down to the nine yard line! What a play! A jump pass right over the middle, and Tom Hicks was there in front of the Viking receiver and picked it off there about a yard deep into the end zone and brought it back up to the nine yard line. What a turnaround for the Bears! Tommy Hicks in his second year out of Illinois with his first big league interception, and what a play it was! The Bears have it at the nine yard line, still leading the game 10 to 7. A great play by Hicks. He's good back there on pass defense. As soon as uh, Lee made a quick jump pass, it looked like it was going to be seven points. There was Hicks. It was intended for Bob Tucker. All right, slot to the left, deuce backfield. And again, now to Peyton on a sweep to the right side. Tried to squirt through, break one tackle. He's on his street at the 15, the 20, the 25, the 30. having a sensational game at Chicago has run with the ball as you see 34 times for 192 yards and that game is still in the third quarter the Bills and the Patriots now in the third quarter John Smith just hit his second field goal for the Patriots and they lead 6 nothing Buffalo playing New England tough a lot of the two o'clock game starting now big one at St. Louis the Philadelphia Eagles going against the Cardinals a team that's really starting to come on There is Tommy Hutzbeth, who joined the Lions back in 1974 as a pro scout, was promoted to coordinator of personnel and scouting. Now the head coach with a problem as the Tampa Bay Buccaneers lead 7-3 in the third quarter and had the ball first and 10. They're trying to throw some knuckleballs at Jeff Blunt. Now they drop off. 
He puts it up. Intercepted. Ball is intercepted by Dick Geron, the free safety, and taken back to the 44-yard line of Detroit. And there the Lions going offense first and 10. This is some wild football game. My goodness, there's a lot more coming, too. We're going to be back in a moment. We have 4.51 to play in the third quarter. Tampa Bay holding to a 7-3 lead. The Lions have the ball back. Tackle. So it's going to bring up second and goal at just about the 8.5-yard line. They didn't get much on that play. Interesting stat on Stanback that he has only missed one game in four years with the Falcons, so he's a good, hard-running hard horse back there. From Tennessee in his fourth year. Arkowski on a bootleg. Throwing, take us, touchdown. Alfred Jenkins made a remarkable catch. And I'll tell you, Barkowski really disguised that play well. Looked like he was running all the way. But he didn't pull Pat Hughes again because as he was throwing, number 54, Pat Hughes made the hit on him. An excellent catch by Jenkins as he came out off of that. Barkowski coming off the bootleg. Let's watch it here. It deserves a good Chuck Chris again coming in on the blitz. Pat Hughes stayed at home. There's the throw. There's the hit by Hughes. And a great catch by Jenkins. Tremendous concentration on the football. Boy, I thought Barkowski's going to run that one all the way. And all of a sudden, he threw the ball. This is Steinfurt to attempt the point after. A flag on the play as Steinfurt hits it to make it 10 to 7. But let's wait a minute. Gene Barth indicating offside will be against New Orleans, so Atlanta will get it. And Atlanta now has taken a 10-7 lead. 7.41 to go in a very interesting first half here at the Superdome in New Orleans. We'll be right back. Baltimore is starting now to mount a lead. Jets 3 in Baltimore 12 in the second period. Tony Leonard, 31-yard field goal just moments ago for the Colts. 7-18 left in this third period. The Dolphins have a third and 16 at the Bengals 16. They go with the three wide receivers. Now Bulash is the only running back. Anderson goes out wide to the left. They have Nat Moore in the backfield. Bulash the only running back in behind Greasy. Greasy goes back to throw. Looks, fires into the end zone. Is caught. It'll be a touchdown. Hooking back was Duriel Harris. And he caught it down about the two-yard line, pulled away from Mel Morgan, and went in for the touchdown that ties this game up. So the fumble by Booby Clark set it up. And two Bengal fumbles this afternoon, one by Holden and one by Clark, have set up touchdowns. And for the first time this afternoon, the Dolphins have the opportunity to go ahead. Harris caught that ball, curling back at about the two-yard line, and then stepped away. And he kind of pointed his finger at Mel Morgan and say, there, I got you. That'll earn you a bust in the mouth when you show up a man that you've beaten. Your premier now will attempt the extra point that'll put the Dolphins out in front. Larry Seipel will hold it. The lines are down. There's the snap back. The ball is placed. The kick is up, and it is good. So there's time out on the field, but a flag is down. Wait a minute. Let's see. Okay, it's against the Bengals. So there's time out on the field. Score, Dolphins 14, Bengals 13. Ooh, so we're looking at Miami score. Miami's up on top of Cincinnati. 14-13 in the third period. Miami and Baltimore with some toughies today. 14-13. to 13. It's out. Not much third down efficiency, is there? Third and almost 10 for Detroit. Swing pass to Dave Hill. First down. He's down to the 12-yard line. Big Dave Hill, a second-year tight end from Texas A&I, is finally knocked down by Cedric Brown. Mr. Hill is pretty nifty. That's the second time that he's caught the ball when there was a defender around him. Gives a little step, gets around, and takes off. Watch it again. It's nifty footwork here by Dave Hill, the tight end, number 81. The left of your screen. Bates, one tackler. Now he takes off. Good maneuvering. Boy, there's a real dive block tackle. End up uh, getting a leg whip to take him down. Power run in 
Marv Hubbard gets ahead for about a yard and a half, and that's all. The big back from the Oakland Raiders. Seven to three. The count still stands. The Tampa Bay Buccaneers leading the Detroit Lions, but Detroit challenging now. They have the only points of the second half, the Lions do, and a 47-yard field goal by Mickemeyer. And now they have second down and eight coming up. From just outside the 10-yard line of Tampa Bay. at the one-yard line of Tampa Bay. Cecil Johnson caught him. Danielson's been the difference in the Detroit comeback. They call this around the league a sucker play. You might watch everybody pulling away. There goes Dewey with the rest of the line. Leroy River. Now Danielson tries to get into the end zone. And the gun sounds. That's the end of the third quarter with the score. The Tampa Bay Buccaneers, seven. The Detroit Lions, three, but challenging. And we now pause for a word from your local station. And hello to you here in Pontiac, Michigan, as we have quite a football game on our hands. This is Don Crickey with Emerson Boozer. As the Lions are now challenging for the go-ahead points, they have it first and goal from point-blank range at the one. This is where it gets tough, and uh, if there is a toughness about the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, it's on their defense. That they can play very well. It's unbelievable that Detroit quarterback can't quiet his own crowd down. Down Detroit. So the rookie from San Jose State rips it in. The Lions go 55 yards in nine plays. The big gainer, a 17-yard run on a naked reverse by the quarterback. And the Lions take the lead early in the first quarter, or the fourth quarter, the first play of the fourth quarter. Sheer power here by the Detroit Lions that they knew that they had to get the football into the end zone with John Morris pulling out, uh, Lynn Bowden rather, pulling out in front of uh, Kane, getting the ball inside. Just a little Thanksgiving Day stuff in five days ahead of time. Steve Mickemeyer will try to point after. Gary Danielson will hold. Two point difference right now, nine to seven. <laughs> Danielson looks into the end zone, just throws a hope up. <laughs> so it's a nine seven game and Tampa Bay could take the lead back with a field goal. <laughs> this might not be the most artistic excellence you're gonna see in a football seal. It is certainly interesting a lot of things going on out there. Through three quarters of play, Detroit has 175 yards total offense, Tampa Bay 79, but it's a 9 to 7 game, Detroit now. 31. Now the Baltimore Colts moving out over the Jets, 19 to 3 in the second period. Mr. Jones is having himself a day, John. He just threw a 34 yard touchdown pass to Glenn Dowdy. Got a 53 and a 34 yarder today in that game. Lots of other scores coming in from around the NFL. We'll get to those. We want to remind you that on Thursday, next Thursday, Thanksgiving Day, you'll see the Chicago Bears versus the Detroit Lions right here at the Pontiac Silver Dome. That's at 12 noon Eastern time. So Marvin Cobb will put it down at the 32. Bars 11 out of 17 in the year and has drilled two long-range field goals this afternoon. This one would give the Bengals a two-point lead. The lines are down. The Dolphins, the ball is snapped. The kick is away. It is up in the air. Good. This bar hits his third in a row. And there's time out on the field. The score now, the Bengals 16 and the Dolphins 14. That next extra point could be a very big factor in this game if Tampa Bay can get field goal range. Jeff Lott, hands up. Ricky Bell runs with the ball and turns the corner, did not get the first down. Bell is 6'2", 220 pounds, has very good speed as is illustrated there, but could not turn the corner in time to get up field for the first down. So, Tampa Bay has to punt it back for the Lions. Here's some scores coming in. Cincinnati's just scored in a third field goal by Chris Barr to lead Miami in the third quarter, 16 to 14. Greasy's thrown for both Dolphins scores. 
New England has just gone in front of Buffalo, 13 to 7. Bills took the lead on a touchdown pass from Joe Ferguson, but my New England has come back to take the lead. Baltimore is leading the Jets 19 to 3. Eddie Payton is back deep. Green hits a line drive deep downfield. Payton is hemmed in. Penalty marker is down. And Payton is out to the 42-yard line, but there is a penalty marker down and very probably a clipping penalty against the Lions on the return, which would set them back still further. Rizek was down to make the play on special teams for Tampa Bay. Payton, watching Eddie Payton. We'll hold off here. That's it, a clip against Detroit. As I was saying, there are two kinds of runners on returns, returning kickoffs and punts, and even out of the backfield. Eddie is the kind of guy that wants to stop and go, stop and go. Some coaches don't like that kind of runner, a stop and go runner. They want a, want a player to feel the ball, take off, get what we can get right now. I noticed the same thing with the Tampa Bay Buccaneer offensive backs. They are pick and choose type runners. Here's Cal Lepore. Personal foul. Let me do the first down. Okay, I go. Well, as Mike went out in time that the guilty party was hidden from the public view. Just his name was verbally. So we have on the clock 13.48 left to play in the Lions hold to a two-point lead, which they got on the opening play of the fourth quarter when they scored their touchdown. Danielson is still in the quarterback. He's played well for the Lions. Tampa Bay comes out hit. Dewey Selman shoots the gap and makes the hard hit. Running with the ball was Rick Kane for the Lions. Dewey Selwyn is some football player. He's a load as a linebacker, too. He's big enough, really, to lay down as a down lineman, Don, at 6'2", 250 pounds. He could go with a 4-3 type defense. But having a stand-up linebacker that big, he is awfully tough. He sure is. Dewey Selman and Leroy Selman, the Selman brothers from Oklahoma, from Ufala, Oklahoma. Marv Hubbard is now in his fullback. He is the up back in the eye. Danielson takes a look, gets the ball away, and he was hit hard by Dave Pear just as he released it. Walter Payton keeps piling up impressive numbers at Chicago, 38 carries, 268 yards, still in the fourth quarter. He is the offense of the Chicago Bears today. Bears leading that game 10 to 7 over Minnesota. He is a second-year player from Louisville. And so on the sideline, John McKay looks down. His quarterback, Gary Huff, who's down with an injury in street clothes, looking on. We'll be back in a moment. At 10 o'clock. Gerald Irons, a Cleveland linebacker, just returned an interception 55 yards for a touchdown. That gave the Browns the lead in the third quarter, 14 to 7 in New Jersey over the Giants. Up front linemen, Woodcock, Orvis, English, and Mitchell. Philadelphia, surprise leader over St. Louis. They're playing at Bush Stadium in St. Louis. The Eagles with a team much better than their current record, 3 and 6. We're told that Walter Payton has broken the one-game rushing record of O.J. Simpson, 273 yards, set here against the Lions. Walter Payton has rushed for 275 yards already today and 40 carries. He's not done yet. He is some runner. Not that big either. He's only about 190, 194. 190, but very strong, quick. Third down and eight. Tampa Bay needing to get the ball downfield. They'll probably throw it. All out blitz. Timing pattern is downfield, and the coverage is good by Hunter. The Lions came with a blitz, and Hunter stayed right with his man, Morris Owens, who's running the deep pattern, and so the Tampa Bay Buccaneers fail to get a first down. James Turner could become a defensive game breaker for the Detroit Lions, just as 
Lynn Barty was a few years ago, both returning punts and making interceptions on the corner out there. It was strictly man-to-man -man coverage, and as you could see, Hunter had him step by step. Dave Green is standing back inside his 30-yard line. Back deep for Detroit. This is Dave Green's eighth punt, incidentally. Eddie Payton. The brothers having the record day at Chicago. Well hit ball by Green. He's angling it. Oh, Payton at his 10. Get him to his own guys. Still alive. Peyton goes down at the 20. He looked like a goner back at the 10, but somehow Emerson got away. Yeah, he's a water bug. He keeps slipping and moving, trying to find a way, but uh, just couldn't get much. A 43-yard punt of the Lions, holding to a two-point lead over winless Tampa Bay, have the ball back. Now the field goal attempt. Steinford earlier booted a 31-yarder. This will be a 40-yard attempt. Ken McQuillick in the hole. 10 to 7. The Falcons with the lead and at 145 trying to add to that advantage. 40 yard kick. He got it started low, but he got it. That ball didn't get up very quickly, but he had so much on it, it got there. And Steinford now has done very well since being picked up a couple of weeks ago. He was two for three coming in here, and he's two of two today. As now the Falcons have a 13 to 7 lead with 1.42 to go in this first half of play. You know, they had horrendous field goal kicking. Prior to Steinford, they were 9 of 22 in the field goal department. Now, they're starting to put it together. Mike Livingston just threw for a touchdown for Kansas City, and they've tied Denver 7-7 in the second quarter. So that will bring in Yepremian for an apparent field goal attempt. Some words down there. Nat Moore talking to somebody. I did not see a flag down there. So there's that one. The line of scrimmage is the 19, so it will 18-yard line, so it'll be about a 35-yard field goal attempt by Yepremian. And Larry Seipel will be the man to hold. Successful field goal will give the Dolphins a one-point lead. Put the ball right down at the 25, so it'll be a 35-yard boot. Yepremian has missed once this afternoon. The lines are down. Ball is snapped, it's high, Yepremian's boot is away, and it is good. So Yepremian hits, and now the Dolphins go out in front. There's timeout on the field, score now, Dolphins 17, Bengals 16. Clock is stacked with 10-12 to play. Tampa Bay is going to need, I think, Emerson, one of those big pass plays they came so close on connecting earlier in the game when Morris Owens and Isaac Haggins got deep. They haven't done that well rushing the football, so I'd say uh, when they want to move the ball, they're going to have to throw it, and they haven't done too bad in throwing the football. Brown is 4 of 10 for 56 yards. He's been intercepted once. Very close to hitting those long ones. High punt by Wilbur Summers. Ball comes down with almost no motion on it. Danny Reese is hit and knocked down at the 47-yard line. Nine to seven is the score, as you see. The CBS Sports Spectacular coming up next Saturday. And then next Sunday, we have the NFL doubleheader. Atlanta plays Tampa Bay in Florida, Tampa Stadium. The Rams and the Browns go at Cleveland. The Giants versus Cincinnati at Cincinnati. Philadelphia's at New England next Sunday, and the Vikings and the Packers play at Green Bay. And of course, the doubleheader games here on CBS, you'll see. Washington and Dallas, two arch rivals, meet in the nation's capital. New Orleans will be playing at San Francisco in another doubleheader game. Look for the game or games in your area. As Danny Reese, the punt return specialist for the Buccaneers, is down right now. He looked like he was clothesline returning the punt. Archie Manning, the quarterback, going to try to get some points in the waiting seconds to Galbraith. Galbraith, nice open field tackle that time by Ray Brown. For a guy that wasn't supposed to play today, we've certainly mentioned his name a lot, and that's Ray Brown. <laughs> He's done an outstanding job in that defensive secondary. Archie with a hurry-up type offense now, working on his two-minute drill. He picked up on that play, seven yards. It's going to be second down, three yards to go. One thirteen. you see the screen and the time. Back to throw Manning again. Good protection. He's going to run. And Manning across the 50 to the 49. He ran into the official. He did get the first down. 
Greg Brazina making the stop. The fans booing because the official just couldn't get out of Manning's way. I tell you, Archie Manning showed me something. They're going to use a timeout, their first of the game. Let's take a look at Archie as he steps up inside the pocket. He likes to run now. Get out of the way, Mr. Fisher. You're going to get hurt again. Joe Connell that time in a way. Archie, a good runner. Archie would know uh, not only holds a passing record for everyone, Greg Bazina on the for the Saints, but Greg Bazina made the tackle, but he also the leading rusher for them over the years. Well, he had 116 yards rushing coming into this game. He picked up eight yards on that scramble to pick up the first down to the 49. Shall we dance, sir? Uh, so with 56 seconds, John, they've still got a chance to maybe get that field goal back. Well, they, Zaro hasn't been too good on field goals. Only hit three out of ten all season long. I'm sure they like to get that touchdown. They have 56 seconds, as we mentioned, and uh, a lot of things can happen in 56 seconds. You know, this guy, Archie Manning, I admire him, John. He's come back from two operations on his shoulder. Some people thought he might never play again. Great courage by this young man. And it's a big lift for the offense. It's Archie's been in there this uh, since taking over for Bobby Douglas in the first quarter. They really miss his guidance, and uh, he's a tremendous football player and a tremendous gentleman as well. So the Saints now have a first down at the Atlanta 49-yard line. 56 seconds, as you see it. A first down. Herman and Gilliam, the wide receiver. The give to Chuck Muncy. Muncy to the 45. Muncy trying to get out of bounds, and I believe he did, and stopped the clock at the 42-yard line. Ray Brown again making the stop. So Muncy stopped the clock with 50 seconds. I think the Falcons surprised see him running on that play. It was a good call by Archie and a fine run by Muncie. As you notice that uh, when Muncie coming out are all the time looking for that sideline, trying to get out, knowing he's going to have to stop the clock and maintain one timeout. Hopefully they'll get down there close enough for the field goal try. Six-yard pickup by Muncie. Chuck Muncie now, 11 carries, 30 yards. The ball at the 42-yard line. Manning. Gilliam picked off. Picked off by Bias. Rick Bias. Bias may go all the way. Rick Bias, touchdown. Rick Bias with his first interception of the year. A pass intended for John Gilliam. And with only 36 seconds left, the Falcon defense has done it again. Last week they made two big plays. As I mentioned, Gary, a lot can happen with 56 <laughs> seconds left. Although we didn't think it would be going that way. A five play by Bias. Let's take a look at it. As Archie sits in the pocket, there's the throw. Plenty of time to throw. And watch Bias come up, time this ball just perfectly. And then it's all over from there on out. An excellent run. Picks up a couple good blocks. And by the way, Chuck Muncie was hurt on that play. He's been carried off the field. 74 yeah. yards on that play, John. Archie making a desperation dive to try to catch Bias. Point after attempt by Steinford. Still 36 seconds left. And Fred Steinford makes it 20 to 7. That return by Bias of 74 yards. And what a complexion change. 20 to 7 Atlanta on their way to what they hope is their sixth win of the year. They have already surpassed last year's victory output with a win last week. Scores coming in. Atlanta's now going back in front of New Orleans, 13 to 7. Bartkowski threw a touchdown pass to Al Jenkins, and now Steinford has kicked the field goal. All of a sudden, we have an update. Atlanta's moved in front of New Orleans, 20 to 7. They're playing at the Superdome in New Orleans, as Greg Landry, helpless on the sidelines, can do nothing but impart information to the young quarterback in there in his stead. Gary Danielson, as Landry is out with a knee injury this week. Unfortunately, they're bringing a stretcher out to attend to Danny Reese. Fortunately, he's getting up. He's starting to get up, so that's great to see. But he took a hard wrap in the head, and they want him to relax a little bit. 10.03 left to play in the game. They're going to put Danny Reese in a stretcher. He wanted to get up, but they're going to not risk any further injury to him, and so they're going to help him off. I hate to see that stretcher come out, Em. 
That's the kind of thing that uh, even both sidelines will tend to shudder a little bit, even though the ball game is tight. Uh, well played ball game to this point. A lot of mistakes have not been made. They're beginning to hit. Coming down the stretch, anything can happen, but that kind of thing neither club wants to see. So Danny Reese has being helped from the field now for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers with 10 3 to play in the game. On a punt return we'll watch it back now you can see the hard hit he took. He tries to cover up too he knows that he's in trouble. Tries to evade here here it all comes. Saw the punishment coming tried to protect himself got hit right in the back behind the head. 20 to 7 they lead and it's been the story all year long as their defense last week Ortega picked up a fumble and raced in Pennywell intercepted a pass and went 20 yards for a touchdown. It's been their opportunistic defense that's really kept them in this title chase. Gary, yeah, that's the way it has to be. So every everybody pulling together for one main thing, and that's the win. When you can get those defensive scores like we've had last last week and again here this afternoon, it sure takes a lot of pressure off the offense. Here comes Clarence Chapman again, trying to get wide. No place to go. I tell you, he's been excellent on the kickoffs, and now we've got some problems again. I tell you, these two teams in the Western Division are going after each other. New Orleans, I'm sure, very frustrated by the complete reversal on that 74-yard interception. The ball now at the 28-yard line and still 29 seconds left. The Atlanta Falcons this year have to be along with Denver probably the most surprising team in the NFL very well improved and both of them improved defensively the Denver's doing an excellent job and of course Falcons here doing an outstanding job defensively all season long they're already assured of their finest season since 1973 Muncie's back in the game by the way he was carried off a while ago or helped off and he's come back in but I've seen that happen before he'll be shaken up and he'll come right back into the game Ray Brown knocks him out of bounds pick up of maybe a yard on the play with 24 seconds remaining. Chuck Muncy glad to see him back in there. So just short of the 30th the 29 yard line Archie Manning who's got to be a little shaken by that interception a moment ago. Manning with his fourth interception of the year. I should say his, yeah, his fourth interception Douglas earlier threw one. That bothers you for a while, Gary, but if you're going to be a quarterback and you're going to throw it, you're going to have those things happen to you. You can't be concerned that much about him. You've got to go step back in there and do it again. Here's a delay to Muncy. He's got some running room. Chuck Muncy all the way to the 41 yard line. And now the Saints are going to call timeout. They're going to stop the clock with 16 seconds. Rick Bias made the stop. John, he can gobble up yardage as quick as any runner in the game. You can't afford to let a man like that turn, turn him loose like that. Some good offensive blocking up front, a little draw play, and Muncy picked it up. The rest of it from there, he could have easily broken a tackle down and gone the distance. He's some kind of runner. 29 yards on that play by Chuck Muncy. Well, you can see why Hank Stram's offense is not far away from being something. Because when you have a guy like Muncy, player like Galbraith, and you get a healthy Archie Manning, that's the ingredients of some fireworks. So with 16 seconds now. Timeout is used. One remaining now. New Orleans has used two of their three. Muncie for the day, 13 carries, 61 yards. Galbraith, seven for 44. There's your timeouts remaining. This game in this last two minutes, we've gone from one end of the field to the other, haven't we? Very quickly. It could happen again. 16 seconds left the ball now, just outside the 41-yard line. The Atlanta defense, which has been excellent, has been tested. But thus far, they haven't been found wanting. They're doing a fine job. They have to remember now that they're going to have to use this timeout in order to get that field goal team in. So he wants to try to get out of bounds if possible here. With 16 seconds. Manny on a play action end around fake to Galbert. Galbert to the 40, 35, 30, to the 26-yard line there in field goal range. There in field goal range now with seven seconds as Pennywell and Lawrence made the stop. So they go with Thunder and Lightning. 29 yards by Muncie. They come right back with Tony Galbraith who went 16 yards. And all of a sudden it's first down just outside the 25. 
Let's take a look at it as we see uh, making an end around. A little bit of a uh, pass to here to uh, Lightning. Thunder spoke before. Here comes Thunder out there to block for him. You see Muncy come back up there and try to get a block for Galbraith. Outstanding running and picking and helping each other. Field goal team on. All right, seven seconds remaining. Zaro thus far, four of nine. Now he last week had a chance to win a game for him, but then it went into overtime when he missed. And this is going to be a 42 yard attempt. Takes it. Blanchard trying to run it out. Throwing down the field to Childs, broken up. How about that? And that is the end of the first half of play as had a fake field goal, and what happened was Blanchard <laughs> fell down. He's a former quarterback, so he can oh. throw the football. Well, what an interesting finish to our first half of play. That's the end of the first half. Look the score, the Atlanta Falcons 20, New Orleans State 7, an entertaining first half. Countdown to Super Bowl, a special preview of what might be expected for the playoffs. Brent Musburger. We'll take a look at the first 10 weeks of the NFL season, the races to date, the schedule of the final four weekends, which teams will contend for playoff spots and wild card entries, and you'll also take a look at some of the more controversial plays during this 1977 season. That's next Saturday on the CBS Sports Spectacular. Cleveland is now putting the Brown or the Giants to route as the Browns have scored on a Warfield reception. Dave Mays hit Paul Warfield. It's 21-7 Cleveland. So a big down now for young Randy Hedberg and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Third down and six coming up at the 28-yard line of Detroit. Lions lead 9-7, fourth quarter. Hedberg's going to run, but he's not going to get there. So Randy Hedberg took a page from the Gary Danielson playbook. You recall his 17-yard run down to the one-yard line that was... Shortly thereafter, it turned into Detroit's only touchdown of the game. But Hedberg didn't get there, and now it's fourth down, and now the field goal team is out. Alan Levitt is on the field. He is the field goal kicker for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Alan Levitt is a rookie from the University of Georgia. Dave Green will hold. The set down will be at the 35, a 45-yard attempt. Tampa Bay's first field goal try of the day. Field goal is short. With 6.51 to play, the Lions get the ball back. That was a close one. Even though it was the first time for Tampa Bay in attempting a field goal, they needed it right there to possibly tie the Detroit Lions, but they didn't. The Lions have held. So now the Lions get the ball back, leading by two points, 9-7. to seven. 6.51 to go in the game. So it's the second 200-yard game this year for Walter Payton, and the seventh time he has run for at least 100 yards. And that ties him with Rick Caceres for a single season record for the Bears. Less than four minutes to go now. It's second down eight, the Bears at their own 32-yard line. They give to Walter again. Strikes to the outside of the 40, to the 45. Vikings, a two-way tie. 
and they get six points, beat them by six points today. The next tiebreaker is the best average point differential within the division. And the Bears have a pretty good edge in that department right now because they beat Detroit worse than the Vikings did. They did the same with Green Bay. And, of course, the Vikings just barely got Tampa Bay. All right, it's second and goal. Peyton out for one play. It's back in. He has 268 yards. Five away from the all-time NFL single-game rushing record. He might get it on this carry. Turns the corner and gets down to the five and is rolled out of bounds. Let's see where they mark it. They're going to mark it just at the five-yard line. Alan Page wrestled him out. A gain of three for Walter Payton. That gives him 271 yards. Two away from O.J. Simpson. Single game rushing record. Incredible. Cincinnati has regained the lead against Miami. They lead 16-14, third quarter. New England leads Buffalo, 13-7, fourth quarter. Less than three minutes to go now at Soldier Field. The Bears knocking at the door at the five-yard line of Minnesota. Third and goal from the Viking five-yard line. Busco and Payton in the deuce. Waller on the left side. Scott foot wide to the near side. Schubert a wing to the right. The call now by Avellini. And a play action fake. Looks like a busted play again. And Avellini's going to be jumped at the six-yard line and thrown all the way back. That is the fourth busted play for the Bears today. Fred McNeil grabbed a hold of him. As he looked almost like a rerun of the play earlier. As Avellini turned the hand off and nobody was there. Fourth down, they'll go for a field goal. This field goal could be worth one game in the standings. I'm going back to the possibility. Now, wait a minute, they haven't sent in Thomas yet. But they may try to run this clock down and take a five-yard penalty. Robin Earl is back out there. And the Bears apparently are going to go for it. Very curious. They're at the six-yard line. The clock continues to wind down. Nine seconds to get the playoff. 2.25 to go in the game. Slot to the left. Fourth down, goal from the six-yard line. Deuce backfield. Avalini to Payton on a sweep to the right side. Needs a block. He cuts back into the five and struggles down to about the two-yard line. Well, there's the rushing record. Walter Payton becomes the all-time single-game rushing leader in the NFL, but he failed to come up with a touchdown. Seaman and Sutherland wrestled him down at the two-yard line, and the Vikes will have it. Well, 275 yards for Walter Payton. I can't say I don't understand what the Bears did. I'm just saying it's rather curious. They didn't go for the three points to take a six-point lead. Although they do have the Vikings down their own two-yard line and against the win. Bears, of course, thinking first things first. They've got to have a victory before they worry about beating a team by so many points. Joe McConnell and Brad Palmer back at Soldier Field were regardless of the outcome of this football game. The Bears have led it all the way. History has been made here today as Walter Payton has rushed for 275 yards, and that is a new single-game rushing record for the National Football League, and Payton has carried it 40 times to get those 275 yards. So by not going for the three points and the field goal, the Bears are in effect putting themselves in a bad position playoff-wise, because even if they win all the remaining games now, even if they beat Detroit Thanksgiving Day in Detroit, the Minnesota Vikings would have to lose two more football games for the Bears to have a shot at the playoffs because the Vikings right now have the edge in any tiebreaker. Well, they just announced Walter Payton breaking O.J. Simpson's single-game rushing record for the National Football League. And many of his Bears teammates come over to pound him and congratulate him on the Bear bench in front of us here. It's a mob scene. Tampa Bay has the ball. Cecil Johnson, a rookie from Pittsburgh, recover the fumble of Marv Hubbard. And so it is not over yet for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. 527 left to play in the game, and they have it back at their 40. I don't know whether uh, Hubbard got the ball or not on the exchange. As we look on right here, it looks as though he has it. Now he tries to move outside. He gets stuck. It was knocked out of his hand. Couldn't have had a pretty good grip on it. I can't see the... It was Selma that got a hand on it. New England knocked off Buffalo 20-7 this afternoon. Cleveland leading the Giants 21-7 in the fourth quarter. Denver and Kansas City tied 7-7 in the second. 
2.50 is the time remaining. The Bengals want to get it a little closer for a field goal attempt if that becomes necessary. McAnally far side, McDaniel near side. Anderson hands off to Griffin. McDaniel on an end around, back all alone, down into the end zone. Trumpy touchdown. Bob Trumpy touchdown. There was the triple pass. The Bengals pulled it out, and Trumpy broke down into the end zone all by himself. And the Bengals are down there all over him. Well, Jimmy Crum, we can remember when the Bengals used to use that triple pass all the time. And that time, it was a handoff to two different men. Finally wound up back in the hands of Ken Anderson, and Trumpy was all alone down in the end zone. And Anderson found it for the touchdown, and the Bengals go out in front 22 to 17. Boy, that's some of the old-fashioned razzle-dazzle that really brings the crowd to its feet and really puts the excitement back in the ball game. Trumpy was looking right, and he had to turn around and catch it looking left. There the ball is back. The kick is up in the air, and it's good. So now the Bengals scoring a touchdown, and they moved it some 69 yards to score, and they dusted off the old triple pass and found it just in the right place. Anderson got it back, and there was nobody near Trumpy. They saw him down there too late, and it looked as though Anderson might have a little trouble getting a handle on the ball. But he finally found it, and Trumpy grabbed it in the end zone, and the Bengals are out in front, 23 to 17. 20 to 7, our halftime score. The Atlanta Falcons hoping to pick up victory number six of the year and stay very much in that wild card chase. You look at New Orleans, they got burned late in the first half, the 74-yard interception by Bias. But Manning's got to come right back and continue to throw the football. Well, he will, Gary. They, neither one of the quarterbacks have been throwing the football that well. Uh, Archie uh, is about 5 for 11, and I believe Burkowski's 5 for 13. Not a whole lot of yardage. One's 35, one's 33. I still believe that they're going to have to come back, throw the football, put it up in the air a little bit more. I believe that the Saints are a little bit uh, outdistanced the uh, Falcons as far as uh, yardage rushing is concerned. But, uh, of course, that was, we got two big runs from one from Galbraith and uh, one from Muncie right prior to the halftime. Well, they have 150 yards as opposed to 111 in this first half for Atlanta, but the big interception is 74 yards by Bias. Now, let's look around the league. The Detroit Lions leading Tampa Bay. Nobody wants to lose that first one <laughs> to Tampa Bay. Chicago over Minnesota 10-7. to That is a final, and Peyton 275 yards, a new record for a single game. Cleveland leading the Giants in the fourth quarter 21-7. Cincinnati now putting it on Miami 23 to 17 and that's a big game in that AFC Miami a game out behind Baltimore and Cincinnati right in the middle of that Central Division chase and New England leading Buffalo 20 to 7 that is a final now Patriots winning hey how about this one big upset there Philadelphia 9 to St. Louis nothing in the third quarter that could be a big win for Philadelphia if they continue and Denver Kansas City at halftime Denver having a tough time with the Chiefs that historically has been a tough game for the Denver Broncos. 3.57 left to play. Detroit leading by but two points, but the Lions, as you see, have possession of the ball. There's that final in from Orchard Park, New York. The Patriots winning. They are 6-4 and four on the year. Again, Dallas and Pittsburgh. The devil header game today on CBS. Off, doesn't get much. Tampa Bay is quickly on Rick Kane, knocking him down just across the 25. But most importantly, at this point for the Lions, the clock is running. Tampa Bay is digging in. They know that they've got to uh, stop uh, the Detroit Lions, especially on the ground. They're beginning to move the ball, inching closer to a first down, third and some yardage here, but they've got to stand up right here, force them to punt the football, and hopefully get a drive going to score three points or possibly a touchdown themselves. Third down and four for Detroit. Danielson is sacked back at the 21. 248 left to go. And Detroit has to punt the ball back to Tampa Bay. Detroit has done what they've done all day. When the quarterback rolls away, they're leaving backside uncovered. So Tampa Bay is simply cowering with uh, Cecil Johnson, number 56. He's free to come on in and chase that quarterback. Tampa Bay calls a timeout, stopping the clock with 2.48 to play. So the Buccaneers only have one timeout remaining. 
Coming up next from Three River Stadium in Pittsburgh, the Steelers and the Dallas Cowboys, two of the powerhouse teams in the National Football League. That's the Dental Header game here on CBS. This is Don Crickey with Emerson Boozer at Pontiac Silverdome in Michigan. Tampa Bay, winless in the NFL throughout the brief history of this team, leading at the half today 7-0. Trailing now in the fourth quarter 9-7. Tampa Bay is going to get the ball back, and Isaac Haggins is back to return the punt. Danny Reese, the regular punt returner, was injured earlier. <laughs> Wilbur Summers dropping back there is Tommy Hutzbeth, the head coach of the Lions. A very tight game. His team would be but one game behind the Vikings in the Central Division if they win this one. High punt. It takes a dead hop and is down by the Lions at the Tampa Bay 47-yard line. Garth Tenepo came down to down the punt, a linebacker out of Texas A&M, number 57, coming off the field for the Lions. And that's how it stands with 2.39 left to play, and here is the guy whose right arm has to be the factor if Tampa Bay is to get back in it. Not bad field position, Don. So no, it isn't. At the 54 or 53, I'd like to start there. I'm sure every, every quarterback or offensive coordinator would love to see his unit start almost at midfield. Whistle blows before the snap was away. Costly mistake Please. here by the. And we have some cooperation. See no penalty marker down. Apparently the. There's a lot of debris. A lot of debris being thrown on the field by alleged fans. And that's why play had to be halted there. Small ball, rubber ball was thrown on the field. That could cause someone to break their necks. Dangerous. Let's see what the play is now, Emerson, as we have Tampa Bay coming up first and 10. The ball at their 46-yard line is where it's spotted. 2.39 left to play in the game. Detroit 9, Tampa Bay 7. Officials aren't done yet. Now we're ready to go as Tampa Bay huddles yet again. Think they might try to burn them deep. It's tough to throw early, though, and then be on long yardage where the Lions know it's coming. Looking at their formation before someone threw a ball onto the field, they were set into a passing uh, type offense, even though you can run out with one setback. Man in motion, it was a passing uh, formation. What will happen? We'll have to wait and see. I'd say throw it. Philadelphia very much in command of the St. Louis Cardinals in the third quarter 16 to nothing Jaworski has just passed for a second touchdown this one to Charles Smith he also hit Harold Carmichael so the Cardinals had won five in a row are way behind on their home field Hedberg takes a look a tough down intentional grounding that's loss of down and 15 yards that's about as tough a penalty as there is in the game other than ejection you really can't fault the offensive line of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers because they've done a pretty good job thus far he sets back in the pocket give uh, Detroit a lot of credit because they were covering well downfield and then Hedberg makes the mistake of just trying to unload the football so the clock is stopped with 232 left to play in the game intentional grounding is automatic loss of down in addition to a 15-yard penalty. And that is what has been stepped off. So now it's second and 25. That's a whole lot of difference there. Ed. Very costly. You, you, you lose yardage, plus you lose the down. Let's it rip. Manson with a tight end has it. 
Dana Nafsinger was down at the 44 yard line. He got back the penalty yardage, got back 14 of it anyway. That'll bring up third down 11 now for Tampa Bay. Charlie Weaver and Ed O'Neill, two linebackers dropping back in pass coverage, were on the hit. And the clock shows 2.17 left to play in the game. We'll look at that again. By Nobzinger, it's a pattern going down, turning inside the linebackers because they're setting kind of deep back. You go down and get as much yard as you can, but the most important thing here, as Detroit tries to wrestle them down, they go for the football. There'll be more of that, whether it's a pass or a running play in the closing two minutes. Third down and actually about 12 to go for the first down. Hedberg gets it away. Intercepted. The ball is picked off by the Detroit Lions and is going to go for a touchdown. Coming down is Reggie Pickney, the rookie from East Carolina. And that'll put the game away for the Lions as Reggie Pickney, a rookie from East Carolina in the defensive backfield, picks it off and returns it for a touchdown. That kind of burst the bubble for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. They had high hopes of moving the ball downfield. Hedberg had time, couldn't find a receiver, now throws across the field. The kind of thing you really shouldn't do if it's not by design. Pinkney steps in front, and it's all green in front until he reaches the blue. Six points for the Lions. So now Steve Mickemeyer in this dramatic turn of events. We'll try the point after. That was a 48-yard interception, the subsequent return for a touchdown. And the rookie has a great moment here in Detroit. Nicomayo hits the extra point, and it's a 15-7 game with 1.55 to play. That's Pinkney's second interception of the season, Don. I'm sure he has to be a happy man. We're going to have a pause in the action. When we come back, it'll be Nicomayo kicking off to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, and they'll be firing for all they're worth. I'd like to thank some very fine producers and directors. Our producer, William Barnes. Our director today has been Marvin F. Muse. Associate producer, Jay Frommert, Ray Savignano, Bob Brown, John Pumo, all our great CBS technicians in to cover this game for you with 1.46 left to play. And they'll all be back here next Thanksgiving, next Thursday, as the Bears go against the Lions here at the Pontiac Silverdome. 12 noon Eastern time for that Thanksgiving Day game. Another interception. Laslovic has the ball. So the Lions have the ball back at the 33-yard line, and no doubt now, and they'll run the clock out by running the ball. As you see, 133 left to play. But I think that did it. They might have had a shot, had to move the ball down and gotten seven points, but right here, he throws down, uh, not really watching what's in front of him downfield, and Laslovich steps in front of his receiver, and it's all over. That officially puts the lid on it with 133 left to play. And of course, we remind you that coming up next, the Cowboys and the Steelers are just right now getting set to tee it up at Pittsburgh. Some people after each other in that one. Now, presuming Detroit goes on and wins this game, which there are seconds from doing now, 68 seconds away from it, we'd have a two way tie for second between the Bears, who beat Minnesota today, and the Lions, five and five. Minnesota without Fran Tarkin could have a problem over the last four games of the season. They meet Green Bay next week and they uh, it could be tough there. I wouldn't be surprised if uh, Minnesota loses the next two. Wouldn't that be something? Oh. Win that division almost by default. We're at Three Rivers Stadium in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. The Three Rivers, the Allegheny, and the Monongahela. <laughs> they come together to form the Ohio. As you look now at downtown Pittsburgh, the Golden Triangle, and it's the site today of the Dallas Cowboys against the Pittsburgh Steelers. And a game that means so very much to both these football teams. I'm Pat Summerall with Tom Brookshire. What else do you have to say? This is a rematch of Super Bowl number 10. And if either guy or anybody on the team didn't get taped up, it's their own fault. Uh, both teams are very physical, Patrick, but... Uh, the Steelers have had 21 fumbles and 17 interceptions, and that's a, a minus 13 takeaway type factor. And Dallas eats you up. You play that kind of football on a day like today. This is the first time they've met 
since that Super Bowl of two years ago. They played in preseason, and Dallas shut out the Steelers 30 to nothing. And it might have been preseason, but don't think that's not a memory. And one of Bradshaw's greatest games was in the Super Bowl, and Lynn Swan was the MVP, and Lynn Swan is the Lynn Swan of two years ago. He's dynamite. So health is not really a factor. Both teams are in pretty good shape. There are some injuries we'll tell you about in just a minute. But our friend Herrera has got the ball teed up at the 35. Obviously, Pittsburgh has won the toss. And Jim Smith is number 86. The rookie from Michigan and back with him is number 85, Ernie Pugh. Alvin Maxson also back there for the Steelers, and that's Safrin Herrera. I tell you, he's a factor. He's hit 17 of 23 field goals, his last six in a row. And Pittsburgh, uh, around here, they don't even let Dorella kick field goals. He hadn't kicked one in four games or tried one. Hasn't even tried one in four games, which is a... I don't know who keeps those records, but that's got to be one of the most amazing stats of all time. And here's Herrera. In the direction of Jim Smith from Michigan. At the 10, he takes it. And Smith has got some room on the outside and gets to the outside to about the 34 before he is stopped by one of those guys who always seems to be there. Number 31 for Dallas is Benny Barnes. The Steelers on offense and the Cowboys break on defense. That's the Pittsburgh backfield. Bradshaw's playing his sixth game with a fractured left wrist, and he's got a pretty good cast on it. But he's throwing the ball well, and all the interceptions to these receivers are not Bradshaw's fault, obviously. The Pittsburgh offensive line, Cole Davis, Webster, Quack, and Larry Brown, who used to be a tight end. On first down now, Steelers have the ball at their own 33, and Bradshaw gets to Harris, and Franco slants outside the 35, stopped by Jethro Pugh, but Franco Harris picked up about four. Picked up where he left off. I can't remember when he hasn't had a thousand yards rushing this year if Franco stays at what a 63 yard average he'll break a thousand yards for the sixth straight year which is an incredible mark isn't not it? too many folks have done that he is fourth in the AFC in rushing at this point he got four and his second and six and they're looking at a Dallas 4-3 we'll set the deep ones for you in just a second this is Rocky Blyer D.D. Lewis and Bob Brunig two of the Cowboy linebackers converge on him this is the building that Art Rooney built here in Pittsburgh. And that defense, by the way, is Ed Jones, Jethro Pugh, Randy White, and Harvey Martin. Martin with 16 sacks, by the way. He's the right defensive end against Cobb, the big left tackle. That should be quite a battle on the line. Always has been. Rocky Blyer lost a yard. Third and seven make it. And Bradshaw's first pass, perhaps, coming up right here. And the Cowboys remember number 88, Lynn Swan. This is not a pass. This, of course, is Franco Harris. And it's not a first down. Charlie Waters made the tackle. Darn Franco hits the hole fast. I don't know why we're so impressed with that fact. But at 225 pounds and 6'3", he really hits the hole quicker than most big men. Maybe Jimmy Brown's the only other one I can think of that size that hits it any faster. And for the Bengals lead at 23-17, a minute 49 to go as they pull that triple pass out of the hat. And Anderson hit Trumpy in the end zone for the touchdown. Counting playoff games and regular season games, the Bengals have not defeated the Dolphins since 1969. In 68 and 69, under the old alignment, the Bengals used to play the Miami Dolphins twice. Now the Bengals will have to flop it just one more time, and that'll be it. We're down to 25 seconds. There's the snap. Anderson goes to the ground, and that will be all. 20 seconds left, and the Bengals can just let the clock run out. They're coming off the field, and the Bengals have stayed alive in this race for the 23-17 verdict over the Miami Dolphins. They're both teams going out on the field. Five seconds left. The clock's just running off. Bill Johnson heading down toward the Bengals' dressing room, waving his hand in the air and a jubilant salute to victory as the Bengals have knocked off the Dolphins 23-17. The Dolphins have lost three now, and one of those losses to San Diego came on the very last play of the game, so the Baltimore Colts could have a two-game lead if they knock off the Jets. The St. Louis Cardinals with a 6-3 and three record now trying to come back in that game with the Eagles. They trail 16-7. to seven. Jim Otis, a 25-yard run for a touchdown. Just moments ago, Tom Blanchard kicked the ball 51 yards, and the hang time was 4.9. That is something. First down now. Barkowski back to throw from the 5. He's in trouble. Bob Pollard, number 82. That's his fifth sack of the year. And Bob Pollard has had some personal problems this year. Now playing like the Bob Pollard we saw last year. 
Let's take a look at, as you see, a little fake uh, play action there of the fullback. Bukowski with plenty of time. Outstanding uh, performance by the defensive secondary back there, covering the men, allowing Bob Pollard, number 82, to get in on the sack. Bob Pollard, very quick. There's the final now. Miami has lost their third game of the year, 23 to 17. They will play St. Louis on Thanksgiving Day. Here's the offensive backfield. Roger Staubach having one of his greatest years, really, and he keeps adding those on. Dorsett in his first start. There are the receivers. Don't forget Billy Joe Dupree, the tight end. He's caught three TDs the last three games. And that's the offensive line. Neely, Lawless, Fitzgerald, Rafferty, and Donovan. Roger Staubach, the quarterback on first down to Tony Dorsett. Of course, as you would expect, a great local favorite here in Pittsburgh, Jack Ham, number 59, the linebacker who made the tackle. That, Roger Staubach. Defensively, uh, facing Roger in this offense, Steve Furness is now at left defensive end because Greenwood still has the knee problem. Joe Green, as always in the middle, Ernie Holmes and Dwight White. And remember, Dwight White had a pretty good sacking day when they played in Super Bowl X a couple of years ago. I do remember. You saw that game here on CBS. Mark is not operating correctly. And until it's corrected, the line judge on the field will keep the time. Perhaps you heard that from Bob Frederick, who's the referee. The Pittsburgh defensive line, Tom Brookshire was just talking about. Furness, Green, Holmes, and White. And the, the linebackers. linebackers. And Dirk Winston, the young rookie from Arkansas at the middle spot. And in place of Lambert, he's going to be tested a lot. The secondary, Thomas, Blunt, Allen, and Edwards, put together because of the injury to Donnie Shell. Dorsett and Newhouse, the running backs, on second and eight. Starback to Newhouse. Newhouse trying to cut back. A great play by number 59, Jack Hand. Got a pretty good block on Furness at the defensive end, but the linebackers really covered for it. And Jack Hamm is that too small size linebacker. I guess if he came out right now, you might not draft him. But he comes from Penn State, which must mean something. Watch the good block on Furness. He goes down. Watch Hamm play off the block. Just gets enough to make the tackle, doesn't he? Preston Pearson and Dorsett are the running backs for Dallas now. Or the receivers for Dallas, if you'll make it, as the Cowboys go shotgun for the first time. Outside Preston Pearson. And plenty enough for a Dallas first down chased out of bounds by Lauren Taves, number 51. He does make it look easy. Now, don't ask me where Preston comes from. He's like the masked man that just comes riding through town. Watch him. He never looks like he's in a hurry. It's a straight drag-out pattern, which is an easy one for Roger to read. They handled, by the way, a Joe Green stunt coming up the middle in extremely good shape. Roger had a lot of time. And, of course, Preston Pearson at one time played with the Steelers. He was picked up as one of the great acquisitions of all time, I suppose, in pro football by the Dallas Cowboys. They got him for $100. He paid him back. Here is Newhouse breaking a couple of tackles and making a what looked like nothing into about a five-yard gain before he was stopped by Taves and Blunt. Newhouse is so darn short. I don't believe Dwight White realized he had the ball carrier trapped. I think he came out of an armpit to make that. He's averaging four yards a shot. Your first thought is to back up. And here is Cleveland. Cleveland 21, New York 7. Final. Well, the Browns are now 6-4. and four. They've had a tough schedule this year, but they're right in the thick of it. Boy, that central division of the AFC is something. Morris Gregg has done a fantastic job with the Cleveland Browns. Second down, 15 yards to go. Manning again, look out. Down he goes, Clyde Humphrey is there. Well, Clyde Humphrey wasted no time that time storming through. That's one time Clyde did not play the run. Lost clear outside now, the 45 to the 46 yard line. Here comes a move by Clyde Humphrey taking an inside rush. No one picked him up. He was able to beat his man, Don Morrison. And Humphrey now with five, uh, six sacks. Loss of nine yards on the play, outside to the 46, and now it's third and 24. Now look at this, the Falcons need three sacks. Equal that club record of 35. Oh, the defense this year is gonna break a bundle of Falcon records. At the rate they're going. They had given up only 62 points prior today, and so far, seven. Manning back to throw again, steps up against the rush. He is hit hard from behind. Boy, he was really nailed by Pennywell, and he's down. Getting up very slowly. 
that was some shot. Let's, let's watch Manning right there as he takes a pretty good shot from Pennywell. And he did take a good shot, especially coming from the blind side as it was. He was sitting there waiting to, to throw the football. Pennywell just kind of annihilated him out there. Boy, John, that's got to rattle your teeth a little bit. Oh, does it hurt. Blanchard to kick now. He's averaging almost 50 yards here today, 49-7. He hits a high one. Rollin Lawrence is deep for the Falcons at the 10. He bottled it. It's loose. The Falcons got it, though. Carl Farmer comes up with it. And at the five-yard line, and the Falcons has really almost had a disastrous situation. Carl Farmer, I believe, is the guy that saved it. He is number 80. And at the five-yard line, Atlanta has the ball at 20 to 7 lead. I'm not so sure it shouldn't be that way anyway. I don't like to identify the guys when they make a, a legitimate mistake trying to get a jump on the ball. I think we might do these players an injustice by knocking out their I know who number. the right tackle is. Detroit defeated <laughs> Tampa Bay 16 to 7. The Buccaneers now 24 losses in a row. And welcome to our broadcast here at Three Rivers Stadium in Pittsburgh where the score is nothing nothing. Pat Summerall with Tom Brooks, our short set. Squirts through for a first down for the Dallas Cowboys. And that's where he is so valuable. Jim yeah. Allen made the tackle. I'll tell you, for a guy you think runs outside, he doesn't run that well outside. He runs inside. And he's tough and he's strong on the legs. He does all his moving inside the shoes. Very little extra work is needed. You know, that's a great misconception, I think, that many fans have. That a guy, just because he's fast and just because he's quick, doesn't mean that he necessarily runs outside well. Philadelphia 16, St. Louis 14. That's his third quarter score. We'll keep you posted. First down, Dallas, the ball at the Pittsburgh 41. Starbuck drops, can't throw. Ernie Holmes and the rest of the Steel Curtain converge on Roger Starbuck. All right, that's the 21st sack. Now watch Joe Green, number 75. He actually goes beyond the line of getting Roger Starbuck. Now watch him, Rafferty. The young guard is holding and everything. Joe Green is the one that forces Roger back up inside, and there's the locomotive. Another view of that. Watch this now. Watch number 75 take the young guard, who weighs about 252, and just shove him right on back through the pile. Hell of a player, I'll tell you that. On second down now, and 17 yards to go. Starbuck gets to Dorset. And Tony picks up about 10. Tony Dungy made the tackle on Dorset. He got back past the original line of scrimmage. It'll be third and nine. Remember, they're doing this without Jack Lambert, and he's the holler guy that makes sure everybody's up on every play, and right now Joe Green's having to assume that. The guy in the middle who's taken Lambert's place is number 53, the rookie from Arkansas, Dirt Winston. <laughs> and he likes the nickname Dirt Winston, too. <laughs> Here he comes over to the sideline as you look at the rivers outside this stadium. A super location in the first quarter. You're looking at the NFL on CBS. Nothing, nothing between the Cowboys and the Pittsburgh Steelers. A rematch of the Super Bowl of two years ago in Miami when the Steelers won. Well, a moment ago, the Atlanta Falcons almost got themselves in real trouble. They're still in some difficulty at the five-yard line, and Detroit now has taken lead over Tampa Bay, 16 to 7. 39-yard kick by Blanchard. Lawrence fumbled the ball, but very alertly, Carl Farmer came up with it at about the two-yard line, got it out to the five. The Falcons have had bad field position here in the second half, started their own five. They lead 20 to 7. Arkowski to Woody Thompson, and Thompson brings it out to the 10-yard line. Woody Thompson, a fine football player. Hey, look at this now. 16-14, a 69-yard touchdown pass from Jim Hart to Mel Gray, and the Cardinals aren't dead yet in that one after trailing 16 to nothing. St. Louis came out of that dream. They still play in Dallas, I guess, in that first period, Gary. Well, they have the longest winning streak in the NFL. They've won five in a row, but they're really having some problems today. Four-yard pickup on that last play. It's going to ring up second and six. Haskell stand back, trying to go wide, and he makes it out to the 14-yard line. Jim Merlo making the tackle. 
And we come to a third down. Jim Merlo out of Stanford. Also Ernie Jackson coming up. Jackson's not very big on that run situation. 176 pounds. All right. Mr. Unitas. Hmm. How do you like my printing? You think they did that? I wrote that fine. Did you really? I wondered about you. I didn't know quarterbacks could write. Third down now. Two yards to go. Again now to Thompson trying to get the first down, and he's got it. Woody Thompson, who's been a bread and butter football player this afternoon. Mike Fultz, Ernie Jackson stop him. And now the Falcons getting a little breathing room after starting from their own five-yard line. And Woody Thompson's having a day for himself. He's got to be very happy. 77 yards on 18 carries. Seven yards uh, over what he has uh, picked up for the last two ball games, Gary. They're going back into their ball control game right now. Doing very well now. People have been able to run against New Orleans this year, and right now Atlanta's trying to do that. Six minutes to go in the third quarter, and they hammer it out again across the 20 to the 21-yard line. New man in the lineup. That's Esposito, who just checked in. Number 26, carrying the first time. He's the second-year man out of Boston College. There he goes. Not very big, about 183 pounds. Mike Fultz making the stop. Second down and five. Atlanta sending in an awful lot of substitutes back and forth. I don't know if they're calling the plays from the sideline or whether Bukowski's calling them from his own, uh, in his own huddle. Falcons now have 107 yards rushing for the game. Bukowski giving up, and here comes Haskell Standback. Standback, very close to that first down. Let's see where the mark is forward progress. Tripped up that time by Jim Merlo. Have a man down getting up slowly now, Dave Scott. For the Falcons, he's okay. Boy, he's a big guy, 6'4", 285 pounds. Didn't play a lot last year, but a third round draft pick in 76. They're gonna measure. And boy, they got it by the nose of the football. First down, Atlanta. So Atlanta now trying to eat up some time and get out of the bad field position that they've inherited here in the second half. Oh, San Francisco three, Los Angeles nothing in the first period. Again, the perspective on that game, should San Francisco win, Atlanta win here, there's a tie for first in the Western Division. First down. Markowski to stand back, stand back to the 31. Haskell stand back, protecting that football, picking up four yards on the play. Well, they have everything going their way now, Gary. The time uh, is 4.46 in this period. They're con controlling the football. Run and get the, is what they want to do with it, try to eat that clock up, and they're moving out. The offensive line doing a fine job blowing the Saints right off the ball. Van Note is going off of the field. Hank Stram very pensively looking at that scoreboard. Jeff Van Note is out. Paul Ricey, number 53, has replaced him at center. Markowski to Woody Thompson on a second and six. And Thompson, is the ball loose? It is. New Orleans has recovered. Pan Hughes, I believe, was the guy that got it away from Woody Thompson. And Grooms fell on it. And that is a major break in this football game at the 32-yard line. Now the Saints have it. Let's take a look at uh, Thompson as he's going in through the line. There's the good hit. There you see the ball coming out and watch Grooms as he falls on the football. Good play by the Saints. A good break for the Saints on the third and the uh, 38, 32 yard line. Let's see whether or not Archie goes for the big bomb in this situation, the first chance. Had Hughes getting a breather, former New York Giant, first down. John Gilliam, now Mike Strong is in the backfield, number 33. Herman comes in motion to the near side. A give to Tony Galbraith, and Galbraith moves that offensive line forward as he is close to the 27-yard line, running behind Terry Steve, number 68, second-year man from Wisconsin. So Mike Strawn is in the game for a free encounter, and he is a fine running back. Five-yard pickup on the play. It'll be second and five. So the Saints have been knocking on the door, John. They've been in the Atlanta end of the field, but they still haven't been able to get any points on the board. That's one of those defenses that been, 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 but they haven't been able to be bro uh, broken as yet. Second and five, 341 to go, third quarter. Herman in motion again. Manny gives off to Mike Strong. 
And Strong's got a first down inside the 20 yard line. Strawn, Humphrey, and Wildwood Lawrence combined on the stop, and Strawn, a third year man from Iowa State who had 52 yards rushing last week. I tell you, he'd be playing starting for some football teams. Let's, let's take a look, a, block at the, a look at some blocking by Childs as everything started to the left side. Strawn coming back over. Outstanding block on Humphreys. The child just kind of cased him at the line of scrimmage. Humphrey did not go anywhere. First down now. A give up the middle to Galbraith. And nothing doing because Pennywell is there. Robert Pennywell, what an addition he's been to this football team. So they're going to gain a yard on that one. It'll be second down and nine. The ball resting at the 18-yard line of Atlanta. 20 to 7. The Falcons with the lead, but they've been backed up in their own end of the field the entire third quarter. But thus far, the Saints have not been able to score on them here in this third quarter. There's Sanders, the Z man, as they call him, number 79, Archie Manning, with John Hill, the center. Manning back, throwing Herman. John Herman made quite a catch on that ball. It was underthrown. Robin Lawrence defending on the play. But it's still going to go to a third down and still four yards to go. I'll tell you, yeah, that was a quick out, and, and uh, Archie just got the ball off, and he was really lowered. He got a pretty good shot on there. Do you would think on a quick pattern like that that wouldn't happen? <laughs> Somebody evidently missed an aggressive block, and the man come flying clean through there. You can't throw the ball any quicker than that, right? <laughs> no. Third down now. Long four to go. Manning, play action fake, rolling, throwing, Childs, touchdown! Henry Childs wide open. And the New Orleans Saints are right back in this football game. 20 to 13. That's Childs' sixth touchdown catch of the year. This young man really having an outstanding year tied in for the New Orleans Saints. Let's take a look at the fake there by Archie as he rolls back to his right side. Looking and looking, plenty of time. Finally spots Childs. Finally set the fine call. Childs is just one touchdown receptive shy of a club record. Set by Danny Abramowitz. Point after a tamper. Oh, look out. John Hill, the center. Now, that's what a center hates, isn't it? You got your head down between your legs and somebody runs over you. The man says, what does it say after something like that? He says, I'm sorry. <laughs> Rod Humphrey was the guy that just annihilated him up there. Look at Hill. He's getting up and oh, saying, I Lord. still got to snap the ball. This is a clock. Take it easy, baby. Well, that's got to intimidate you a little bit, huh? I'll tell you one thing it'll do is get your attention. <laughs> 20 to 13 the score. The New Orleans Saints, a 32-yard drive in five plays after that fumble by Woody Thompson. And Archie Manning gets him on the board. Okay, it's Eight of the nine games this year, nobody scored more than a touchdown on Atlanta, so the Saints offense is coming back today. Hill to snap it. The kick by Zaro is on the way, and he got it. And it's a 20 to 14 game, a brand new football game here at the Superdome. We have one minute, 34 seconds left to go in this third quarter of play. Archie Manning just tossed a 13-yard touchdown pass. John, take a look at it. And there's a look at what Archie Manning does best throwing on the run. A fine throw and a fine catch by Childs. Downtown Pittsburgh has undergone a great renovation in recent years, and Chuck Knoll in recent years has done a great renovation job on the Pittsburgh Steelers. They're two of the newest buildings and <laughs> most established ones in the new Pittsburgh, right? Joe Green, number 75, of course. But number was, 78 is Dwight White. And Patrick, it was always a city where if you didn't want to come in and buckle on a helmet, don't come to play football. It's always been a work ethic football team, tough. I remember when we used to come here and play and played at old Forbes Field, and you wore your helmet at all times. <laughs> but a great place to play. And of course, Art Rooney and Dan Rooney and the Rooney family have done a remarkable job in this city as well as with this football team. They are as much of an institution as the NFL itself. Third and we'll make.
make it eight for the Dallas Cowboys first quarter. And for you stat freaks, Tony Dorsett in three carries has 20 yards. It looks like he might be on the motorbike today. Tony Dorsett and Preston Pearson both in the backfield now as Roger Starbuck goes back in that familiar shotgun formation for Dallas. Dorsett stays in the block. Starbuck throws to the outside and finishes a golden victory. Broken up by Jimmy Allen. Number 45, normally a cornerback, now playing safety. Watch him work. Boy, he has good speed. He has 4-4 speed for the 40, and watch the recovery he makes. Roger does not throw this ball extremely well. He sort of had to throw it over for Ness's rush, and the ball was a little bit end over end. You could almost read Roselle's name on the side of it. Seven minutes exactly left to play in quarter number one at Three Rivers Stadium. Pat Summerall with Tom Brookshire. Nothing, nothing score as Rocky Blyer tries for the first down and is close. Harvey Martin stacked it up. We might have to measure this one. Didn't get much. Franco has 20 yards now. Franco is now the 13th leading career rusher of all time in this league. He just passed one of the toughest there ever was, Bill Brown of the Minnesota Vikings. Here's that play again. Short yardage, and again, nothing fancy about Pittsburgh football or Dallas defense. Watch Rocky stick it in there. He's trying for it on second effort and might have had the whistle called in between. He cannot hear on those two plays. First down, Steelers, nevertheless. Terry Bradshaw, the quarterback. Dallas flexes that defense. Franco Harris flexes straight ahead. And boy, he got nothing. Jethro Pugh made some strong play. Led by the whole rest of that left side, including Too Tall Jones. The Baltimore Colts, the Jets, 26 to 6 in the third quarter at Shea Stadium. Bradshaw wanting to be very careful. Again, uh, Harris and Waters are both on the line of scrimmage a lot, but when you want to throw it, somehow they're back in those deep post zones where Lynn Swan and Stall would like to run. He's got to be careful. Bradshaw drops, here they come. Screen pass knocked away by Harvey Martin. I said they were at Shea Stadium. They are in Baltimore, I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't know if Harvey realized he could have caught that or not. He swatted it like a, a big bear trying to get a trout out of that stream. Watch this. It's a quick stream, <laughs> screen left. And Harvey Martin, they got a safety blitz. As Randy Hughes, it almost got to him. Look at Harvey, just swat it. And so it'll be a third down situation, nine to go. 5.39 left to play in the first quarter. No scores yet. The Steelers and the Cowboys. And Dallas drops back. No blitz this time. Bradshaw goes deep for Swan. Benny Barnes back there with him. Good coverage. Oh, that looked like the Super Bowl again. Well, I'll tell you, Barnes made an incredibly good play. The ball was thrown about as well as you can throw it. The only trouble was that the defender's arm got in between. Look at this pass blocking. I mean to tell you, a blue and white shirt doesn't get close. And nobody can flat throw it any better than the man you're seeing right now, number 12. Look at this. It's right on. And then it's off. Dynamite play. Yeah. Tom Blanchard to kick on fourth down. He hits a beauty. Back is Rollin Lawrence inside his own 45-yard line. And over there in a hurry to make the stop is Marty. The ball is fumbled. Who's got it? I believe the ball may have been blown dead. Let's see. The discussion going on, some pushing and shoving. It's going to be Atlanta's football. Marty made quite a tackle and fell on the ball, but it was blown dead. A 50-yard kick that time by Tom Blanchard to the 50-yard line is where Atlanta will have it. You know, we were talking about Ray Brown a moment ago. A dozen tackles. He only has nine. <laughs> um, so there's a delay in the action with 12.49 to go in this fourth quarter. Atlanta holding on to a 20-14 to 14 lead. It started to rain a little bit earlier in Pittsburgh, but that has gone away now. And the weather is cool but good. 
I wonder if the pressure Dallas tried to put on Walden uh, won't pay off before the game is over. It was not a good punt, and even though they don't get there, it's like the almost sack that a defensive team can get. It, it might be a plus factor later on. Well, it's one thing to stand back there and kick it with nobody coming. It's something else when there are a lot of rushers and they start to make you hurry. Walden has punted twice. Neither one has been a very good effort. Thirty three yarder and a thirty one yarder and the field position for Landry's Cowboys has been not the greatest but uh, not shabby either. Talk about favorites that guy walking in front of Landry just a minute ago is a great favorite and should be here in Pittsburgh. That was Ernie Stotner. It's a new disguise on Tom Landry. That's the first time I've seen him in that. In the wet golf gear. <laughs> That's true. Where's his Tyrolean hat? <laughs> you had it. <laughs> it's a first down, Dallas, at their own 31. And on first down, Roger Staubach goes back to throw and throws to Dorsett. About four, J.T. Thomas, the tackler. There is Tony Dorsett. Comes from nearby Aliquippa, Pennsylvania. Hope well high over there. The main thing is that he didn't catch the ball much playing for majors in Pittsburgh. U, but he's just caught his 17th pass. Wait till he learns the pass routes. He's going to be a little bit nasty to cover. Atlanta 20 to 14 over New Orleans. And you talk about the good jobs that are being done around the league. Lehman Bennett has done one of them at Atlanta. And Shula at Miami's done another. Roger Starback is another guy who's done one of those good jobs. We'll make it second and six for Dallas. And again, Roger's going to throw. Outside screen to Newhouse, and Newhouse ducks under one. Lauren Taves was the first guy to get him, and then Dwight White came over to make sure. And you know, Taves' biggest problem has been replacing Andy Russell, and you can't replace a great all-pro like Andy, and Taves has just played super. Makes one of those plays that time that I imagine everybody thought, by golly, Andy Russell's gone, but we got a good player in there. And Lauren Taves is number 51. Look at that group. Ernie Holmes. Light White, Joe Green, Steve Furness, Dorsett and Pearson both in the same backfield. It's third and 12 now. Drawback, lined up shotgun. Has to go down. Joe Green, Dwight White, Steve Furness, Ernie Holmes. I believe it was Furness coming to the inside on the stunt that breaks through. Watch the right part of your screen and see what number flashes. There's Fitzgerald getting back. Rafferty's having some trouble with Green, and here comes 64 down the slot. And by the way, it was a very shallow shotgun. I don't believe Roger was more than four and a half or five yards behind the center, Fitzgerald. So Danny White goes back in punt formation. That is Jim Smith. And he hasn't fair caught a punt all year here in Pittsburgh. The speedy rookie who watched his alumni defeat Ohio State yesterday. A snap on a bounce, but White feels it nevertheless. And Smith, at his own 39, speeds to the sideline. Out of bounds he goes in front of the Dallas bench. Guy Brown is the guy who knocked him out of bounds. So Pittsburgh on offense. Dallas goes to defense. Got a slight discussion. Indication is holding against the Steelers. It's been another bugaboo that Knowles had to put up with. They have committed the penalties at precisely the wrong time and against the wrong people, like Houston, Denver, and Baltimore. Their record is five and four. Dallas is eight and one. Let's see who did it. Holding on the punt return, number 45. That's Jim Allen. As you look down at the Steeler bench and look at the guy who has turned the whole thing around here, Chuck Noll. Chuck Noll's first year here was 
dismal to say the best. One in 13, if I recall, wasn't it? And then he turned it around, and they've happened to make a couple of Super Bowl trips and not done badly, I'll tell you. They have defeated Dallas, and they have defeated Minnesota. Minnesota, they did in convincingly. Dallas was a great football game. Not much finesse, just a lot of good football. Joe Green, number 75, who goes about 270, or 275 to go with his number. A first round draft choice of years ago who has turned out to be one of the magnificent ones. He said last week after the narrow win over Cleveland that it's not time to talk, it's time to just execute and play football again. It looks like uh, they're doing it so far. Huh? It is nothing, nothing in Pittsburgh at Three Rivers Stadium with three minutes and 12 seconds left to play in the first quarter. Steeler first and 10 at their own 33. No score. Pat Summerall with Tom Brookshire. In Pittsburgh. The Cowboys and the Steelers. Again the flex from Dallas. And a handoff to Franco Harris and Randy White. When he goes into that position, he is so quick. And the cutoff block is impossible. And Patrick, that is a play from the 50s when they open up a back and that defensive tackle will see Flyer open up and just take the outside a little bit and that's the guy they kick out. You know, Pittsburgh has only scored two touchdowns all year in the first quarter. And they're a good team. You wonder why they don't get on the board earlier, don't they? Got a lot of good players. Four-yard pickup. Bradshaw gives this time to Franco Harris. He does get around the outside. Loses the football. Dallas has it. Thomas Henderson, Hollywood, gives the ball to the Cowboys. Who made the contact? Brunig that forced this. Watch number 53, and let's see. Fumble number 22 lost. 22 fumbles. And I'll tell you, that might be one of the most destructive things that can happen to an offense. Here it is. Cliff Harris makes the tackle and puts the helmet right into the football. That's what knocked it loose. Harvey Martin trying to find a handle, but Henderson does. And Dallas has it first and 10 at the Pittsburgh 37. No score with two minutes and 31 seconds left to play in the first quarter. Dorsett goes behind Newhouse. The fake is to Dorset. The throw is by Starback. It's Billy Joe Dupree three wide open. Dallas first down inside the 25. Jack Ham got him out of bounds. Good read by Roger Staubach. A lot of people have always said he's not the best reading quarterback. He wanted Drew Pearson coming across. He went to his secondary receiver who was really wide open. There was a discussion as Bob Frederick indicated just a second ago that the Steelers were offside. And of course Dallas will decline. I hope they decline to give us the number. Because <laughs> I don't want to repeat it. Defense, number 64 offside, refused. First down. Here's the play from the end zone. Watch Roger now. Come back with the flow of the eye going this way. Now they cut off and make sure that Dorsett doesn't. He looks for Drew Pearson now quickly back to the right side, and everybody's looked off. The play's wide open. It's a first down, Dallas at the Steeler 24. Roger Staubach gives to Tony Dorsett. He swings to the outside. Gets away from one or two. Boy, is he quick. Incredible. He had no chance. Furness had him cut off before he ever took the handoff, and he did a little dip. He must have legs that are as long as Wilt Chamberlain's. I've never seen such a stride when Dorsett gets it underway. Ernie Holmes finally made the tackle, but Dorsett turned disaster into a six-yard gain, second and four. A minute 50 left to play in the first quarter. No scores yet. Roger Staubach called it. Newhouse to about the 15. Furness, the first guy to hit him, over 64. And Pat, remember, Lambert is averaging 10 solo unassisted tackles a game at the middle linebacking spot. The wild man, the big guy that's a turn-on fella. He's got the, the bad stretch ligaments of the knee, and he's missing his third game. And 
That time I watched Dirt Winston, and Winston plugged it off in good shape. And this bunch will try to take care of their young middle linebacker, but that's not easy. He is number 53, Dennis Winston, also known as Dirt. From Arkansas. Third down situation now, about one. Dorsett a new house. Dorsett gets the call, and Dorsett gets inside the 15. He might have a first down, and he might not. Safety man Jim Allen made the first contact, number 45. We're about three tackles shoulder to shoulder on that one. Dorsett didn't get much movement. If it's fourth, it looks like the Cowboys might go. Remember, if Ren Herrera has six straight field goals, here come the sticks. What would you go for? Would you take three against this defense, or would you try to break it and get that first touch? I'd take the three. But you're a kicker. So is Herrera. <laughs> and a good one. You better believe it. Regardless of our opinion, Tom Landry's going to go for the first down. There's a little bit of a debate going on. Now the decision is made. Out goes Butch Johnson. Denver and Kansas City in the fourth quarter tied 7-7. That's sort of a shocker. Preston Pearson is in there with Dorsett. And Newhouse. Three backs. Fourth and one. Dorsett is the deep one. About a foot. Dorsett hurdles over the top, but I think he got it. And I guarantee you his body did not come down on ground. He is on a pyramid of players. Looks like something from a jambalaya somewhere. <laughs> Watch this, Patrick. His body will never touch the rug out there, up and over, out of what used to be called an old short punt formation. That looks like Bourbon Street Super Bowl week. <laughs> <laughs> Well done. Steelers are asking Bob Frederick again to measure. He's looking over. I think if Joe Green came up and asked me, I'd I'd get the chains out there. Whatever he said. They're bringing out the chains. And they'll be darn careful. Okay. Belly to belly and back to back. And my friends, that's football. That's known as the Three Rivers stack. <laughs> First down for Dallas. A ball of the Pittsburgh 13. No scores yet. 13 seconds left to play in the first quarter. Probably the last play coming up right now. So a set is going to score. And does. Uh, is he quick? Is he something? And you know something? He knew he had it when he crossed the 10-yard line. He started to spike on the five, but you know he's not a spiker. And a very unassuming man. How he handles all that he's been given at such a young age, I don't know, but he's classy. They started with a trip formation left and then shifted back. Watch Lawless coming across. A super trap on Furness. It's over. Watch him start to tell you. He knows it now. Boy, that makes life easy for an offensive guard. All you have to do is stand up in front of the guy. And he's so quick, he's fast. Just get a piece, huh? Right. Fran Herrera has it knocked away. 6 nothing, Dallas. Herrera had missed only one extra point all year. So that's number two. Watch it. Let's see where it comes from. Oh my gosh, it's from behind. It was Dennis Dirt Winston, the middle linebacker, and he went up over the stack to get the block. He's only 6'2". I think he could stuff it, though. Look at him jump. Watch number 53. Here's a touchdown. Here's a touchdown. Look at this. It's just a weave in, take the good trap block on Furness. Jack Ham couldn't even handle him. He's tackled all of them. 10.57 now as a third down and six from the 23-yard line. Manny back, a flag on the play, another flag is thrown, and Manny's going for broke to Don Herman. Ray Brown, and Brown is intercepted. Ray Brown has picked it up. 
I'll tell you, that's his second interception of the day. He has four interceptions for the year. We have illegal motion against New Orleans, and you know no. they're going to refuse that. Childs was the tight end who moved on it, so they will take the ball. Let's watch it. Childs moves a little early as Arch is back to throw. He has to move to his right in order to get some room to throw the football, and Herman is just too far downfield. The ball is thrown too high. Ray Brown going up for the football, catching it at his highest point as he's caught. A good catch by Ray Brown. Archie Manning a little disgusted at himself. That for Ray Brown is his second interception of the game. He has four for the year. Dallas leading Pittsburgh. Six to nothing in the first period. Should be a good ball game. And Tony Dorsett has scored on a 14-yard run, and that game will follow immediately at the conclusion of this one. Right here on CBS. First down now. Barkowski gets the Woody Thompson. Look at Thompson. He's got a first down at the 40-yard line. He literally ran over Chuck Chris, and I think that's putting it mildly. 14-yard run by Thompson. A Dallas scoring drive. You saw the stats. Pittsburgh has it first and 10. The Cowboys lead. Six to nothing. As Frank O'Harris breaks into the secondary, and Frank O'Harris is gone. Cocos Valley High School to Penn State. His longest run was 40 yards so far, and I'll tell you, he cuts it off in a hurry. Here it is again. Watch the body control, and let's see who gets a good block on the outside. Because he's cut off at the pass. You can see Bruni coming over. Good block inside, and I'll tell you right now, it's a race. And very few people have run through that secondary, and Franco does it. He's not a Tony Dorsett, but he's bigger. Franco Harris, number 32, and Roy Girella with Bobby Walden holding, puts Pittsburgh ahead. And Franco has 90 yards on eight carries, and we've got some kind of a duel going on. Above average, I'd say. Very play in a place of Jim Mitchell, who was evicted from the game earlier. Look at this. Pittsburgh now is taking the lead. 7-6. Get this one. Franco Harris. 61 yards for a touchdown in that game. Woo. Boy, Pittsburgh cannot afford to lose that game. Dallas would not like to lose two in a row. <laughs> it's getting kind of tight, isn't it, as we yeah. go to the 10th week? It sure is, Gary. It's going to be a fine, fine ball game. Don't forget to stay tuned to Pittsburgh-Dallas right after this. Inside the 45-yard line now. Second down, virtually 10. Woody Thompson and Thompson straight up the middle. Look at him go to the 30-yard line. And Woody Thompson has been the story as far as Atlanta is concerned offensively. I tell you what, Scott and Adams have been doing some tremendous blocking over on that left side of the line, really controlling the line of scrimmage. Let's take a look at it here as Thompson takes the football. There is a fine block by stand back, and he splits the two men over there, runs over another one. That's Chris back in the ball game. I didn't think he'd want to put his head in there twice in a row. Whew. Boy, he knows that number 48 is in the game every time he hits it. At the 30-yard line, first down here, stand back. And that's for stand back. It's to the 20, pump the ball. Looks like Atlanta may have recovered their own bobble, and they did. Haskell stand back, fumbling the ball at the 20-yard line. Atlanta's got it. Perkowski's found a weakness on it, the uh, right side of the defensive line and left side offensively speaking, and he certainly is exploiting it this afternoon. Looks like Dave Scott, number 70, who was shaken up earlier in the game, came up with a fumble recovery. He's number 70. So just inside the 20-yard line now, a first down for Atlanta. Look at Woody Thompson's statistics. 120 yards. He had 94 yards two weeks ago. You know, his whole problem has been fumbles. You know, you get some confidence in yourself, John, and you'll forget to fumble. He's, he's starting to come on now. Uh, he's running very, very well this afternoon. He'll be a tired young man this evening. You can bet your life on that. A blitz is on. I give to Thompson again, and Woody Thompson drags people with him. Just short of the 15-yard line, Joe Fetterspiel making the stop. There's been five fumbles in this game by Atlanta, but they've lost only one of them. 
Go now at the 16 yard line. The second down, six yards to go. I don't know how many tackles Chuck Christ has made, but when your safeties have to make the tackles all day long, you know that your defensive line is not doing the job up front. Right now, the Atlanta Falcons have 204 yards rushing in this game. Seven minutes to go. Markowski giving off to stand back. Looked like he had some running room, then Bob Pollard closed down in a hurry. Also, Chuck Chris, the guy you mentioned earlier, John. Chuck Chris was up in his blitzing position that time and just, just followed the, uh, the ball, made the tackle. Well, I tell you, a field goal here would be very damaging as far as New Orleans is concerned. At the time, getting away. Chris, by the way, has six tackles, four assists in this game. He's also had some meetings with Woody Thompson out there that nobody would like to be involved in. <laughs> Third down, four. Here he comes again on the blitz. Give the stand back. Stand back, very close to that first down. Did he get it? Ernie Jackson came up to hit him in the vicinity of the 10-yard line. They got to get inside the 10 by about a half yard. And I don't think they did, John. I think it's fourth down. It's hard to tell from up here. We'll have to listen to the officials. The ball's right on the line, the 10-yard line there. Are they going to ask for a measurement or what? Jackson's coming out of the game. He was shaken up on that tackle, taking himself out, and Tom Myers replaces him. It's fourth down. Now, John, what do you do? Do you get greedy? But they're going to go for the field goal. That's a damaging field goal if they could kick it with 6-11 remaining in the game. Thus far, Steinford has hit a 31 and a 40-yarder, and this time he's going to attempt a 28-yard field goal. This will be his shortest attempt of the day. Wait a minute now. They stop the clock. Timeout called. New Orleans wants them to think about it. <laughs> a little old psychology used out there right now, Gary. Get Steinford to think about it. Get that hook in it. Someone's probably down there hollering, watch out, you're going to hook it. Look at Steinford. Now, what yeah. do you think he's going through He right doesn't want to listen to anyone. I can tell you that right now. <laughs> it's got to be a lonely position Woo! right now. Steinford knows with his field goal, he could really put some icing on the cake. John, let's look ahead now next Sunday. Atlanta's going to go against Tampa Bay. Falcons would like to continue their drive for that wild card. L.A. and Cleveland. And that's going to be followed. We're going to have a game you and I are going to be doing. Well, we have Philadelphia and New England, and you and I will be up in uh, Green Bay with the Minnesota Vikings where they try to take on the Green Bay Packers. They lost one today. It'll be a big ball game for them. All right, boy, in the NFC Eastern Division, Dallas and Washington, you know that'll be a good Always one. a tough football game. New Orleans, of course, versus San Francisco next Sunday right here the NFL on CBS and this is a young man as they say as you're getting ready to stand over that putt you get the peanut butter in your mouth you can't swallow oh he's, he's got a tough one he's down there dancing around looks like he thinks this one's an easy one <laughs> <laughs> this reminder now immediately following this game will join at Summerall and Tom Brookshire for the Dallas at Pittsburgh game seven six right now Pittsburgh leading 28 yard field goal attempt by Steinford at the 555 mark Bad snap. The Falcons in trouble. Intended for Billy Pritchett. And I don't need to tell you, that is a big break for the New Orleans Saints. Ken McQuilligan, their third string quarterback, who holds on the snaps, bobbled the ball. You saw the defense leap into the air thinking the ball was to be kicked. And then McQuilligan, who, as we said, as a quarterback, tried to salvage it with a pass to Pritchett. And now... The New Orleans Saints have the football. He had the ball right on the money, too, as far as uh, McCook can watch him get up, throw the pass, and watch watch Pritchard. Oh, we don't have that, but he had the football right there in Pritchard's hands. Pritchard could not handle it. So now it's the first and ten, New Orleans Saints. The story of the Pittsburgh score, a heck of a run by Franco Harris. A long drive, huh? <laughs> One play. <laughs> Jarella kicks off into the end zone to Butch Johnson. And he stays in that end zone. Franco Harris. And watch the block by the center, Webster. Now, Mike Webster's 52 there. He takes Bruni, the linebacker, who's overrun it just a little bit. Flyers on the outside. D.D. Lewis gets one shot there. Remember, this happens in a hurry. If it's holding, it's too late, baby. The replay is done. So 61 yards. Done. And done well. 
by Franco Harris and the Pittsburgh Steelers. They lead 7-6 with 14.44 left to play before the half. The longest touchdown run by Franco Harris since 1972. The Steelers up by one. Here's Dorsett. Dorsett squirms around and gets to a three. Lauren Taves, number 51, made the tackle. Franco has 26 100-yard days already. And he is, so now he has 27. Hate to make it an obit because he's still alive and very well. <laughs> there are only three other guys who've had more 100-yard days than that. Leroy Kelly, Jim Brown, and, and O.J. Simpson. O.J. Simpson. So that's classy company. Aaron Kyle was hurt earlier, a head injury, and he is out. We don't know if he'll be back or not. Starbuck, Drew Pearson couldn't hold on. And Dennis Winston popped through pretty good. Wow. Winston has certainly learned what Jack Lambert learned in a hurry, too. Watch 53 to the right of your screen now. Just follow him. Roger gets a pretty good late rush right there from Holmes. Ball is again thrown sort of heavy. Pearson has to go up and get it. He usually makes the inside catch, and I'll tell you, Winston made sure. And Drew may be hurt. I'll tell you, they're having to stand over him now. You rarely see that. Drew Pearson, Dallas third and six at their own 24. Pittsburgh leads 7-6. Just over 14 minutes left to play before the half. And Drew Pearson walked off under his own scheme, but he was hit. The motion is Preston Pearson. Blitz is on. Starbuck fires behind Jay Salvi. Jimmy Allen on the coverage. Glenn Edwards close by. Cowboys will have to punt. And a ball was thrown behind the receiver, and he was well covered at the same time. Roger has his problems right now, and the crowd loves it. They love that steel curtain defense. Sellout crowd at Pittsburgh watching the Cowboys and the Pittsburgh Steelers. Jim Smith, number 86. That black jersey. And number 11 is Danny White. Fourth and six for Dallas. Just got it away. Almost blocked by Jack Ham. It's a Cowboys roll and goes down to about the 32 where the Pittsburgh Steelers will take it over. Scott Laidlaw is number 35 for Dallas. Let's go back and see how close this yeah. came to being blocked. And Danny White has had one punt blocked already this year. So there might be the feeling they could get close. We had a problem. Danny White had a problem. Pittsburgh has the football. And the momentum, too, right now. It has swung. Franco Harris. Touchdown run puts the Steelers ahead. When Roy Tirella kicked the extra point, Terry Bradshaw, the quarterback for Pittsburgh. 7 6 to score, and Rocky Blyer gets the call. And Rocky Blyer. Outside the 40, Mark Washington made the tackle, but Blyer got the good yardage. And he ran straight at Randy White and the Dallas Flex defense. Some people didn't think maybe Sam Davis at left guard could block Randy White. But I'll tell you one thing, they rooted him out that time. Look at this score from the West Coast. 3-3, 49ers and Rams. And Sutton's warming up in the bullpen, huh? <laughs> Eight-yard pickup by Rocky Blyer on first down. So they got two to go for a first. Flyer again. Close. Bob Brunig. Number 53, the Dallas middle linebacker is playing with a with an injured toe. Seattle over Houston, 3-0. Houston, of course, in the AFC Central, as are the Steelers. It's conceivable we could have a four-way tie for first place. Cincinnati has won. And of course, uh, Pittsburgh needs this game, but they have won a couple of crucial games over Cleveland already. The Steelers, then. Right. Cleveland played the Giants, and the last time we looked, they were leading 21 to 7. So now it is not conceivable to have a four way tie. Sorry. They can't get there. Cincinnati beat Miami, so they're 5 and 5. Houston playing later. Pittsburgh five and four, and Cleveland's record goes up to six and four. It's a cat fight. Nothing like it. First down, Steelers. 
Ball at their own 43 yard line. They lead by one, and Franco Harris again breaks into the secondary. Almost broke it again. Harris got a first down, stopped by Harris. They're cutting off Jethro Pugh, and watch and see what they do to Br Brunig, the middle linebacker. Webster, they double team on the outside, and the tackle comes down, the trap from the outside. The toughest thing you can read is a linebacker. Cliff Harris has to hang on or he's gone. Terry Bradshaw, the man who calls the plays for the Steelers, is the quarterback. It's first down for Pittsburgh. 100 yards rushing for Franco Harris. I prematurely gave him that before the last run. No score between the Oakland Raiders and San Diego. Second quarter, 11.54 left to play here in the second period. Steelers lead by one, 7-6, to pitch back to Franco Harris. This time, Brunick gets out there with him. Benny Barnes helped him. You know, the biggest problem with Franco Harris is they can't keep him from being charitable. He does everything that a kid's charity wants in this town, and they have to finally take him out of the walkathons and the different things to raise money for children's hospitals and MS and all, and tell Franco, Franco, do that in the offseason, but try to get some rest. He is a dynamite guy. I mean that. And a dynamite runner as well. Two-yard pickup by Franco Harris. Second and eight situation. Line of scrimmage is the Dallas 45. 7 6 Pittsburgh. Brett shot a throw. The screen looks like it ought to work. Benny Cunningham has it. Fumble! And the Steelers got it back. Flag goes down. There might have been a late hit. I believe John Stallworth is the guy who made the recovery, number 82. Well, what a great call by Bradshaw. The old screen back or screen away. Why Tittle used to run this beautifully. And it's going to be an lineman downfield. It looked like Webster, number 52, the center, might have drifted downfield on the screen. When you're eager to get out and knock somebody for the screen play, sometimes you hedge a little bit. Let's see. I can read lips, and it is Webster. And I'll tell you, it's tough to know where the line of scrimmage is. Watch 52 now. He goes over and checks, then lets the rush come. And this is the one that Tittle used to run so well. Throw it back, and the chase is taking everybody out of the play. Now watch this 250-pound tight end take a shot here. Waters. No, that was Cliff Harris. You would expect that from either of them. 7-6, Pittsburgh leads. The screen is brought back. And it's second down now and 18. Bradshaw outside Stallworth went to his knees. And again, he goes to his knees as Randy Hughes came over to make the tackle. Helped by Mike Mark Washington. Hey, one thing, Pittsburgh offense has a lot of different things in it. Suddenly now we've seen two screens in a row. And the big misconception on Terry Bradshaw, somebody once said, Here's a score from Atlanta now over New Orleans in the fourth period. But somebody once said that he wasn't an intelligent person and all that. And I was told by the scouting system that gave him an IQ test that he broke the bank. So for those people that have listened to the wrong information, Bradshaw is extremely swift upstairs. Heck of an athlete to go along with that intelligence. In fact, I had I heard from one head coach that if he hadn't been drafted as a quarterback, he would have been drafted number one as a tight end. That's how good an athlete he is. Look out. That's Randy White. Sack number 41 for the fellows from Dallas, Texas. Boy, they do come. And when Randy White gets you in the blind side. <laughs> Dallas offside. Something is wrong, we understand, with the microphone that referee Bob Frederick is wearing. That's not all bad. No. So if you can read lips as we discuss who the violation is against. Welcome. We'll try with you. Defense. Oh, that's right. Side. Third down. Thank you, Bob. Somebody was offside. Each team has three penalties now. The offsides are even at two apiece. Third and seven. Ball to Dallas, 44. Randy White was the sacker on that last play. Danny White is warming up for the Cowboys behind their bench. Here's Bradshaw. Going to take off. Too tall Jones takes him down. I 
I'm wondering about how Bradshaw takes the snap so well because that cast on his left hand is a pretty good sized cast. In the fourth quarter, Philadelphia 16, the St. Louis Cardinals 14. Ooh, the Cardinals are so swift. I bet Vermeil wishes that one was over now. Vermeil being the Philadelphia Eagle head coach. And the Eagles are starting to believe. Bobby Walden is number 39. The Cowboys faking. They're going to try to block it. Hanging high to the left side. And out of bounds inside the five. Fine effort. Now he comes out exactly two to five. Bobby Walden turned those fans around from booing him to cheering him. <laughs> his, his ninth kick. Inside the 20, and it came at a good time. 7 6 Pittsburgh. And Hank Strand says, Hey, we got a reprieve. We got a chance yet in this football game. After a mishandled snap on a field goal attempt, Hank Strand's team 90 yards away at the 10 yard line, trailing 20 to 14. Let's see what they do. As Archie Manning's got a chance to pull this one out. Manning going to throw on first down, spread it out. Throws and it's complete. Excellent play to Tony Galbraith. Boy, he laid that one in there, John. I tell you that the uh, linebacker Pennywell was right on his man and he threw that ball right into Galbraith. Pennywell right on the ball. There's nothing he could do to stop that one, Gary. Fine reception just drove him out of bounds. Take a look at it right here as, this, as we take a look at the coverage of fake to uh, Muncie. There comes the throw. Watch Pennywell's right on him. Outstanding. Well, you know, Hank Stram told us last night, John, that Galbraith just has great hands, and there was a very good example of it. He either had to catch that or pull it out of his belly, one of the two, because <laughs> Archie rifled it in there. Pick up a five, second and five, Herman and Ocean. Manning back to throw, he dumps it off, complete to Galbraith, but nothing doing this time. They lost a yard. Jeff Yates out of Boston College, a former Buffalo Bill was over there. Oh, it comes to a third down. Six yards to go. Good pursuit by Yates as he saw Muncie going out there. Yates just came back behind the line of scrimmage and made the tackle. Outstanding play. So Archie Manning now has a tough call coming up. Third down, a long five to go. In the second half, he threw a 13-yard touchdown pass. The Saints scored on a one-yard run by Muncie. They have been in this one. They battled from behind. Third and five, Manning back. Out the time, he's gonna run it. He's got the first down. Out to the 35, he's still on his feet all the way across the 40. Archie Manning to the 42 yard line. I think he's been shaken up on the play. Manning may be hurt. It looks like that ankle that he's had so much trouble with, he is down and that's too bad. 27 yard scramble by Archie Manning and the Saints are still alive with 439 remaining in the game. Well Archie Manning means an awful lot to this football team. Let's take a look at the play as we see it from our end zone camera. Pretty good pressure by no much pressure by the Atlanta Falcons but they all drop back into coverage. Archie seeing it's open going for the first down and then some. Some good running by Archie Manning. He runs right into his own man right there. James Saxon I believe it is. And then bounces back to the outside. Well, he's coming out of the game. Bobby Douglas, number 10, coming on. Well, he will not get a happy reception, but let's, you know, he's in a difficult situation there replacing Archie. Let's see what he does, Gary. Archie Manning on a third and five, scrambled 27 yards. The ball now to 41 yard line. The clock running just inside four and a half minutes to go. 20 to 14, Atlanta with the lead. Douglas gives to Galbraith, and Galbraith across the 45 to the 47-yard line. Boy, he is quick. Pennywell making the stop again for the Atlanta Falcons. Look again now at Archie Manning. That's the ankle that's kept him out of the lineup for the last four weeks. Boy, you hate to see that, John. Oh, he's a great competitor. Archie's been banged up for the last couple years. He was looking forward to this year with great enthusiasm. Just too bad that he's had uh, these little crippling injuries that bothered him. Pick up a five, second and five. Bobby Douglas gives off to Galbraith again. Very little on that play, maybe a yard. Jeff Yates has just checked in here. 
putting a fresh man in that forward wall made the stop. And here comes number eight. You well, can hear the roar. I'll tell you what, Gary, that could pick them all up now. Archie coming back. You got really have that adrenaline going right now. The momentum has changed a little bit. New Orleans Saints playing very good football right at this point. Third down. About three yards to go. Hottie comes in motion to the near side of the field. Manning gives up. Galbraith very close to that first down. They'll go for it, John, if they don't get it. Well, you have three minutes and five seconds to go. It, it would be a... You don't almost have to go for it in this kind of situation, but uh, who knows what Hank's going to do. Well, they're going to measure. And I'm not going to even guess, but it looks like... Now, nah, I won't say it. I'll let you guess. You quarterbacks always have better eyes. I believe he's a little bit short. Okay, we'll see. If he is, it'll be a fourth down in inches. Let's look. And you called it. Mr. Unitas, you called it. I can only be half wrong. Right? All right, here we go. St. Louis, by the way, has taken a 21 to 16 lead over Philadelphia after trailing 16 to nothing in that game. Boy, what a comeback by the Cardinals. We have some exciting football. What do you, what do you call here, Gary? What do you call in this kind of a situation? A first down. Nine out of ten times, it has to be a quarterback sneak. All you got to do is fall forward. Here we go. He first might throw down. a touchdown pass. Archie Manning giving off to Muncie. Muncie to the 35. Muncie to the 30. Muncie to the 25. And this crowd is going crazy here in the Superdome. Greg Brasina made the stop on a matter of inches. They get a long first down to the 25-yard line, a 25-yard run. Let's take a look at it. Outstanding blocking up front by the Saints offensive wall. As uh, Mutsi breaks the tackle, Ray Brown almost had him there. He broke the tackle. As you see Mutsi going down the side and looking for some more room to run in. Great call. Brazina 50 and uh, Roland Lars 22 in on a tackle. 91 yards for Muncie. That, by the way, is a 16th first down for New Orleans. To date, the Falcons have given up an average of about 13 a game. So the Saints offense has been effective. There's timeout, and there's our score. I mentioned a minute ago that Danny White was warming up, but the Dallas quarterback is still Roger Starbuck. He is one for four and has not thrown the ball that well so far. He's been bothered by a bad hand and a bad hip. Robert Newhouse trying to get around to the outside and does. Newhouse cutting up field. Newhouse still on his feet out to about the 34. Stopped finally by Glenn Edwards. But much more than enough for a first down for Robert Newhouse. As you look at Tom Landry talking to Golden Richards and sending in the play. Here's Newhouse. An 18-yarder was his longest run. That was 29. And he just went over the top. Now, he gets outside of Jack Ham, and you don't see that very often. The main thing is that he's so stumpy, he's got the balance. He won't run out of bounds either. I guarantee you he'll stay in the field of play. Give credit to Butch Johnson, number 86, for a good block. That sprung him into the secondary. First and 10 as Dallas gets out of the shadow of the goal line. Lee. First down for them. Starbuck, Billy Joe Dupree at the 50. Dupree at the 45 inside the Pittsburgh 45. Stopped by Glenn Edwards. The big BJ wide open. How, how old is that play? We were talking about it before the game that Jimmy Finks once threw one of these, the LB nickel. Uh, it's a pop pass. You fake the inside play and then dump it to the tight end. And a young middle linebacker like Winston is in the wake and chasing. It's another first down for the Cowboys at the Steeler 44. Just over eight minutes left to play before the half. First and 10, Dallas, Dorsett, and Newhouse, the running backs behind that guy. Starbuck. Dorsett accepts the fake. Starbuck fires, caught by Butch Johnson. Another Dallas first down and a heck of a catch. Dennis Winston. Denver now has taken the lead over Kansas City. 14-7, fourth quarter score. Butch Johnson doesn't get to play a lot, but I've seldom seen him when he didn't produce exactly what Landry thought he could do at that moment. He is an extremely fine football player. Today, at least, he and Golden Richards are alternating at the wide receiver spot, bringing in plays from 
The only head coach Dallas has ever had, Tom Landry. Nolan Richards and Drew Pearson come to the left side together in the formation. It's back to Dorset. Flag is down. They played this way for years. Good block by Donovan that time. Got Newhouse to the corner. That funny-looking defense that Pittsburgh uses sometimes has Joe Green almost on top of the defense, offensive center. Defense, number 75 offside. Love First Joe down. Green. Terry Bradshaw looking on. I'll tell you one thing, he takes the bad with the good. He wears extremely well, this man. Burton Wallace is number 66. Roger Staubach, of course, is number 12. So it's set in motion. And back to the end. Not much doing there. Lauren Taves is number 51. Number 53 is Dennis Winston. Taves comes up and does exactly what you want the linebacker to do. Make sure it's sealed off inside. Here you can see Lawless trying to get outside. Taves, very strong upper body strength. And all he's trying to do is play as good a right Right linebacking job as he can. He looks like he's a pretty good football player to me. Baltimore 26. The Jets 12. Fourth quarter score in Baltimore. Second down here. Pittsburgh leads Dallas 7-6. And back to Dorset. He breaks a couple. Got close to first down yardage. Jack Hand is number 59 who finally made the tackle on TD. He's always full length forward when the darn play is over. Dorsett's reaching up with the ball, going for more. Looks like he's about a yard shy of a first down, so it'll be third. And out goes Newhouse, and in comes Preston Pearson to join Dorsett as a running back. And now here comes Newhouse back. Mr. Landry changed his mind. You see the tight formation with sort of the short punt type thing with three backs close, maybe, huh? That's right. Drew Pearson goes out. With Dorset, Preston Pearson, and Newhouse behind Starbuck. Ah! Dorset and Roger Starbuck is going for Jay Salvin. He's got it. Dallas touchdown. Oh, what a call! Did that come from Ermel Allen upstairs? I don't know. It was a great call. I followed Newhouse to see if he could block. I followed Dorset and thought, my gosh, he didn't get the first down. And Roger came out throwing. That call from the bench, don't forget that. Fitzgerald and company go to work. Rafferty's got Mean Joe Green off, and everybody's going for Dorsett. I would have. In fact, I did. Look at this throw. He doesn't have to be artistic. Sally's not going to drop it, is he? I'd like to welcome Philadelphia and St. Louis audience. The Cardinals beat the Eagles 21 to 16. And those of you who watched that, welcome to this. Pat Summerall with Tom Brookshire. The score here is Dallas 13, Pittsburgh 7, and we have 5 minutes and 26 seconds left to go before the half. There is Dick Wood, the quarterback coach, Hank Stram, Rich Motti. We just have the two-minute warning here in the Superdome. Excitement. 25-yard line. The Saints have the football. After on a fourth down and in inches, Chuck Muncie went 25 yards off the right-hand side. The Saints trailing by six points, 20 to 14. They have been victory starved, and now they're going to try to win one here. It's going to be tough against this Atlanta defense. Archie Manning on delay to Tony Galvin. Galvin to 20, 15 to the 12. First down. Now Ortega, Greg Fresina makes the stop, and Galvin and Muncie, thunder and lightning are really exciting this crowd. Morrison and Sanders on some fine offensive blocking up front. Let's take a look at it right here as we see the draw play to Galbraith as the hole is formed and he picks it well. All the way down to the 12-yard line. That was a 13-yard run by the former Missouri standout. And now just inside the 12-yard line, first down a minute 24. Archie Manning giving off to Muncie, and he's hit for a loss. Big defensive play by Rick Bias. Bias with big plays coming out of his hip pocket today at a 74-yard interception for a touchdown. 
and he'll never make a bigger tackle than that. Gary, that's one of the quickest moves you're going to see by a defensive halfback coming up to play that sweep coming out. Saw the guard pull the end block down, and he was across the line of scrimmage before once he got out of tracks. Let's watch it right here. There's the play. As you saw Galbraith miss the block as Bias came right past Galbraith to get Muncie for a loss. And now New Orleans has asked for a timeout. They use it. They have one remaining. The ball at the 17 yard line a loss of five that brings up a second and 15 and Manning now discussing the situation with Dick Wood and Hank Stram. Archie Manning coming back after being on the sideline for four weeks and his presence has been felt. Gary, the important thing here is, is the fact that they only have one minute, 11 seconds left to go in this football game. This has to be a touchdown for the for the Saints. And the, of course, with the one minute, 11 seconds, and they have uh, 12 yards to go, that we're going to see a final score right there, St. Louis 21, Philadelphia 16. Boy, is that a big win for St. Louis. They're now 7-3 and three on the year. The Eagles are three and seven, and the Eagles are an excellent three and seventeen. Well, that's a big win. We have a good ball game right here, and this is a big play coming up for Archie Manning. Second down, fifteen. The ball back out to the seventeen-yard line after a five-yard loss. Twenty to fourteen. Atlanta with the lead. Galbraith and now Mike Strawn is coming to the backfield for the Saints. In motion is James Faxton. Archie Manning on second and 15. He's got protection throwing. Giles! He's got it! Touchdown! Henry Giles! It's his seventh touchdown catch of the year. And Hank Stram is up and jumping on Archie Manning. What a play! Let's take a look at it here as Archie goes back. Childs has beaten by, so Archie just kind of lofts the ball up in the air. Watch the reception. In for the touchdown. He beat Childs, beat right, Rick Bias, Henry Childs, 85. Boy, are they happy. That's a 90-yard drive. They started from their own 10-yard line. 20 to 20 to score, a minute five. An important point after. Lancer to hold, Zaro to attempt it. The kick by Zaro. He got it. There's a flag on the play. It's against. Atlanta, so it'll count, and New Orleans has taken a one-point lead. 21 to 20, as the New Orleans Saints, a dramatic come from behind. The Dallas scoring drive, five plays, 95 yards. Robert Newhouse had a 29-yard run to start it off, and a touchdown pass from Staubach to Saldi. That's Alvin Maxson, number 28. And he breaks around it to him. Herrera misses it. Maxson goes. Randy Hughes finally caught him. But Pittsburgh has it back in good shape. And the Cowboys seem to think that they can cover kickoffs as well as anybody. And they have it today. Pittsburgh is really using the run back to get to field position. Here's the former New Orleans Saints running back. And he's a solid guy. Now watch him get up in and duck it outside. Efren gives it the best shot he can, and now Hughes pulls him down from behind. You can't relax against any team, but particularly a good team like Pittsburgh. A Steeler first down with five minutes, 14 seconds left to play before the half. Franco Harris ducks under a couple. Jeff Thoreau Pugh is number 75. The George Burns one-man show. And only the slide George Burns could do it. And Margaret's going to help him, too, huh? Pretty good help. I'd say. He'll also have Gladys Knight in the pips, the captain and Tennille, and a special friend named Bob Hope. Sort of misleading, isn't it? George Burns is worth the price of admission all by himself. And the other folks are pretty good, too. Second and seven. Rocky Blyer stays back to block. Lynn Schwab accepts the pass. Terry Bradshaw, I beg your pardon, John Stallworth, not Lynn Swan, Mark Washington on the coverage. Boy, this young man had two TD passes last week against Cleveland. Now watch him. He goes down and sets it up, drives Washington off, and turns him all the way around, really. 
Ball was perfectly thrown because he had to come back to get it. You're never going to break that one up, not if you're wise. Never covered. New Orleans has taken the lead over Atlanta. 21-20, fourth quarter score. First down here, 13-7 down. Bradshaw's going to throw again. Look at the swan. He's in the corner. He's going to be out of the end zone if he catches it. And he is. Benny Barnes on the coverage. I tell you, that track is rough stuff. That sort of beat up, chopped up clay, and it is not a soft composition. And Lynn Swan went for it and made the catch, and he's got to be shaken up. That's the baseball warning track. So that the outfielders will know when they're close to that fence, and Lynn Swan, in his desire to catch that football, is still down. You know what an asphalt pizza burn is if you fall down on it? That's just what Lynn Swan received. He hit that fence pretty hard. I'll never forget his Super Bowl, his MVP Super Bowl two years ago. That was one of the great exhibitions of in sports in a long time. There were two catches in that game that nobody, I think, who ever saw it will ever forget. Look at this. This one doesn't count, but he went and drove right on through and made the catch. A lot of receivers would have said, eh, I'll wait for the next one. He didn't hit the wall that hard, but he did about a... 15 yard skid out of the end zone across that clay track. And he's up now. He only weighs 174 pounds, and you get all of it from Lynn Swan, I'll tell you. Every pound. Here's what happened to the line of scrimmage. Harvey Martin now against Powell. And I'll tell you, that is some kind of a battle going on. Now he's picked up and doubled to make sure. Archie Manning with his second touchdown pass of the game. A 16-yarder to Childs. Childs now has seven touchdown catches this year, two today. And that ties the record for the club, Garrett. A 90-yard drive, John, and <laughs> 10 plays against what is considered to be one of the top two defenses in the NFC. Well, they have this town on its ear right now. The crowd is going crazy here. And it's been a fine, fantastic football game, even with all the penalties that are being called. So now Zaro will kick off. He just hit a pressure packed point after. But well, we're going to have to see now what Prokowski can do with one minute and five seconds left in the ball game. Zaro hits one a mile. They're going to let that one hit. They're going to bring it out to the 20-yard line. Zaro didn't get the adrenaline going when he walked back into the football game. Now Atlanta has all three of their timeouts remaining. The ball at the 20-yard line. A minute five remaining. You see it on your screen. 21-20. New Orleans trying to win their third game of the year. Markowski on the first down. Got beautiful protection. He's throwing down here to Jenkins. Intercepted. Chuck Smith. And it's Bedlam here in the Superdome. Chuck Chris with his third interception of the year, and John, he has just been outstanding all day long. This the ball was underthrown by Burkowski, which is, uh, and I kind of, you know, don't know whether question at all. Question was to go for that long bomb the first time, Gary, rather than working the ball down there. But Burkowski certainly has the arm. Well, this time he was just underthrown. Alfred Jenkins, 84, who had the speed, had him beat out there. As we see Chuck Chris coming up with a big play. Well, they are excited here in the Superdome. 55 seconds left. The ball at the 26-yard line is Hank Stram's team, who has defeated Chicago, Los Angeles, and now trying to defeat Atlanta. Three very good football teams. Archie Manning, what a job he's done. He gives off to Galbraith, and Galbraith fires ahead. Atlanta now is going to use the timeout. They have two remaining, 52 seconds left. The Atlanta defense had, had held the Olympics opponents under 100 yards per game passing, Gary. I don't know how many we have right now, but it has to be over 100. Well, they've given up 206 yards on the ground and 71 in the air. Well, they still held them under 100, but it seemed like they should have had more than that. All right, our producer, Howard Reifsnyder, directed by Bob Dumpy. Thank you, gentlemen. Excellent job. Associate producer, Steve Wegman. As we've had a most entertaining football game here, better than 43,000 on hand. Atlanta 
who had a chance at the end of this day to possibly be tied for first place in the Western Division, now in danger of dropping back to the 500 mark at five and five. 52 seconds left, second down and eight. Give to Galbraith again, and he protects the football to the 31, and Atlanta calls another timeout. They have one remaining with 48 seconds, and it's third down. Coming up next will be Dallas and Pittsburgh, and now Dallas has taken the lead after trailing seven to six. Big, big game of the NFL, and we'll be going there immediately following this one. Lots of big games. St. Louis defeating Philadelphia. A game that will keep that Eastern Division up for grabs. And you know Dallas is aware of the fact that the Cardinals have won today. Miami uh, lost to Cincinnati this afternoon, and Baltimore was winning against the Jets, so that'll put them another game up on top. Well, we have four weeks remaining, and there's a lot of things to be decided. Third down, five. The Falcons have one timeout remaining. Manning up to Muncie. Muncie's got the first down. Scott Muncie runs for the first down, and that'll about do it as Ray Brown came up to make the stop. Atlanta uses their last timeout now with 35 seconds left in the game. And Chuck Muncie, been outstanding, picks up a big first down. Let's take a watch at us. Archie just hands off to Muncie. They're just trying to run the clock out here. Some excellent blocking down here by Galbraith on bias. Enables Muncie to get outside and pick up the first down. John Chuck Muncie has 93 yards on 17 carries. Galbraith 79 yards. So thunder and lightning has been a very effective one-two punch for Hank Stram's team. What a big win this will be for New Orleans. And there's a final. Baltimore, after starting slowly, put it together. Baltimore 33, New York Jets 12. I don't think there was any ever doubt in that ball game. 19 first downs in this game for New Orleans. And as we said, Atlanta had been allowing just under 13 a game. So the Saints offense that's been dormant has been revived today. Manning goes down. Atlanta has no timeouts remaining. Now they probably will have to stop it, though, delay a game because with 31 seconds, they may have one more play to run off. But look at Hank Stram. Is he happy? You bet. Hank Stram's team going to win their third game of the year. A come from behind win. They trailed 20 to 7 at halftime. Only to see Archie Manning throw two touchdown passes in the second half. They're just going to let the clock wind down. This game is over. And the crowd counts it up. The New Orleans Saints with a 21 to 20 upset of the Atlanta Falcons. Move their record to 3 and 7 for the year. The Atlanta Falcons now drop back to 500 for the year at 5-5. Five and five. Don't forget now, immediately following our conclusion of this game, we'll be going to the Dallas-Pittsburgh game. Tom Brookshire at Summerall will be bringing you all the action in that big game. As St. Louis has already won today, Dallas must keep pace in that one against Pittsburgh. And, John, I think today is indicative of how tough this league is at Western Division. They're close, aren't they? San Francisco, New Orleans, Los Angeles, and Atlanta. They are sure that Atlanta is not going to fall. They're not going to fall back at all. All right, Gary Bender speaking for John Unitas, saying so long from the Superdome. Stay tuned as the NFL Today continues after this word from your local station. Sheriff Fawcett Majors, Gabe Kaplan, David Cassidy, and many more stars compete in sports events on Celebrity Challenge of the Sexes. Tonight at 8, 7 Central and Mountain on CBS. Here comes Swan, and that, of course, is Chuck Noll greeting him on the sideline. The Rams now over the 49ers, 10 to 3 in the second quarter. Second down and 10 for Pittsburgh. The bottom line of scrimmage for Dallas, 32. Bradshaw gets on the draw play to Frank O'Hara. This time he is wrapped up by Harvey Martin, who read it well. All right, in the flex defense, Harvey Martin goes outside, and he's still so darn quick, he gets back through the block of Cole, who had a good one and knocks Franco down. You know who's doing a good job on offense is the offensive tackle, Larry Brown, who used to be the tight end. You see in the left side of your huddler, number 79, he's now right in there in the trench. He used to be 220, now he's 250. He should be in the trench. Three minutes and 50 seconds left before the half. Dallas. Cunningham gets down inside the 10 for another Pittsburgh first down. Randy Hughes 
made the tackle. Dallas had a blitz going. But Bradshaw and the Steelers read it well. The third, the third completion by Bradshaw. Watch how he takes a little off. Good quarterbacks can do this. He's got a six foot five, 250 pound tight end that's just open enough. It's an excellent throw and a big target. Super throw. He had to throw it like that to get it over Charlie Waters. If he had thrown it on the line, he would have knocked it down. Benny Cunningham. That's why Larry Brown is the tight end now. Because of the abilities of number 89, Benny Cunningham. First down, Steelers. At the nine, it's first and goal. Bradshaw's going to throw again. And does. Going to have a touchdown. That pretty well tells the story, doesn't it? Bradshaw, not only happy, but on target. Look at that cast on his left arm. He's played with this. This is his sixth game. Good fake here. Barnes is never in the chase on this one. There's the throw taken off again. Aha! Inside the field of play this time. Lin Swan. The experts who pick odds in games like this have established Pittsburgh as a one-point favorite. The score is 14-13. Boy, they're accurate, aren't they? Some people you'd expect to know a lot about football don't know a lot. <laughs> and some people do know a lot. This is what the game is all about, though. Lynn Swan is back over there by, right by the, the liquid containers. He falls into the track, goes into the wall, gets the abrasions, and comes back and gets the TD pass. Those are the ones you appreciate. Terry Bradshaw so far today is four out of eight. One touchdown pass you just saw him throw to Lynn Swan. Total yards are 48, but Pittsburgh has the lead, 14-13. You know, that Cowboy defense has only been allowing, I think, 36% of the passes to be completed. Uh, Bradshaw's doing a job. 33-12, final score. Burt Jones and group continue to roll for Baltimore. That make them nine and one. Yeah, they're looking for big things in January, aren't we all? We are. The biggest thing is the Super Bowl, and you'll see that here on CBS. That's Larry Brinson with the football. Brinson stumbles out to about the 25, kept his balance for about eight extra yards. Now the pitch of the game has gone up. And until they go in at halftime, you're going to see probably some late hitting. You're going to see a lot of extracurricular stuff. Both teams are getting a little bit abrasive right now. New Orleans defeated Atlanta 21 to 20. And those of you who watched that upset, welcome to this broadcast. Pat Summerall with Tom Brookshire at Three Rivers Stadium in Pittsburgh, where the score here is Pittsburgh 14, Dallas 13. And we have two minutes and 40 seconds left to play before the half. Salvi comes in motion. Starbuck throws back to Dorsett. Flag goes down as Dorsett breaks into the secondary and picks up about six. They're going to call a crackback lock on the man in motion for Dallas on Jack Ham, the linebacker. I believe he came back and hit him a shot in the back. White White applauding the men in the striped shirts. <laughs> you don't see that too often, no. do you? <laughs> Atlanta's record now, by the way, after that loss to New Orleans is five and five. The Saints go to three and seven. Take him back. I don't think they crack back and clip Jack Ham. I think they just tried to tackle him. Both are illegal. Fun, but illegal. Bob Frederick goes back in the other direction. Offensive holding, number 86, first down. Instead of cracking back, put the holding down. Put the clamps on. And now they'd like to force Roger to go upstairs with something he doesn't want to do. Maybe he doesn't want to throw it real quickly. On first and 20, he throws outside the door set and look out. Can be dangerous, this fellow. Mel Blunt finally tackled him, but they almost got the first down. The scary thing is, it looked like the Pittsburgh defense was in pretty good shape until he caught the ball. And then everything seems to open up. 
he was really looking forward to this game and to his first start of this year of course so many fans and so many friends in this area from his collegiate days and from his high school days nearby he asked for a hundred extra tickets <laughs> I don't know if he got them all you can afford to pay the scalper for him I tell you he's got a little <laughs> bit of money in the bank gave up a lot for him and then they gave him a lot too you know people said that when they saw him at, at Hopewell High that he you could see then that this was going to be one of the great ones it just didn't happen overnight he had it those people were right he got a first down ball at the 36 yard line for the Cowboys two minutes seven seconds left to play one more play before the two minute warning that gets the call again and again he got about eight Ernie Holmes made the tackle a blocked extra point that's the difference 14 boom boom 14 13 to score a minute 59 left to play before the half the Steelers up by one stay with us at halftime as we'll update all the scores and highlights from around the league have a special report on that historic meeting in the Mideast between the Israelis and the Arabs Fagan and Sadat and one heck of a football game going on right here at Three Rivers Stadium Tom Brookshire and Pat Summerall scores 14 13 Pittsburgh leads Dallas second and three situation from the shotgun the protection is good and Dorsett has it. Oh, and he is popped hard by Winston. The ball went loose. And let's see what they rule. I think the reception will stand, but that was a fumble. And I'll tell you, Winston can move and hit at the end of it. He has destroyed uh, a couple of Cowboy receivers already. Dorsett now is checking to see who it was that ran over him. It was 5-3. You could see Dorsett aware very much of the fact that dirt was coming and he tried to duck under and just barely did not third down shotgun situation outside Preston Pearson got the first down and more out of bounds at the 45 in Pittsburgh territory Dwight White made the tackle he's a hometown boy coming back too. not only did he play with the Steelers but he lives around here he might have a couple hundred tickets <laughs> Preston Pearson and Tony Dorsett have been battling all year for the starting position that halfback in that cowboy offensive unit and until today it had been Pearson today Dorsett um, Landry has Butch Johnson Roger Staubach Golden Richards gathered around the Chicago Bears against the Detroit Lions on Thanksgiving Day 12 o'clock noon Eastern time here on CBS we'll be there Turkey in Detroit what kind of turkey do you prefer I'll bring a bird with me Okay. And I answer later. Roger is 10 for 13 for 113 yards and the surprise TD to Saudi on Walter Payton, of course, you'll see in that game at the Silver Dome in Detroit or Pontiac. Walter Payton, in case you might not know, carried the ball 40 times today for the Chicago Bears as they beat Minnesota and picked up 275 yards. I haven't had a chance to see him work. That's going to be an experience. We're looking at a great guy work today. More than one, really. Franco Harris, Tony Dorsett, Rocky Blyer. Newhouse has been good. First down, Dallas. Starbuck operating from the deep spot. Ducking. And down he goes. Back at his own 45. Steve Furness right right and I mean a tough sack a physical sack because Roger did not want to go down and lose too much the Cowboys are thinking at least three now watch this watch the left of your screen as mean Joe Green goes to the outside and Furness gets to the inside and Donovan loses him and that is a tough physical sack that's a mugging again the shotgun by Dallas this time he has time and outside Preston Pearson he got out of bounds Jack Ham was the closest stealer. He didn't get much. But the clock has stopped with a minute and three seconds left to play. 14-13. Pittsburgh over Dallas. And if Dorsett is in the game now, you might as well get him out of the backfield and into the pass pattern. Because you don't want him having to step up and 
and block one of those defensive linemen that gets away. That could shorten the career by about four years. A minute, three seconds left before the half. Dallas with three timeouts remaining, and Pittsburgh has the same number. 14-13, the Steelers over the Cowboys. First time they've met in regular season since Super Bowl number 10. Starbuck operates in the shotgun again on third down. Fires down the middle for Drew Pearson, and Drew Pearson is top. Woo. Edwards really hit him a shot. J.T. Thomas has made the coverage. Drew coming across the middle and watch him take this blow to the head. And I love the Steelers' defense because they don't go into a prevent. They play you tough on the line of scrimmage, and the secondary plays you man-to-man. -man. There's the free one right after he had missed the ball. So the Cowboys now put in their punting unit. And back for Pittsburgh goes Jim Smith. Don't forget now Danny White is a quarterback. Possibility of a pass always remains. A high angling kick, trying to get it out of bounds. And Danny White does. So Pittsburgh will take over. Sixteen yard line. Starbucks had one of his greatest days, and yet this team trails by a point. He's eleven for fifteen for 118 and a touchdown. And they're shy of one. That blocked extra point by Dennis Winston. Makes the score 14-13 as Roy Girella has hit both of his. That's Bill Gregory. Good pass rusher. That's why he's there. That's what Dallas is figuring right now that the Steelers will try to throw. The draw to Franco Harris. It's a tough play now. Just give it to Franco Harris. It's a tough play. Harvey Martin. Bill Gregory. like to be staring across the line of scrimmage at Harvey all day. There he is. I think I'd rather be someplace else. You can play Jimmy Withers stuff in the morning, but he's not going to fool me. I'm not going to play on Sunday afternoon with him, I'll tell you that. John Cole has that job. <laughs> with 15 seconds now and the clock running. Gary Bradshaw gives to Franco. Franco bangs into Thomas Henderson and Aaron Kyle. Good to see him back. Last play of half number one. Pittsburgh crosses the Dallas unit as both head for their locker room. The Steelers go there with a one-point lead over the Cowboys. It was late in the fourth quarter in Chicago's Soldier Field. For the afternoon, Walter Payton had gained 217 yards on 37 carries. Bob Avellini bent down in the huddle and called 34's number again. Got a block, jumped over a would-be tackler, broke loose down the right sideline, and before he was stopped, he had gained 58 yards, and suddenly O.J. Simpson's record was in jeopardy. And on this play, Walter Payton made it 275 yards in a single game, a new record. Now for a single season, the record, of course, is held by the Juice, and O.J.'s one-year mark, 2003, is in jeopardy. After 10 games, Walter Payton leads Simpson. If you compare Simpson's record-breaking year with this season by Payton, who still has four games to go, including Thursday's game on CBS Chicago and Detroit. Irv Cross, how about Cleveland and the New York Giants? We didn't have anybody running like that, but it was a pretty exciting game, though, Vince. The Cleveland Browns came into the Meadowlands and defeated the Giants by a score of 21 to 7, and they did it in typical Cleveland fashion. Good overall, solid uh, defensive play, but right here in this sequence of play, Coleman hunts down to Bobby Hammond. Bobby Hammond, by the way, had a tremendous day, Brent and Phyllis. Here he makes a nifty return down to the 45-yard line, and Goldstein... Uh, Goes right back to Hammond on the screen play. This is the best play of the day by far, but the Giants won't get a touchdown out of this because an offensive holding penalty was called on right guard John Hicks, number 74. Bobby Hammond goes in thinking he does have a score, but the play was nullified because of the holding penalty. But the 
thought you ought to see it anyway. But Dr. David Mays here at quarterback, uh, substituting for Brian Scythe, goes to the air and hits Paul Warfield on the baseline. That was it, and that's all it took. Cleveland 21, the Giants 7. Beautiful catch by Warfield, too. Irv. Four games in progress. Let's update those scores right now. Los Angeles leading San Francisco by seven points at the half. The game you're watching is a dandy, 14-13. Cowboys miss an extra point. Houston has now come back to score the last 10 points. They're ahead of Seattle, 10-3. Oakland, San Diego, the story there is that Ken Stabler's been injured. Mike Ray is in, and the Raiders cling to a one-point lead. And Irv and Phyllis, we're going to be right back after the CBS News special report. This is a CBS News special report. Sadat in Israel. Sponsored on a continuing basis by the makers of Herbal Tegrin Shampoo. This is Bob Schieffer, CBS News. For Anwar Sadat, this extraordinary day began at the Al-Aqsa Mosque in Old Jerusalem, one of the Islamic faith's most sacred sites. Sadat was the first Arab leader to worship here since Israel took over the area after the 1967 war. He appeared lost in his thoughts as he prayed for 45 minutes, clutching his prayer beads. He spoke only in unison with the other worshipers. Outside, Israeli security forces tightened their guard as Sadat moved through the old city and past the Mosque of the Golden Dome. There were crowds wherever Sadat went, but the police became uneasy when a large crowd began to gather just outside the walled city, chanting slogans both for and against the Sadat visit. As the crowds grew more vocal, Israeli soldiers barred the gates to the old city and reinforced the guard, but there were no serious incidents. He concluded his tour of the old city with a visit to one of Christendom's most sacred places, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, revered as the place where Christ was buried. There was almost a festive air as the walking tour of the old city continued. Throughout the stroll, Sadat seemed composed and in good spirits in spite of the crowds that pressed in around him and those who were permitted near him seemed genuinely happy that he had come there. A bit later, the mood was more somber as Israeli Prime Minister Menachem Begin took Sadat to Yas Vashem, the memorial to European Jews who were murdered by the Nazis during World War II. Begin led the Egyptian president down the steps and through the black marble corridors of the shrine, which is known in Israel as the memorial to the Holocaust. Along the way, Israeli officials produced yarmulkes, which are traditionally worn in sacred Jewish places. Sadat at first appeared to accept the skull cap, then politely declined. The purpose of the tour seemed to be to dramatize for Sadat just how difficult the Israeli struggle to establish a homeland has been. Sadat left a message in the guest book saying, may God guide our steps toward peace. Let us end all suffering for mankind. But perhaps the day's most dramatic moment was at the Knesset building, the home of the Israeli parliament where an Egyptian flag was raised to fly beside the Star of David. It was here at the Knesset that Sadat and Begin would make their historic addresses before the parliament in a packed gallery that included a visiting American congressional delegation. Sadat in his speech was cordial but firm. Begin was just as firm, but held out hope for an eventual agreement. In the past, we had our reasons for this, yes? We refused to meet with you anywhere. Yes, we used to describe you as the so-called Israel. But I tell you today, and I declare to the world at large, that we accept to live with you within a just and lasting peace. We do not want to surround you or that you surround us with rockets aimed at destruction or the missiles of prejudice and hatred. I declared on numerous occasions that Israel has become a reality. I suggest that everything will be negotiable. The one that says in the relation between the relations between Israel and the Arab states that there are things that should be taken out of negotiation, takes upon himself a great responsibility. Everything is open for negotiation. 
The members of the Knesset reacted to the Sadat speech with courtesy and what seemed to be curiosity. Back in the United States, President Carter paused on his way home from church where he had prayed for the success of the Sadat visit. President Sadat would be courageous enough to go to Israel will transform, I think, the, uh, the Middle Eastern uh, peace prospects, regardless of the outcome of this particular visit. It's a breakdown in, in 30 years, perhaps even centuries, of uh, hatred. And I was particularly touched yesterday when uh, President uh, Sadat walked down the uh, red welcoming uh, carpet and shook hands with uh, Mr. Diane and, and uh, he and Mrs. Mayer changed, exchanged uh, a friendship, and he bent and kissed her on the cheek. I thought that was a, a great uh, occasion. I think it will be a major step forward. Sadat and Begin met again tonight at a working dinner. More details on that this evening on the CBS News broadcast, 60 Minutes. This is Bob Schieffer in New York. Now we rejoin the NFL on CBS. The National Football League is furnishing us with one heck of a contest. And not a bad view either. Central casting must have brought in that moon. I looked at the clock thinking maybe we'd overslept. It is some kind of a scene for a football game, isn't it? I'll say. First half stats are wild. Bradshaw's been completely in control. But look at the rushing yardage, thanks to Franco's 61 yarder, 127 yards for Pittsburgh, and Dallas only gives up with the average of about 114 over four quarters. He's been careful. The only turnover was that the one fumble by Franco Harris, and obviously he atoned for that. But that's been the big bugaboo with Pittsburgh. Just don't give it away. They play tough. Roger Staubach, 11 out of 15. Bradshaw, 4 out of 8. And neither team is grim about it. They're just going out and locking on the hat and going to work again. I really like this kind of a football game, Patrick. You have to. You have to like the way he's played, too. And again, that left wrist in a cast. Terry Bradshaw been playing with that fractured left wrist, wrist for the last two, three weeks. Rams in control out there in the third period now. It looks like their defense is playing the way the Ram defenses uh, usually play, huh? 17-3, they lead the 49ers. The Niners had won four in a row. 11 minutes, 18 seconds left to play third quarter. First and 10, Pittsburgh. Ball thrown, 16. Franco Harris hit by Jethro Pugh almost as soon as he got the handoff from Bradshaw. D.D. Lewis helped him out. Looking right by Jack Ham there. Look at the Penn Stater watching the game just like he's got an ice cream cone or something. These are final scores. The Bears behind Walter Payton's 275 yards rushing. Beat Minnesota 10-7. Detroit 16-7 over Tampa Bay. It's 24 in a row for them, Tampa Bay. Cleveland 21-7. Cincinnati upset Miami 23-17. Bradshaw drops the throw. Good time. Swan. Benny Barnes back with him. Looks like Dallas has come out defensively now to take over the line of scrimmage. Uh, Jeff Thoreau got the good at penetration, and that time they put a pretty good rush on. New England 20, Buffalo 7. Final. That also a final. New Orleans beat Atlanta 21-20. Oh, that's the most points the Falcons have given up in the century. St. Louis came back to defeat Philadelphia, 21 to 16. The Eagles had led that game for a long time. Denver finally beat Kansas City, 14 to 7. And Baltimore continues to roll, 33 to 12, over the New York Jets. Third down now and 10 for Pittsburgh, still back at their own 16-yard line. Franco Harris and Rocky Blyer back behind Bradshaw. Draw play, Blyer. Harvey Martin from behind. And we'll look at Bobby Walden. Come on, number 39. Randy Grossman, the backup tight end for Pittsburgh. With the great hands, but can't get him in the game to get his hands on it these days. He's a very fine receiver. Plays behind Benny Cunningham. Scored a touchdown in the Super Bowl two years ago against Dallas. And here is Bobby Walden with Butch Johnson standing back at the 40. Are they coming? They're coming. They are. Didn't hit him. Butch goes over and tries to do turns out to be for Bobby Walton all the way down to the 15 yard line it hit the artificial turf and away it went a 65 yard punt and Waters almost blocked it he just turned off the foot at the last moment 
That, of course, the disadvantage of having only one safety man back there. He can't cover the whole field. First down, Dallas Cowboys after a tremendous punt by Bobby Walden. Cowboy ball at their own 15, 14, 13 Pittsburgh lead. And off Dorsett. Three or four. Both teams have told their defenses, we need you. We need you more than we've ever needed you. You got to squeeze them and make them cough it up. And Dorsett that time looked like he was going to pop through the hole and it closed up. Ernie Holmes had him and end of saga. Dwight White help. Think Roger will throw this time? No. You? I don't know. He's going to have a few people hanging around him if he does, I'll tell you that. No shotgun. Five or six to go. Drew Pearson broke it to the outside where he was covered by Mel Blunt. Roger thought he might be going deep. He didn't. And so it fell harmlessly. Blunt might be one of the great cornerbacks to ever play this game. Hey, San Diego up over Oakland. Stabler was hurt and is back in the game, though, now. 9-7, that score. That on the West Coast and running about the same time as this. There's Mel Blunt, who had some contract difficulties, did not play at all during training camp periods. <laughs> he missed 59 days of training camp. That's not too bad. <laughs> That's pretty good, in fact. That's right. If you can get away with it. Dorsett and Pearson are the two backs in the backfield now. As Roger Starbuck goes into the shotgun. He throws. It's intended for Preston Pearson. <laughs> and Blunt and Cage were all over him. Danny White will be back again to punt for Dallas. And the defense gets the standing ovation from the sellout crowd at Three Rivers. And Bobby Walden's punt is going to be a big factor in this entire period. The, from the shotgun now, the short out, and Taves is over there with Blunt. And I said the defenses are turning on. Watch this play. That's action. Ball fell down on the back, actually, of Pearson. And Blunt might have had a chance to intercept it. Danny White gets off a shot. Jim Smith goes back and tries to field it, but it goes out of bounds at the 38-yard line where the Steelers' offensive unit comes sprinting onto the field. Steelers got the best of that punting exchange by far. Let's watch that line of scrimmage coming up, Pat. It's going to be pretty vicious, this series. That's what's going to settle it. We've got eight minutes and 58 seconds left to play in the third quarter. Steeler first down at their own 38. 8.58 left to play third quarter. Pat Summerall with Tom Brookshire. First and 10, Terry Bradshaw, the Steeler quarterback. To Franco Harris, who tries to cut back, finally does, and picks up about six. And maybe more. Didi Lewis played it as well as you could play it, but Franco's always had that ability to look reluctant, like, eh, I'm not in too big a hurry, the play's gone anyway. Watch it. Watch Didi get to the outside, cuts him back. Blyer stays with it, by the way, which he always does. And now he puts it down and gives you a load. Randy White also came out to help out. Franco got more than it looked like he got. Seven, in fact. Second and three. Blyer. Blyer has more than enough for the first down and has enough to get into Dallas territory for Pittsburgh. Audible call by Bradshaw. And Dallas tried to move into the defense after he had made the audible call, and he ran it right through there anyway. Pittsburgh quarterback is on. Rocky Blyer does so many good things. Tom mentioned a minute ago about how he stuck with that block. And he's one of the best blocking backs you'll find anywhere. Back there with Franco. First down, Pittsburgh, Dallas territory now. Bradshaw gives flyer. And again, he gets good yardage. Underneath, over the. Franco Harris. Cuts to the inside. Cuts the first down. 
Barnes finally made the tackle on Franco. Watch another big day. Watch Davis now, number 57. Get out in front of this. Here's the veteran. Watch this block he makes. Young people watch it. He takes Harris and cuts him right in half. And Franco goes laterally about five yards with no move at all. And I'll tell you, downfield, he runs like a halfback and hits like the fullback, doesn't he? First down, Pittsburgh. And the Dallas 28. Franco Harris operating very efficiently. trigger on that one and he waited to get into Dallas territory with the running game and look at this he squeezed off around I'll tell you Stallworth comes across the middle has never felt the pressure of defensive backs they'll get good pop blocking they go right out and take Dallas on the line of scrimmage the stun doesn't bother look at this throw that's dead on that's a third touchdown for Stallworth in the last two games Second touchdown pass today by Bradshaw. One to Swan, now one to Stallworth. Durella makes it 21-13, Pittsburgh over Dallas. Here it is again. Oh, speed. Pittsburgh 21, those amazing Steelers. That's the scoring drive that made it that way. 21-13, the Steelers over Dallas. Jurella kicks off. A high, long kick. It will be Butch Johnson bringing it out of his own end zone. And Butch gets outside the 20 to about the 23. Jim Smith led the tacklers. Terry Bradshaw's two touchdown passes. And Franco Harris, 61-yard touchdown run. Half the Steelers in front. And do not bury the Cowboys. They have speed and they have class at the skilled positions. They have people like Pearson and a fellow named Dorsett that can get you back in the game in one mistake. Roger Staubach. John Fitzgerald just picked up the football. The Duke. Roger Staubach on first and ten. Has Newhouse and Dorsett behind him. And here is Tony Dorsett behind Burton Lawler. A few, but tough ones. Lauren Taves, the outside linebacker, made the tackle, number 51. You're so happy when he only gets five yards that you feel like the defense has closed him off completely. San Francisco now on the board with a touchdown, and the Rams do not have an easy way in the fourth period. 17-10, that score. And Drew Pearson hasn't caught a ball yet, number 88. Might be one of the keys. He scored the first touchdown, you might recall, in Super Bowl X coming across. He's had a couple in his direction. And he's been popped a couple of times. Dorsett got three. So it'll be second and seven. Line of scrimmage, the Dallas, 27. Draw play. Dorsett bounces off a couple, and look at him. All on his own. Lauren Taves finally made the tackle, and Dorsett is near a first down. I'm telling you, he was hit at the line of scrimmage, and somehow he gets both feet on the ground. The penalty flag may walk it off, but this young man can hit, and he can take it. Bob Frederick and his crew, Bob is the referee, will let us know what happened. It's my old buddy from Colorado. He better tell us what happened. Jim Allen signaling back that way. Back their way. Those guys in white. <laughs> Offensive holding. Number eight. Garble transmission, which is just as well. We don't like to point the finger. The penalty's bad enough. Without being named. It'll be second and 17 now for Dallas. From behind Roger Staubach, look at this. The crowd comes alive on second and 17. Great drop. There it is. Drew Pearson's first reception of the day. Jim Allen on the coverage. 
And you can keep him quiet for a while, but not forever. Now, I'll tell you one thing. Roger has to load it up in a hurry. The Steelers just came with four people, and they all almost got there. High throw, and Pearson just keeps it in bound and tries to steal an extra yard or two. Watch the rush. Watch this. He takes two with him, trying to open it up so Furness can come up the pipe, and then Joe goes ahead and makes the rush himself. He's down 11 pounds from that 270-something. He looks like he's pretty healthy. I think he got all of his vitamins. He had missed a meal, I'll tell you that. First down for Drew Pearson. Rogers draw back. Moves Dorsett deep. Fakes to Dorsett. Throws outside. Overthrows. Butch Johnson, the intended receiver, stopped and covered by J.T. Thomas. Houston 10 now, Seattle 3. Houston's record in the AFC Central was 4 and 5. They could get it up to 500. Talk about a race. Cleveland's already won, so they're 6 and 4. Pittsburgh trying to go 6 and 4. Cincinnati won. They beat Miami. They're 5 and 5. But make no mistake, the 8 and 1 Cowboys want this game so badly. Not for percentage or average, but they don't want to lose to this team. They may see them later on. And they, of course, are aware of the fact that St. Louis has already won. St. Louis chasing. The Cowboys should lose. The Cardinals would only be one game back. Starbuck, back. Pick it up! Pick up! Jimmy Allen down the sideline. He might go. Allen at the two. He is down. Neely on the tackle, but Allen made the interception. And Roger looked at Dupre all the way and laid it right in there, and he's really been guiding the ball. He has really been making too short. And Allen's got the great speed. He's limping a little bit, but I have a feeling that hurt will go away. All right, watch this. Roger looks all the way at Dupre coming by and now tries to straighten it right in there. Excellent move by the safety man. Kept off the white line. And now Neely comes up to snuff him there. And it's first and goal for the Steelers. Franklin Hines makes it touchdown Steelers. They lead 27 to 13 all of a sudden. Terry Bradshaw, the jubilant one. Offside, decline. In the background, underneath the roar of the crowd, you can hear Bob Frederick saying the defense was offside, but that's academic. Chuck Noll welcomes Franco Harris after his second touchdown of the day. What was that touchdown drive? One play? Two yards. <laughs> Seven. Flags are down again, but... Dorello's kick is good to make it 28-13. Pittsburgh. And this battle may have just begun. There's a long fourth period that stretches out in front. Defense, offside, points good. And we can hear the to touchdown it. by Frank O'Hara. Weak side run. Look at the blocking. A stand-up job, his second of the day. He has 139 yards. I'm talking about number 32. Number 50, who threw that key block, was Jim Flack, the offensive guard. And he just shut off Aaron Kyle. From Phillips Group, leading Seattle 13-3. Told you their record a little bit earlier. They're 4-5, and five, trying to get it 5-5. Five and five. The AFC Central is something else again. Starbuck, the doorstep. A few, but not many. Ernie Holmes, number 63. Ernie Holmes has really given Fitzgerald a, a tough afternoon down there, and Fitzgerald's got to be one of the top two or three centers in football, and big Ernie, number 63, is just packing it in. That'll bring up a third down situation for the Cowboys, six yards to go, and they bring in the group that they figure operates better on a passing situation. Steelers... Nothing is easy, but their schedule from here on in is not that difficult. They play the Jets next week. Dallas, rough road. 
Roger Staubach looks, finally pulls it down, throws finally, knocked down on the sideline by J.T. Thomas, and Dallas and Danny White will have to punt. And Roger was just glad he could throw it to somebody and get it knocked down. Listen to this crowd, and Art Rooney must be up clapping with them. Talked to Mr. Rooney at the half. And I said to him, good first half. He said, I wish it was over. They were ahead 14-13 at the half. Dangerous punt return, man. And as we said, Smith doesn't even know what the fair catch signal is. Jim Smith is number 86. Number 11 there is Danny White. Ah, kick again, aiming for out of bounds. Smith lets it go there. Just barely out of bounds, no return. At the 20 yard line is where it's marked. Just looking ahead at the schedule for Dallas. And keep in mind that St. Louis, the pursuers have already won. Dallas has Washington in Washington next week, then Philadelphia, then San Francisco, and they finish with Denver. And Philadelphia played Dallas tough two or three weeks ago, too. That whole schedule's rough. The Rams now 20 to 10 over San Francisco. The Steelers' remaining schedule, the Jets, Seattle, Cincinnati, San Diego. There's Rocky Wire. Wire knocked down hard by Bob Brunick, the middle linebacker. You know, I got to believe that Chuck knows preparation, and they tell me there were some three-hour practice sessions, which is unheard of, really, uh, in modern football, but because of the crazy offense that Dallas has, plus the getting their own offense together, they know really work these guys hard upstairs, you know, and cerebral team is a pretty good team and it looks to me like their game plan offensively is excellent we haven't had one call for thomas henderson the great linebacker today not yet you right i haven't thought of that three yard pick up by blyer makes it second and eight and rocky comes in motion and franco harris comes behind him franco taken down by charlie waters on a good play a gambling play Remember, the Dallas team has intercepted at least one pass in every game. Not yet today. A long yardage situation now for Dallas, a situation that everybody who faces them dreads because they make so many defensive changes. They come with six defensive backs and 16 different kinds of blitzes. Armed, too. <laughs> the Steelers have handled it well, and so has that guy, Terry Bradshaw. Good day for him. He fakes the draw. He throws the screen. And it's set up well. Rocky Flyer out close to midfield in Dallas territory before he's down by Penny Barnes. What a place to call a screen, though. Dallas having some trouble maintaining the line of scrimmage. Watch them come this time. And Too Tall Jones chases Bradshaw back along with the safety blitz. Now watch Webster, number 52, the offensive center. Downfield blocking is tough, huh? He gets Harris down. And Lynn Swan was even trying to block downfield. That's an effort. That is one of the most difficult plays in football to execute. The screen pass. It looks so easy. But believe me, it's not. And you'll never see it done any better than that right there. Rocky Blyer on the receiving end. Franco Harris this time carries and gets back for a couple. Jethro Pugh came out on the pursuit and made the tackle. The whole line came out of the pursuit. The whole defensive line just moved it over, and D.D. Lewis st stacked it up long enough. Now they're chasing hard, and they know they've got to get the ball back. Now if you go with misdirection, look one way and screen another, anything now that Bradshaw might want to come up with, they could keep this ball alive. Just saw Lynn Swan talking to Terry, saying, I got my guy. <laughs> you ever see a receiver who didn't want to catch the ball every play? All of them on every play. Wouldn't want to receive it. He didn't think he could get open, would he? That's right. Second and nine. Line of scrimmage, the Dallas 47. It's 28-13. Ooh. Get to a few leading that charge. You know how many conversations are going on on every play? And obviously the folks at home not only do not want to hear what's being said, but we can't let them. But there is talking among all 22 as they come together on each play. That's the end of the third quarter with the score.
The Pittsburgh Steelers 28, the Dallas Cowboys 13. We now pause for word from your local station. Joe Green looking on. Hard to believe he's one of the real nice guys off the rectangle, but he is. White, White. Tom Landry, the head coach of the Dallas Cowboys looking on. His team trails 28-13. They have the football at their own 28. Here comes Drew Pearson in motion. Tony Dorsett in motion. Dorsett cuts back for perhaps four. Lauren Taves made the tackle, number 51. That's spelled T-O-E-W-S. Spelled that way. Make, it, make it multiple choice. I'm really in trouble. <laughs> Did you notice Dorsett didn't run by his interference? His own blockers were in his wake. He is still in a hurry, and that's what youth will give you. You can be in a hurry. There's Franco. He's got 143 yards rushing already. I've forgotten about that youth, but Dorsett is quick. <laughs> Second and five. He got five. Roger Staubach drops the throw and throws. Caught by Jay Saldi. A heck of a catch. JT Thomas made sure he stayed down. They tell me Jay Saldi has really developed. Uh, the reason is that uh, Guinea's worked so darn hard. Ditka told us he's the hardest working person he's ever worked with on receivers. Now watch this catch. It's a tough catch on a slippery rug in a foreign place, Pittsburgh. Lynn Swan, who has made some tough catches on his own. Pretty good little television commentator, too. He did yes. a good job. Yes. Spent some time with Mike Ditka last night, and his friends weigh over 300 pounds. <laughs> 2310, Los Angeles over San Francisco. Mike, of course, played yeah. as well. Here is Robert Newhouse cutting back. Out near the 40. Dennis Winston, the middle linebacker, made a tackle. Chuck Noll, the wine connoisseur, also the Steeler head coach. Used to be the old Cleveland Brown guard. Messenger guard he was. I remember, he, I think he bit me once on the arm. I was just trying to get out of bounds. And he only played every other play. <laughs> and still bit. Guards aren't supposed to still have their teeth. That's what bothered me. He had a pretty good bite. <laughs> he alternated with John Wooten, didn't he? <laughs> Dallas organization. Second and three. Cowboys on the move for the moment at least. Or set in motion. Cowboys get back to Newhouse and Newhouse. Gets enough for a first down behind the blocking of Rafferty. Joe Green and Jack Ham made the tackle. I'll tell you, Dorsett got in here and tried to block for Newhouse. Let's watch it. Number 33, who got the ball all the time, goes to the right of your screen. Gives it a shot. First and ten. The Steelers season this year very similar to what happened to them last year. They like to get their backs to that wall, don't they? And then scratch. As Joe Green said, the time for talking is over. It's time for playing. They've been doing it. Dorsett behind the fake. He throws outside. Burton Wallace was out there with Dorsett. And Burton, who has never caught a pass that I know of, What's that with whistle under his arm? Well, they're going to call. Uh, the flag was dropped late for an intentional grounding, and I think it's really a rotten call. Obviously, Lawless was the screen blocking guard on that thing, and Dorsett was right in his shadow. And I don't think this is a legitimate call at all. Illegal receiver touching the ball downfield. He didn't catch the ball downfield. You said he was a friend of yours, Bob Frederick. I mean, no friend of Dallas right now or anybody else. I just. Dorsett was out there with him. Yeah, Dorsett was standing in his shadow, and there were three Pittsburgh Steelers over there. I don't may blame Roger for complaining. It's about the only weapon the quarterback has, bless their souls, and that's to unload it once in a while, and he was really trying to throw it to 33. Loss of down, too, you know. Yeah. 33 became 66. Ineligible, touching the ball downfield. And it's a loss of a down also. Second down. Second down. Second down. He really wants it to be second down. Seventh penalty for the Dallas Cowboys, and that one may have taken a lot of wind out of the old sails. They had something going for a few seconds. So it's second and 20. 
Lionel Skinner's now back at their own 37 as Roger Staubach fires. Caught by Drew Pearson. Spins away from a couple. Still gets away from a couple. And gets the Dallas first down. Mel Blunt was in the tackle of Drew Pearson that time, but Drew still got the first down. He averages about 17 or 18 yards a catch, and some of it is, is just incredible gymnastics. Now watch him come across. Now remember this secondary. They've been banging him all day. He doesn't give up here. Now Mel Blunt gets him by the arm in a minute and tries to wring his neck with it, and Drew still won't go down. The Dallas Cowboys believe that there is no contest as to who has got the skinniest legs in pro football. They'll tell you it's Drew Pearson. And the smooth set of hands, huh? And tough. Dorsett looks like he's going to throw. Still looks like he's going to throw. Finally found the handle, and he was stopped by Ernie Holmes and Lauren Taves. Look where Drew Pearson is. He's down on the 15-yard line all by himself. I think he was trying to throw and might have lost control and decided. Yeah, he was going to pass. He has thrown one already this year for a completion against Washington, and he had that in mind then, but just couldn't get all together in time. Oakland and San Diego in a rather surprising happening. 12 to 7. The Chargers over. Oakland in the fourth quarter. Fouts back at quarterback, huh? Came back last week after that long holdout and after saying he'd never play for them again. He's back playing. Second and eight. Dorsett, a two yard pickup. Roger Staubach behind good protection this time, deflected by somebody in the front four. Joe Green, I think, got the big hand. Oh, I'll tell you, Joe Green on the line of scrimmage has really been savage. I'm not kidding. You watch the right part of your screen. Rafferty's throwing it in there. Joe has been using the arm whip and throwing people away like nobody. Now watch him get off balance and then get it up. Wet powder it just didn't come off, did it? It's like the World Trade Center coming down on top of you. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be third and eight. Preston Pearson is in the game. An excellent receiver. Golden Richards split wide to the right. Drew Pearson left. A lot of folks. Over the head. Intended for Jay Salvi. Who couldn't quite hang on and it bounced off him. Looks like they're going to punt. We got nine minutes and 53 seconds left to play. And again, the defense comes off to the acclaim of this Pittsburgh Steeler crowd. 28 13, they lead. Another sellout for the team of Art and Dan Rooney. And I'll tell you, one of the great stadiums to come to, you really feel like it's Boy, football, it nice? huh? Isn't it nice? It's been Steeler football today as Danny White tries again for the sideline, tries again to get it away from Smith, Burton Lawless, and Tom Henderson down looking at it go out of bounds. You know, Dallas has been preparing for Pittsburgh, thinking Pittsburgh is going to fumble the ball four or five times. We might get two or three interceptions. It simply has not happened. Nine minutes and 45 seconds left to play in this contest, and Pittsburgh in command. 28-13 in favor of that group. Run by Terry Bradshaw, number 12. 9.45 left to play. Dallas Cowboys looking like they might lose their second in a row. Frank O'Hara barrels outside the 15-yard line. Ed Tutal Jones. Remember when he personally took Minnesota apart in that Super Bowl, 158 yards rushing? The Oilers, 23 over Seattle. Bradshaw's job now, work the clock. Pull that chain a little bit and get the minutes off and take away chances for Dallas to get back in quickly. A few more plays like that would make him happy and see the fans as well. Second down and three. First down, Pittsburgh. That offensive line for Pittsburgh, uh, it's not as renowned as the St. Louis Cardinals or even maybe the Dallas Cowboy bunch, but they do a great job. 
And when they can't block you, they hold you very well. <laughs> now, you know the thing about them, they're not that big. They're all about the same size. When I say not that big, they weigh 245, 250. They have no necks, though. They're just all solid <laughs> guys. They would be big if they had necks. <laughs> They'd be tall. Yeah. First down, Pittsburgh at their own 22. Bradshaw gives to Blyer. And Blyer picks up Randy White and a few others. Pittsburgh's not thinking turnover, but Dallas defense is thinking turnover. Let's scrape it, let's grab it, make a bad handoff. Which of those two guys do you think that is in the left-hand corner? Rocky Blyer. He didn't look too Rocky then, did he? A nice smile mm. for a hard-nosed football player. But you know, he's still got a great smile. That one of the incredible stories anywhere, not just in sports. The Vietnam veteran who was told that he'd never play again is now one of the better halfbacks in this league. Frank O'Hara, one of the better fullbacks in this league. Cuts back to his right, stopped by Jeffro Pugh. Man, there's some hitting going on now. There were five Cowboys in on that, on a gang tackle. Again, they're looking for the ball. And you don't want to say it in the huddle like, make sure you hold on to it. You know, you the things that aren't happening, you try to act like they can't. But you don't want to fumble it now. You don't want to let Dallas feel like, they, hey, we can snitch it. But the minute you say don't fumble it, that makes you squeeze it just a little bit harder, and that's when it pops loose. It's got helium in it. There's the other member of that running backfield, Frank O'Harris. That was taken last year before he had a beard. <laughs> Third down, Franco. Does not get his first down. Dee Dee Lewis wraps around the top part. Cliff Harris had him around the ankle. Is it rough on a Sunday afternoon? Watch this. D.D. Lewis is just playing the best football of his life. Harvey Martin reached a stalemate with the guy who was trying to block him and sort of stacked it up. Benny Cunningham. The tight end is the guy who's down and being looked at now by the Steeler officials. Benny rolling over right now. We have six minutes and 47 seconds left to play in this football game. Pittsburgh 28, Dallas 13. Big Bobby, excuse me. Sorry, Big Cunningham walked off. The big kid from Clemson. He was limping, but he was walking. His college team finished on a positive note with a few close and anxious moments yesterday. And they're in line for the Gator Bowl, looks like. Dallas is coming. Walden is back, number 39. Butch Johnson alone. And here they they do get him, though, and a flag goes down, and Pittsburgh will keep the football. Bobby Walden. And I don't believe he was faking it. I believe he was a little bit gimpy. He is still a little bit gimpy. <laughs> <laughs> he's not All only right, gimpy, buddy. but he's mad. <laughs> oh, Bobby Walden, you're on television. He, he gets it off. That's the main thing. If he just wear a full face mask, we wouldn't have seen that. Said the magic words. Running into the kicker defense, number 43. First down. Steeler first down. They lead 28-13 over Dallas. The ball now out there, 35. That is a final score. That game over on the West Coast. Los Angeles 23. San Francisco 10, the Ram record. Goes to seven and three. Atlanta lost. They are five and five now. So Ram moves two games. Here's Franco Harris breaking a couple of tackles. Franco Harris near a first down. Charlie Waters got him out of bounds. That ought to do some all-time figures for Franco. That puts him over. His best was in the Super Bowl, 158 yards. He had 157 once on 41 carries against Cincinnati. But this puts him over that. And he, of course, the 61 yard burst may have set the tone for the whole game. I'll tell you, Clack that time, Jim Clack came out and took D.D. Lewis in from the, uh, from the outside position and one of the great blocks you'll ever see. We saw Dallas early in the year when they were really playing well, and then honestly, they haven't been playing real well in recent weeks. But 
Pittsburgh, I think, is as good as we've seen all year right now. I think they're they're very physical. If you want my spot, okay, knock me off of it. And that kind of a team under this kind of a coach, pretty tough late in the year. Tom Landry and Roger Starbuck looking on. Think he's on Harris. You got 164 yards on 25 carries. The previous best time uh, was 157 yards against Cincinnati back in 1975. So Big Franco looks like he's going to do a thousand at least again. And he plays hurt extremely well. He'll give it a shot. Second and a very short half yard as Rocky Blyer will go for that and get it. Wrapped up by Ed Jones, but he still got the first down. I'm not so sure that Dallas hasn't played well. I just think that Pittsburgh, since the 61-yarder by Harris, they just seem to have been in control. As the yard markers move up for Pittsburgh first down, the crowd begins to sense that this one goes into the W column for the Steelers. They lead 28-13. We now have five minutes and 40 seconds roughly left to play. Steeler line of scrimmage at their own 46. Terry Bradshaw, the quarterback, as he has been all day. Franco Harris stops and cuts back on the far side and goes down without without too much. Stopped by Dee Dee Lewis. Look at that final score. San Diego 12, Oakland 7. San Diego's record goes to 5-5, five and five, and Denver takes over first place in the Western Division of the AFC. And Snake Stabler did have a strained knee and did not finish the football game as the Oakland quarterback. Speaking of strained knees, there's Benny Cunningham. Tight end for Pittsburgh, who has a left leg problem, looks like left knee problem. Denver is down nine and one. Oakland now eight and two. Going to be a reverse to stall. Try to rattle, got it back. Brunick, Charlie Water, wrap it up. Almost that crucial fumble. Everybody inhaled. Waters plays it beautifully. The safety man comes up and is waiting for the reverse. Of course, the Cardinal sin would be to let Stallworth get outside, which number 41 does not allow. Even spins back and gets the tackle, he and Randy White. Watch the ball come up. I told you, everybody inhaled. <laughs> Cowboys have a man hurt. Looks like uh, Thomas Henderson, who doesn't want to leave, but now he is. Place taken by Mike Hegman, number 58. Uh, I'm not sure what's going on there. Waters is shaken up too. He made a spin around and got that slap on the head, I think. I'll tell you, it's a physical game. See that roll out of a block like you just saw Waters execute there. It's a pretty good lesson from a, for a young, aspiring football player. That's a good way to get away from a block. Bradshaw, by the way, has used up about uh, four and a half minutes on that clock. They have four minutes and 15 seconds left to play now. The Steelers lead it 28-13. Their ball at their own 45. Bradshaw's up back to pass. Harvey Martin has him get away and again get away. And finally, Mike Hegman takes him down. Randy White back there with him. And I mean took him down in rough style, and Bradshaw Randy is on there. the ground. He has that bad left wrist. That's the first sack of the day on Bradshaw. And the team came in with 40 of them. Terry's getting up. He's, He's all right. Up. JoJo's right behind us, and she's worrying, but he's up, JoJo. JoJo Bradshaw, his wife, watches him come off. Here's the play again. One of the great football games, other than that Super Bowl, when he was just simply fantastic, is this one. There is. Harvey Martin getting a shot, and Gregory, and White, and finally, the hit by Hegman. Hegman is, that did the job, huh? 39 is Bobby Walden. Back for Dallas, number 86, is Butch Johnson. Will they or won't they? They've tried a few times, and have come close, but haven't blocked it. High kick from Walden, and up goes the hand for fair catch from Butch Johnson. The sidelines. 
I have never seen that treatment before. They had to drag Dirk Winston off, not because he was hurt, because he wanted to stay in and play. Rollin Cole took his place. Roger Staubach drops the throw. Firing deep for Jay Salvey. Almost picked off by Glenn Edwards. Salvey, the tight end. Tony Dungy was back there with him. Watch him come at you. Glenn Edwards was just sitting, waiting for the ball. Down the middle, tight end. Sally with good speed, but Edwards, of course, flexed and playing a little bit loose. Really just read this one all the way. I don't know if Rogers thrown the ball that well today or not. Of course, we've seen him when he's he's always the 60% passer and all, but I think that hand's bothering him a little bit. He I didn't really so throw too. that one. There's Benny Cunningham, who walked off, but now he's limping in a more serious fashion. And it looks like uh, Benny Cunningham might be headed for the locker room. Brian tight end, and we might see Larry Brown move back to that position. Here is Roger Staubach. Firing. It is picked off by Dungey. The Steelers come up with another interception. The pass intended for Jay Salvi. And Tony Dungey made the interception. And Mike Wagner is no longer back there. He's had the back injury this year. They thought the secondary. Uh, with Shell out now, might have been weak, but this is a very jubilant young player, Dungey, who is a pretty good quarterback if he's called upon. There was a time when he was called upon. Three minutes, 13 seconds left to play in this game, and the Steelers lead 28 to 13 over Dallas, and they have the football. Steelers on the football on second down. Yep. Bradshaw is still the quarterback. Delaplane's in there now. Flag goes down. It's Jack Delaplane. Place of Frank O'Harris. Delaplane gets down to about the 17. Cliff Harris and Charlie Waters converge to make the tackle. Flag went down. You saw early. Number 38 checks in for the Pittsburgh Steelers now. Patrick, number 52 right there. Webster. Is the some kind of a football player, the offensive center, I'll tell you that, for the Steelers. That whole bunch, Davis, Cobb, uh, the entire group, Clack, they've all just done a great job. I mean, against a heck of a defensive line. Webster's arms look like a big pine tree. Defense, offside, unsportsmanlike conduct, offense, replay. Play that one again, that run by Delaplane. Sid Thornton into the Steeler backfield. Terry Bradshaw right there, the quarterback, and that's his wife, JoJo Starbuck. She's so just happy to see him out there yelling again at the officials and feeling good. She was worried about it. We were asking a minute ago what she thought Terry hurt a minute ago when he was down on the field, and she said he, she thought it was his wrist. And Tom said, you're going to have to wait on it. She said, I always do anyway. <laughs> Monday mornings or something around the house, right? <laughs> Super Skates will be on CBS. JoJo will be performing and commentating, which is something we've never been able to do. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> we need some help like JoJo. Yeah. You realize that Dallas has only had the ball for three plays since the 9.15 mark of the fourth period, and Noel is still breathing fire. Oh, what's he mad about? One more point. 54 seconds left to play. Bradshaw gives to Sid Thornton. Number 38 is stopped by Randy White. She gets down to about the 22 and a half yard line. The Dallas Cowboys now call a timeout. Score is 28 13, Pittsburgh over Dallas. Sid Thornton, by the way, there's Terry Bradshaw coming over. Talk with Chuck Noll. Tell you one thing, Landry will not have any alibis. No. Just after the St. Louis game, or when they almost lost to Philadelphia, he said, "We're just really not playing that good football." And even as talented as we are, we've got to mature, and we've got to get better, and we've got to have the intensity. And I think this game really proves that. No matter how good you are at the skilled positions and all that, you've got to go out and out hit people too. He said it was inevitable. You said we haven't been playing very well, and. You knew that somebody was going to beat us. Here's Tom Landry. And Stallings. Gene Stallings, yep. Yeah. And Terry Bradshaw, of course, back into the offensive huddle for Pittsburgh. 42 seconds left in this contest. 
Steelers have the football. Third down. Bradshaw gives to Delaplane. Jack Delaplane scoops to about the 16. Randy White chased him down. Not a first down for Pittsburgh. And again, Dallas calls a timeout. So with 31 seconds left to play, it looks like the Steelers got this one locked up. 28-13, they lead. Chuck Milton, who always does such a great job for us. Incredible worker, isn't he? He's been the producer. And Sandy Grossman has been responsible for the pictures you've seen. And they speak for themselves. Grossman always gets us those extra sized beds so we can at least get a good night's sleep. Is that who does that? 25 seconds left to play. Noel is still hot. He was, they just threw a flag in there and got him for being out of the coaching box and he threw the flag back at the official a minute ago. <laughs> Here's that guy we were talking about. He's the third. One and two and then three, huh? Personal foul. 56 for defense. First down. You believe there's three red eyes? <laughs> it's frightening. Nine seconds left on the scoreboard clock. 28-13. Steelers over the Cowboys. In Chicago, 60,000 people were on their way to watch the Vikings and Bears play football while Sadat and Begin were speaking in Israel. Did you watch Sadat and Begin this morning? No. Do you know who they are? No. Sadat and Begin. <laughs> what is Sadat and Begin? I'll tell you what it is. Sadat and Begin? I don't know what that is. Dot and who? Did you watch Sadat and Begin this morning? She's a chief. I don't know for nothing. Other fans were aware of the Sadat Begin meetings. I think it's a wonderful thing for the world. If everybody would cooperate, I think there could be peace. If Egypt decides to go along with him in the other Arab states, it's a great thing. If they don't, there can be a lot more trouble. <laughs> But to most Chicago football fans today, the names of players like Peyton and Abilene meant a lot more than Sadat and Bagan. Bob Kerr, NBC News, Chicago. San Diego coming out of nowhere to do the job. Ricky Young pouring in for a touchdown. And that gave San Diego a 6 to nothing lead. Oakland, belabored by a sprained knee for Kenny Stabler, had to turn to Mike Ray. And he ran one in for a touchdown. Oakland took a 7 to 6 lead. And then Mike Ray had all kinds of troubles on the day. That sack by Louis Catcher, among others, including Gary Johnson and Evans. Home, the Saints playing host to the Atlantic Falcons. We pick up with action late in the second quarter. Atlanta leading 13 to 7. Manning intending the pass for Johnny Gilliam, but no. The ball picked off by 38. Rick Bias, fourth year man out of Wayne State. And look at him go, cutting back across the gridiron. Nobody gets him, 72 yards in all. Atlanta leads 20 to seven, more points than the Falcons have scored in any game thus far this year. But late in the third quarter, the score still 20 to seven. Archie Manning, exceptional but under-publicized quarterback, looking for Henry Childs, who gone as an end, touchdown, that made the score 20 to 14. Manning 10 of 18 on the day, 82 yards, two touchdowns. Now, it's late in the fourth quarter, 20 to 14, third and five situation. This is why Manning is so great, big, and strong, and capable of running. Personal, not for five, not for 10, but in this case for 27 yards and the first down. Just seven plays late, a minute 11 remaining. Archie Manning back again to pass, looking for Henry Childs again. The ball perfectly thrown. Fine catch by Childs. The conversion good. New Orleans upsets Atlanta 21 to 20. That's Art Modell, aggressive, innovative president of the Cleveland Browns. Giant Stadium, the Browns against the Giants. Midway in the second quarter, the Browns leading. But Jerry Goldstein hits the rookie from Colorado, Emery Moorhead. That ties it at 7-7. Joe Pisarczyk out with a bruised thigh. 
And then in the third quarter, the score still tied. The pass intercepted by Gerald Irons, the linebacker acquisition from Oakland. And Gerald finds it easy. Magnificent downfield blocking. Scoots 53 yards. Touchdown. That made it 14 to 7 Cleveland. Early in the fourth quarter, Dave Mays, substitute for the injured Brian Sight. It's Paul Warfield, so graceful, beautiful catch, and the Brownies won it 21 to 7. That's odd, Rooney. Bengals, Miami is Riverfront Stadium to go against the Bengals. Burley, the man who sacked Tarkenton and hurt him with a clean hit. This is action. Greasy to Nat Moore. Touchdown late in the first quarter. That gave Miami a 7-3 lead over Cincinnati, but early in the second quarter. Look at Kenny Anderson. Speed up the middle. 17 yards. Touchdown. That made it Cincinnati 10-7. With just 2.35 remaining in the game, Miami had assumed a 17-16 lead. Watch closely. That's Anderson, Archie Griffin, and John McDaniel. Back to Kenny Anderson. And downfield to Bob Trumpy all alone. Miami taken in by the play. Cincinnati 23 to 17 over Miami. Let's look at it again. A beauty. Anderson the handoff to 45 Griffin. Then to 86 McDaniel. Back to Anderson. Flea flick down to Trumpy. And the Miami secondary was lost. Great play. Cincinnati victory key game. Cincinnati stays alive in the Central Division. Miami trails Baltimore by two games in the East. Bush Memorial Stadium. The Eagles visiting the Cardinals late in the second quarter. It's nothing, nothing. Ron Jaworski for the Eagles to Harold Carmichael. 13-yard touchdown. The point after block. Philadelphia 6-0. Eagles built up a 16 to nothing lead by the third quarter. And then Hart to Jimmy Otis. Watch him go a right around right end. Jimmy Otis in for the injured Wayne Marks. That made it 16 to 7. Otis, the sub, ran for 97 yards. Look at the day of Hart. Now here's Jimmy coming right back to Mel Gray, number 85, the speedster from Missouri and Santa Rosa. Touchdown. Gray kills them all. It doesn't matter what team. You can't contain him. That made it 16 to 14. 44 seconds left in the game. Watch this. Jim Otis again. Touchdown. One yard plunge. The Cards saved the game 21 to 16. Soldier Field Chicago. The Bears against the Vikes. We're midway in the second quarter. The score, nothing to nothing. Walter Payton, up at 34. One yard plunge. Touchdown, seven to nothing. Now let's go to the third quarter. By this time, the Bears lead 10 to nothing. In a tough struggle. The Bears have missed scoring opportunities. So have the Vikes. A punt attempted by Bob Boston. But 59, Matt Blair, the huge linebacker, so swift and so strong from Iowa State, blocks it, carries it in for the score. That made it 10-7, Matt's fourth block kick of the season, which should give you an idea. But it was Walter Payton Day, third-year man from Jackson State. Incredible figures. 40 rushes, 275 yards. This rush, absolutely typical. Around right end for a 29-yard game. The 275 yards in one game exceeding O.J. Simpson's single game record. Here goes Peyton again, this time off tackle. Swinging to his left, trying to thread his way between tackles. This film, generically designed to show you as he escaped tackles there and continued onward, the extraordinary day he had. Look at him follow his block. Escape that tackler, escape that tackler, and that tackler. And on he goes before finally being corralled from behind. Walter Pate, number 34, a first-round draft choice from Jackson State. This has to be one of the most extraordinary running backs to come into the league in years. In a class with the Jukes, and in a class perhaps with his predecessor with the Bears, Gail says, a smallish man. And watch this. This is the play that broke the record. It's a four-yard gain from six yards out. And that gave him his 275 yards. And you know something? 
He walked off the field. You see him right there, tired but unhurt. And Walter Payton is one of the great players of his time, and he has proved it. and hitting. It was a game played in the freezing cold with no quarter at. And it was a game that had its own ebb and flow. One team ahead and then the other. Bart Starr throwing to the former Yale, who had been one of the baby bulls with the New York Giants. Chuck Versine, a big play right there. Dallas ahead of Green Bay, 17 to 14. And then the sucker play again to Chuck Mercy as they suck at one so great as Bob Lilly. 16 seconds left. No more timeouts. Bart Starr coming over to the great coach for the final word. What would they do? Only a foot and a half away, maybe not even that much, from a touchdown that would bring them the NFL title. The team that Don Meredith fought about, coached by Tom Landry, and then this. Jerry Kramer's famous block against Jethro Pugh, and Bart Starr sneaking in for the score. But as you look at it again, Don Meredith would tell you the truth. Leroy Jordan should have been there. Long field goal, Don. You have to have a trajectory low. I could see who blocked it. They looked like 70. Ezra Johnson, a number right. one draft pick out of Morris Brown. This didn't look like a Redskin team because they kind of sat around, looked like they didn't know what happened. Johnny's looking around saying, where are you folks? He blocked Eisman out there. He had to cut back. That's the kind of break you expect Washington to force, not the opposition. Look at it again, right in the middle. That's a heck of a jump, and I still can't get the guy's number. Wait a minute. All 78. Right. Ezra Johnson. Yeah. Obviously trying to block it. Brian gets it off, and a good one is to the 45-yard line. And as always, excellent special team coverage by the Redskins. never a doubt when he kicks it. It's forgivable when you miss from 50 and 53 yards out, but this guy can kick with anyone in the league. You'll remember this is the Eddie Brown who broke the Cardinal Mud game a year ago right in this stadium with a great kick run for 71 yards and a touchdown. He's quick to spot the hole. He's fearless, never hesitates. And he's got Washington right where they want him. Let's see if we can pick up at the top of your screen just how far they had to run. Here, Theismann takes off. I thought he might run. They had him pretty well zeroed in. Oh, and he only led that a bit. Hey, look at that. Hey, wait a minute. I got to tell you, I think he should have caught it. Well, I don't. Let's see if we get another look. I thought he knocked it down. Grant got bumped here. Buchanan's right behind him. long drive in the wake of a clipping penalty and Theismann led them all the way. Don that was a nifty pass. That's yeah that was do. laid right in there Frank. It was an option runner pass. Didn't really have that. They took the run away from him. Got it off just in time. Laid it out in front of him. Six points. Key play of the series was the long pass to Danny Bucks. Mark Mosley for the conversion. Boy oh, Ezra Johnson almost got a piece of that. Here it is again, Don. It's tough to do. It is tough. You see a pretty good block on Jim Carter, number 50, by Harmon, the back. Thomas comes out there. They couldn't quite reach it. He had Johnny Gray trying to get there. He beat him by a step. Look at this Whitehurst. Comes back. You don't have as good a shot of it, really, but he's drilling it right in the middle. That's Curtis, 32, coming out of the backfield. But they had it pretty well covered. That was Eddie Brown, 25. You see that missed him. And Mike Curtis missed the tackle. This will be a 44-yard attempt. A lot of distance. It's and it's perfect. He is some kick. Three for three. 40, 44, and 42. Game as I 
had mentioned at six, it may well turn out to be. What we're going to see here is Frank Grant, uh, who felt like he got speared in the back by uh, Bruce Laird here in our game here a couple of weeks ago. He should have caught this. In fact, he does have it uh, in his hands at the letters. Uh, Willie Buchanan is the guy uh, pursuing him from Green Bay and giving him a little bit of uh, post-action advice. Watch it again, see what you think. It looks to me like it's in there. He was ahead of Buchanan but could not handle it. Now, what do you want? Joe Theismann caught in a little bit of trouble here. He gets out, or do you want Billy Kilmer? A lot of speculation, as you heard the national guys say tonight, as to Kilmer coming back. I don't think so. I look for Allen to go with this kid right here, Joe Theismann. He runs so well because he used to have to run up in that Canadian Football League just to keep warm. And he showed it to us uh, just a few moments later. He finds Mike Thomas snaking his way to the end of the end zone here. The only touchdown in the game, but that's all they needed. Oh, we had some problems. Uh, I felt uh, in the early part of the game that uh, we were really hitting and coming off the ball and our running game was going and uh, our defense was playing good, getting good pressure on the passer, but then we didn't make enough plays offensively and defensively when we had to stop them at the end, uh, we couldn't. They moved it down the field and scored a touchdown. We were just really disappointed today because we felt that we should have won today. We had five turnovers and uh, then there were a lot of other passes that could have been caught that weren't. and. Uh, we had a couple of costly penalties. One time we stopped them, it would have been three and out, and we got caught for jamming the uh, punt coverage guy going downfield, defensive holding, and again gave him the first down and new life. What about those turnovers, Coach? Was it just a, one of those days, or did the weather have any factor in it? Well, it was a bad day, there's no question about it, but you know, they had to play in that weather too, and um, we we feel that uh, any time that the weather conditions are, are bad, uh, you have to still get the job done, and uh, that's what we, uh, uh, we always feel going into a ball game, and today we didn't. Walter Payton has been suffering from the flu all week, and before the game, he said he felt weak and was having hot and cold flashes. Well, after the game, the Minnesota Vikings were the only ones seeing flashes, mostly from number 34 running right by them. Payton set a new NFL single-game rushing record, picking up 275 yards on 40 carries. He also scored a touchdown in the second quarter on a one-yard run. That, along with Bob Thomas' field goal, was enough to beat the Vikes 10-7. Peyton has picked up 1,404 yards already this season and stands an excellent chance to break O.J. Simpson's 2,003-yard mark.
In Pittsburgh, the steel curtain fell hard on the Dallas Cowboys as the Steelers romped 28-13. Franco Harris also had a great day running with the ball. He picked up a career-high 179 yards and scored two touchdowns, including a 61-yarder. The Pittsburgh win spoiled the return to the Steel City of former pit star Tony Dorsett. The Heisman Trophy winner did show his family and friends something, however, scoring the first touchdown of the day.